The Sport of Matchmaking by Jenny Goutet, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. 1. London, March 1822 Oh, Max! The word slipped out of Lady Alice Sinclair on a sigh of resignation that no one heard. She handed her Apollo gold cloak with plush trim over in exchange for a voucher and turned to peer into the ballroom that, as the season's opening event, was already packed with eager faces. Her mother, the Duchess of Carr, went immediately to stand by the side of one of the patronesses, trusting Alice to her sister's care. Alice was perfectly capable of seeing to herself, but the Duchess had yet to become enlightened to the fact. Lady Charlotte, her married sister older by four years, preceded Alice into the room. She turned back with an impatient gesture. "'Are you coming, Alice? Dursted, you may go play cards if you wish. If I need you, I shall send word, but otherwise you may come and find us at two o'clock as usual.' Charlotte moved forward, not waiting for an answer from her husband, and with the full expectation that her sister would follow. Alice did not bother to offer her brother-in-law a sympathetic look, she rather thought his immolation at his wife's altar was done willingly, and therefore she had little patience for him. Trailing Charlotte half-heartedly, Alice entered the ballroom, and was immediately engulfed by the crowd, which separated her from her sister. A voice pierced the din on her right, calling, "'Lady Alice!' and she recognised the penetrating tone. Bracing herself, she turned to greet the childhood friend, if such a term could be used." "'Barbara, how lovely to see you,' she said, pasting on a smile. "'Have you only just arrived in town?' Alice could not remember a time when she had not known Barbara Gower, nay, Bowlings. They had shared dancing lessons before their presentation, and their mothers had brought them on morning calls, assuming that a friendship would be the natural result. But it was hard to be friends with someone who was only nice to you because of your title.' Barbara glanced over her shoulder at the man standing behind her. "'Yes, quite. I was married recently, as you must know. Please allow me to present my husband, William Gower. Mr Gower, this is Lady Alice Sinclair, the youngest daughter of the Duke of Carr.' Mr Gower offered a low, punctilious bow as she curtsied in return. Alice searched the crowd, hoping for the sight of a more promising acquaintance that might allow her to escape, without appearing as though she were giving Barbara a cut.' There was none. May I offer you congratulations on your marriage? She said instead. You may. It was a magnificent ceremony. We were married in St Paul's Cathedral with everyone who had come early to London in attendance, many of whom had journeyed just for the event. I was sorry to receive your regrets. As was I to have to send them. I wish you every happiness for your future together, although I'm sure my wishes are not needed for such good fortune." Alice did not offer her reasons for not attending the wedding, because her excuse was admittedly flimsy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I promised Charlotte I would not stray far. With a cordial nod, she effected her escape at last. If nothing else, Alice had been taught the skill of making a graceful exit. Charlotte had not waited for her, and Alice could only thank the heavens her sister had rediscovered her bosom friends, so they might fall into conversation and forget all but the latest en dit. Charlotte was much like her mother in that way. Alice ducked out of her sister's line of sight, satisfied to have made her escape. The room was crowded and warm. The candles had been lit in all the chandeliers above them, and two tables holding punch bowls and glasses of orgeat and lemonade were at one end. The lemonade was watery, and the orgeat was syrupy, and both were warm. Alice would have to go thirsty. She gave civil nods to the guests she knew as she walked by, friendly enough that they could not accuse her of being haughty, although people most certainly did, but distant enough that no one would think she was looking for company. She moved with purpose in the direction of the retiring room, although really she was just looking for a secluded enough place to take refuge from the crowds. At the last moment she found an empty spot on the side of the room in one of the windowed alcoves, and she ducked into its shadow. The crowd milled and talked and danced in front of her, but there was no one else in the alcove with her. Alice breathed out and looked at the set forming, thankful she was not required to be part of it. Tonight, 
as in all of last season, she had left the train on her dress down. The gesture would serve to discourage all invitations to dance, if her elusive reputation had not done the trick. She was entering her fifth season, and if she was not already married it was because there had been no incentive tempting enough, although offers there had been. Why, let's see, she thought, as the litany of suitors pranced before her vision. She had been proposed to by Lord Shrewsbury, who'd had the tendency to corner her when she was not quick enough to spot his approach. If that had not been bad enough, his laugh was remarkably like that of a donkey's. He had made his confidence known that, in possessing the title of Marquis, he must be acceptable to her. She had wasted no time in disabusing him of the notion. There had been others, like Mr. Morris, a man older than her father. The Duke had known his daughter was not likely to accept the man's suit, and he had not insisted. But since the suitor had possessed wealth enough, and her father had not wished to offend him, he had allowed Mr. Morris to make the attempt. Alice had sent him away without regret. Mr. Wainsworth, another possible suitor, had never gathered his courage to ask her to dance. Instead, he had hovered about Alice nervously, quietly solicitous, and eager to bring her a drink at every turn, until the sight of him had made her long to shriek. She could readily sympathise with the onset of mental illness that some ladies experienced. And finally there had been Mr. Boeing, young and handsome, who practised his charm on every wealthy woman he met, and certainly thought himself charming enough to seduce the daughter of a peer. He had been wrong. It wasn't youth or elegance she sought, but substance, in character rather than purse. As there was clearly no such man in all of England, she had stopped her search. What was wrong with this world that gave a woman no authority or voice of her own to decide what she wanted? If only her parents' attempts at producing an heir had been successful with her, and she had been born a boy, she would have had all the freedom she could desire. A smile hovered on Alice's lips. But then there would be no Bartholomew. Her brother, the Marquis of Anley, was her favourite person in the world, even if he had grown somewhat distant in recent months as he'd sought his independence. It wanted only a year or two until Bartholomew was a man grown. Brought back to the present by the false smiles and artificial laughter that resounded in the space in front of her, Alice continued her internal rant. All Max was representative of all she disliked about the ton, particularly in their attempts to achieve a connection with her. Courted from all sides, by women who thought they might improve their social standing if she befriended them, by men who were certain she would succumb at last to their manifold charms. She gazed impassively at London's finest, assembled before her. Lady Alice Sinclair was gaining the reputation of being haughty and unattainable. The corner of her mouth upturned at the thought. The reputation was serving her well. A familiar face on the far side of the dance floor caught her eye. Miss Gwendolen Chauncey watched the dance in front of her from the line of young ladies who had no partners. Alice had been given a chance to observe Miss Chauncey at a card party a week ago, where she had been seated at the table next to hers. Alice was older and above her in standing, and Miss Chauncey had not attempted to engage her in conversation, not even when the game had ended and she could have a woman who did not push her advantage by forcing a connection that would benefit her. How refreshing! Miss Chauncey was, just now, standing perfectly still and staring after Mr Oswald Duckworth, the gentleman she had been paired with for cards and one of the most hardened flirts on the marriage mart. The crowd he ran with was known for breaking the hearts of hopefuls, as none of them had any intention of settling down. Despite that... Alice had seen a spark of interest in Mr Duckworth's attention that night that had gone beyond flirting. Miss Chauncey had substance, Alice had decided from her brief observation. She sighed and shook her head as she continued to watch. Miss Chauncey was going about it in a way that was destined to fail if all she did was stand there and stare at him. Alice would have to do something to help the poor girl. The look on Miss Chauncey's face was one of such longing... Alice was tempted to go over to Mr Duckworth and drag him to her side, using her social weight to force him to ask the girl to dance. But not only could men not be led in such an overt manner, 
Alice was afraid it might have the reverse effect of making Mr. Duckworth think she was interested in him, which was very far from the case. Ugh! And there was that dead boar, Percival Lloyd, whom no one liked, but everyone had to tolerate, approaching Miss Chauncey and making his bow. Alice watched the man's ponderous steps with dismay, knowing that Miss Chauncey would be forced to say yes to his invitation if she wished to dance for the rest of the night. Still, what a trial. "'Don't do it, Miss Chauncey, I beg of you,' she murmured from the safety of the alcove. "'It is better not to dance at all than to be shackled to the side of a man such as that.' "'A man such as what?' Alice turned to the owner of the deep voice next to her, startled. "'Where did he come from?' There had been no one in the alcove with her, and she would have seen him if he'd arrived from the dance floor. She was about to ask him how he got there, but one glance behind her answered the question. He had merely been tucked away behind the heavy velvet drapes. Alice faced forward again. She would have liked to have condemned him for such lurking behaviour as hiding behind velvet curtains while innocent women spoke their thoughts aloud. But everyone knew Mr George Clavering to be cheerful and harmless, even if he was a gamester. He would never act in a way that was not perfectly honourable. "'A gentleman is not supposed to address a lady to whom he has never been formally presented, Mr Clavering.' Alice opened her fan and began to wave it, refusing to look at him, but curious to hear what he would reply. There was no trace of hesitation or self-consciousness in his voice when he answered, nothing with which she could reproach him of being too forward. "'I beg your pardon, Lady Alice. "'It is only that I was taught never to ignore a woman when she is speaking. "'I could not turn a deaf ear to your conversation.' "'She could hear the humour in his response, "'and decided not to take objection to it, "'although she was half tempted to be piqued at his having a ready answer. "'But that would only make her look ridiculous. "'Very well. "'You have graciously responded to my conversational gambit, "'and I will not accuse you of ignoring me.' No one will be able to speak ill of you. In a voice that held hints of teasing inflection, he replied, That is a dismissal if ever I've heard one. I shall not haunt your footsteps, my lady. But since we are holding a conversation, perhaps you might tell me to whom you are referring. Who do you beg not to dance, and with whom? The conversation was just unusual enough that Alice did not give him the polite brush-off she had planned, Instead, she answered, "'It is Miss Chauncey. I was counselling her, although she could not hear it, not to accept the invitation of Mr Percival Lloyd. Better to lose the chance of dancing the entire night than to have to endure two sets with such a man as he.' "'I do not know Miss Chauncey, but I am much inclined to agree with your assessment of Lloyd. He latched on to my sister a few times, and it was a full hour before she could make her escape.' Mr Clavering appeared to study the crowd. "'Who is Miss Chauncey?' "'Alice looked at him more closely. "'Mr Clavering was pleasing to look at, "'with humorous brown eyes set in a chiselled face, "'but it was not difficult to see that his comportment "'was like that of every other gentleman in the town. "'A care-for-nothing tulip, a sports-mad Corinthian, "'a penniless, she supposed, gamester, "'whose only interest was playing with dice and hearts. "'Eventually, when he was old enough, he would seek a wife who would allow him to continue in that vein. It would not be Alice. Miss Chauncey is the woman dancing with Mr Lloyd. She nodded to where they stood, waiting their turn in the set. Mr Clavering sighed and shook his head. She did not have enough resolution then. She did not, unfortunately. If only more women did. Alice continued to watch them follow the line to the head of the set, her heart beating in sympathy at the look of bored despair on Miss Chauncey's face. But to refuse, of course, would mean she could not dance for the rest of the evening. "'You appear to have plenty of resolution,' Mr Clavering observed. Alice turned to face him, flicking her gaze up to meet his. "'That is easy. I plan never to marry.' Mr Clavering did not immediately respond to that, or try to convince her otherwise— and for that she was grateful. Nothing was more tiresome than men who thought they knew what was better for her life than she did. He folded his arms, watching the dancing couples before him. 
If she had so little resolution, perhaps she deserves Mr. Lloyd. She is not above average in looks, and I cannot say that there is anything in her personality to attract a man. Miss Chauncey must not set her sights too high. Alice looked forward, a flash of irritation heating her cheeks. Men who had nothing to recommend them in the way of looks were able to secure matches with the most stunning beauties. Was it so hard to credit that a woman might not do the same? Alice wasn't sure why she cared so much about Miss Chauncey's future when she knew little more than her name. It was only that she had struck Alice as possessing more sincerity than most of her acquaintances, and Alice had met so few people of depth she could not help but take notice. She indicated the set in progress with her eyes. Percival Lloyd deserves a woman who is as dull as he is, with no sense of humour or finer feelings. That is not Miss Chauncey. Is that so? Mr Clavering considered this. Then who would you choose for her? What partner would you have her dance with? Alice did not hesitate when she inclined her head toward the gentleman laughing with a group of young men in a corner. He was not dancing at the moment, and was certainly not looking at Miss Chauncey. Mr Duckworth. This did get a reaction out of Mr Clavering, as she had known it would. Everyone in society knew they were close friends. Duckworth, he exclaimed. Duck? Impossible. He's one of the biggest flirts in London. He will end up with a woman who is as full of wit and vivacity as he is. Alice shook her head firmly. Very often men do not know what they need. It takes only a little arranging. Mr Duckworth and Miss Chauncey have already met at a card party, and it was apparent to anyone with a set of eyes how well they suited. If he is led to dance with her once or twice, he will remember how easy she is to converse with, and will discover that the pleasure of dancing with her only increases her charms. From there, it is not such a great leap to courtship. Mr Clavering turned incredulous eyes to Miss Chauncey and shook his head. Impossible. Alice gave him a pointed look. Men do not want wit and vivacity at their breakfast table. Mr Clavering opened his mouth to retort, then stopped. That is true, he admitted. Alice could not help but smile at his honesty, until he added a rejoinder. Men do not want to look at a face that turns them off their breakfast each morning either. Alice pinched her lips together, suddenly furious. She gave a swift curtsy and began to walk away, but he called out to her. Lady Alice! She was tempted to ignore him, and she could not say why she did not, but she turned back. There was no trace of humour in his expression now, and it struck her that, little though she knew him, she had never seen him without his prevailing look of teasing insouciance. "'I beg you will forgive me,' he said, holding her regard. "'That was rude and untrue. I did not do justice to Miss Chauncey.' After a moment's hesitation, Alice returned to the alcove. He touched her arm lightly. "'Thank you for returning to hear my apology. "'It was only because I remembered that this was my alcove,' she replied, allowing her lips to twitch. He laughed. "'You're right. The next time I say something so lacking in feeling, I will see myself out.' Mr Clavering appeared to study the crowd, and she was able to study him. Her eyes came only to the top button of his coat, and when he faced her, she sent him a considering look. "'Would you care to make a wager on whether Mr Duckworth will fall for Miss Chauncey before the end of the season?' Now Mr Clavering studied her, amusement and doubt illuminating his features. "'A wager? If you are courageous enough for one, you may be sure that I am. I never turn down a bet. What shall be the terms?' It had been a spontaneous proposal, and one Alice had not thought through. Money was so crude. It could not be for money. "'If I win, you shall do whatever I ask of you, so long as it does not cause permanent harm to a person or reputation, your own or another's. If you win, the same terms hold true.' Mr Clavering narrowed his eyes as he considered the idea. It was easy to see how one might find him attractive— his speech was natural, and his smile ready, which made him easy to converse with. 
but he had more growing to do before any woman should be forced to tie herself to him. He glanced at Miss Chauncey again before replying, "'The terms are vague, if you ask me. I would like to have an idea of the sort of thing you would require before I accept them.' "'I had thought you more of a gamester than that, Mr. Clavering. If the terms can be pleasing to a lady, you can hardly have any objection.' She stopped short before adding, with the glimmer of a smile, "'Especially since you are so sure to win.' Mr. Clavering's answering grin awoke something in her, a longing for more of these kinds of playful conversations, where humour carried most of the weight, but there were chords of sincerity. She supposed it was a longing for friendship, which Alice did not find as easily as she could have wished. "'That is true,' he replied." "'Then I agree to your wager. "'If Duck ever manages to see the goodness in someone as worthy as Miss Chauncey "'and allows that to trump his dedication to remaining a bachelor, "'I will own myself beat. "'I will accept your terms as such, my lady.' "'Alice studied him, wondering if she could press her advantage "'to gain the one thing that would help her objective. "'I would request that you provide me with an introduction to Mr. Duckworth.' Mr. Clavering turned a set of laughing eyes her way, even as he shook his head. I dare not do so. That would be sabotaging my own efforts. Alice glared at him. Then I shall have to get my own introduction. Never you fear on that score, however. I am somewhat known in the ton. Mr. Clavering laughed again, leaving her with the sensation that he was a restful, easy person to be around. That you are. I look forward to sparring with you. He bowed and smiled at Alice with a mischievous glint in his eyes, and then he was gone. Alice allowed her gaze to drift back to the object of her attention and felt real sympathy for Miss Chauncey. She was at the mercy of a boring man, simply because she had no one to introduce her to more worthy partners. Meanwhile, on the other side of the ballroom, Mr Duckworth was still in the company of gentlemen, rather than doing his duty by asking an available young woman to dance. Alice supposed she had her work cut out for her. Then again, for such a hardened flirt, Mr Duckworth did not seem bent upon conquering any woman's heart. Alice was not so sure Mr Clavering knew his friend as well as he thought he did, at least not in matters of the heart. She could not stay in the alcove the entire night, as much as the thought pleased her. She walked over to her sister, who at least would not expect her to contribute to the conversation, and would shield her from the unwanted advances of certain men. Once she was at Charlotte's side, Alice turned to gaze at the crowd. She was not tall enough to see over the heads of people right in front of her, and did not expect to see Mr Clavering, but she found herself looking for him anyway. In a few minutes he stepped directly in her line of vision. He glanced at the alcove where she had been, then he faced his friend and returned some answer. She continued watching, and saw his gaze seek out Miss Chauncey, whom he was now studying more closely. Good. She had got him to think. Alice wished she'd had someone to share this encounter with, but her closest friend was in Paris on her honeymoon, and her brother rarely darkened Almack's door. However, Bartholomew would be sure to find her little episode with Mr Clavering amusing. She must tell him about it when next she saw him. The crowd swallowed Mr Clavering from her sight, and Alice turned back, half listening to her sister's prattle. Her conversation was as uninteresting as she had suspected. Despite that, the season's opening had been better than she had anticipated, and she hoped it would continue in the same vein. Perhaps she would not endure these months in London, hovering, as usual, on the brink of expiring from boredom. Two. It was growing late, and the novelty of the opening night at Almack's had begun to pull for George Clavering and his friends. For a group of bachelors not quite ready to settle down, Almack's was not their favourite place to be, but of course one did not wish to miss the opening. By now even matrons with their daughters had begun to take their leave, and George and his friends had already remained an unusual length of time. "'Shall we go?' Duckworth proposed. George set his glass on the tray of a servant walking by and followed his friends to the door. He could not help but turn to glance around the ballroom one last time in search of Lady Alice, but she was not tall 
and he did not see her in the crowd. It wasn't as though he had never noticed her before. Everyone knew Lady Alice Sinclair. She had a reputation for saying little, though she was nobody's fool. In fact, her look said everything for her. She was notoriously uninterested in marriage, the gossip said, and she had confirmed this for herself. But George could identify no reason why she should be. As a woman, what did she have to look forward to, apart from marriage? And she was a woman who had everything desirable a man could wish for in a wife. In terms of beauty, intelligence, rank and wealth, she was unparalleled. Lady Alice could have her pick of husbands, and need not settle. Despite her manifold charms, George had never sought her acquaintance. For one thing, he was not looking for a wife for a number of years yet, and if he were, he would not dare set his sights so high. For a duke's daughter, even one the youngest of five daughters, she could look much higher than the second son of a baronet. For another, until he had made her acquaintance tonight, George had always assumed there must be something odd about a woman who did not wish to marry. She must be either a blue stocking or insufferably proud. It had only taken their novel exchange for him to realise that there was nothing abnormal about Lady Alice. In fact, their brief conversation had lifted the evening's pleasure beyond what he had expected from a night at Almack's. He had actually enjoyed himself. Chance had led them to meet. George had not been at Almack's long when he'd spotted Miss Rachel Baldwin heading his way. Miss Baldwin was a determined flirt, and someone he avoided whenever he could, since she was in search of a husband, and seemed to think he might be a viable candidate. He had changed his course and ducked into the alcove, taking the occasion to grab a few minutes by the window for some blessed peace and the fresh air that filtered in through the draughty panes. In the next instant he had no longer been alone. George had hesitated before revealing himself, knowing he would put both himself and the other party in an awkward situation. But once he'd heard Lady Alice making observations, actually talking to herself, he could not resist finding out more about what went on in that head of hers. She might not be interested in marriage herself, but she seemed to have definitive ideas on whom others should marry. Lady Alice reminded him of his sister Philippa, come to think of it. True, he had made a major misstep when commenting on Miss Chauncey's lack of beauty. He did not know what had possessed him to talk to Lady Alice about another woman's looks as though she were a man. A man would agree or disagree on the pronouncement of a woman's charm, or lack thereof, and the conversation would move on from there. He should have known a woman would take it personally, as though he were talking about her. Although, if he had been, his unfavourable assessment could not have been further from the truth. Lady Alice's petite frame was charming, and perfectly proportioned. Her light brown hair crowned a round face, containing a pert nose and rosebud mouth. She looked angelic, but he suspected that was the last word that should be used to describe her. Another characteristic that reminded him of his sister. He would have to ask Philippa if she knew Lady Alice. "'Yes, I'm coming,' George called out, when his friends looked back down the street to see where he was. He followed them in the dark, accompanied by the noise of drunken gentlemen and the clip-clop of horses carrying people home for the night. He did not need to ask to know they were destined for whites. This was what they had done last year, and the years before that. Almax, then whites. Of course, Almax was not their first choice in entertainment, but women, from the young flirts to the mamas of high standing, never hesitated to press George and his friends to come and liven the ball, and the pressure was hard to resist. When they arrived at the club, two gentlemen at a table in the middle greeted them loudly, these two had felt no such compunction about missing society's opening ball. "'You're just in time to place your bets.' Ralph Filbert, a thin man with silky whiskers, had the betting book open in front of him, and he waved the quill in the direction of the newcomers. "'I'm laying a bet that Lord Hicks will snatch up one of this year's fresh crop. Anyone?' Filbert's companion, Theophile Taylor, took a sip of his drink, then lifted it in encouragement. I say you should take the bet. It is a guaranteed win. Hicks will never be able to seduce any lady, and heaven only knows he's been trying for any number of years. Duck sat next to them. 
Hicks was at Almax tonight, and he was ogling more than one lady. Entering into the spirit of the bet, he added, Does it have to be one of the fresh crop, or can it be a spinster? It has to be one of the new ones, Filbert answered decisively. In any case, I wouldn't bother with the old ones. They are up to his game already. None of them will be seduced by him, so he's had to look younger. Amos opened his snuff-box. His title notwithstanding, the only way Hicks is going to find a wife is if a mamma forces her girl to it. With those yellow teeth of his, and breath that can be smelled a mile away, no girl in her right mind would agree to it willingly. All this talk and no takers. Filbert raised an eyebrow. Do you lay odds or not? George laughed and shook his head as he took a seat across from them. I'm out on this one. But to bet on a woman is not a wise course. She is too fickle a creature for a man to lay proper odds. There will surely be some chit who takes no exception to his teeth, if they may be exchanged for his title. Oh, there hasn't been yet, Taylor retorted. Besides, that's precisely the purpose of laying odds. One says a thing cannot be done, another says it can. At that moment, Lord Hicks himself walked in the door, and Filbert exchanged a glance with Duck. Without a word, he signed his name next to the bet, and handed it to Duck, Amos and Taylor, who each signed their names. George shook his head. Filbert closed the book, and replaced it on the shelf. Lord Hicks went towards his cronies in the back of the club, and did not suffer from curiosity over the latest bet, and Filbert glanced in his direction with a wicked grin. "'So, how was Olmax? Filbert asked. Amos took the remaining chair at the table. "'If you're so curious about Olmax, why did you not go and see for yourself?' "'I cannot be bothered. It is the same thing every year.' Filbert called the servant over and ordered a bottle of claret for the table. When the servant left, he added, "'Each spring it's a new crop of girls angling to find a match in their first season. They stand there, gazing with large eyes at any specimen that might walk by, their faces filled with hope.' George folded his arms, his lips quirking upward. Did they not cast those large eyes your way often enough? This was met by laughter. Everyone knew that as much as Filbert protested against the Institute of Marriage, he needed the money that would come from a good match. And they even knew from his younger days that he possessed a romantic streak. This was nothing more than bluster. Is it just bitterness talking? Duck added his might in a friendly tone, although George knew he'd had his own share of bitterness. The mistakes made when he was young and impressionable still smarted, and they kept him unequivocally uninterested in marriage. The servant brought the claret and extra glasses, and Duck turned one over for his drink. Filbert flushed slightly and folded his arms. Perhaps, perhaps not a great many gazes were cast my way, but I still say my penury is more attractive than yellow teeth. George took a sip of the claret. Some women don't intend to marry at all, whether for title or a winning smile. Oh, take Lady Alice Sinclair, for instance, Duck interjected. She's firmly off the market, that one. George shot his friend a look, wondering if he had seen George talking with her. He didn't think Duck had, but it was odd that they had never once discussed Lady Alice, and now her name had come up on the same night he had met her. "'Lady Alice, now there is a name I've not heard in a while,' Filbert said. "'No man in London has any hope of winning her hand. "'Why, I do not believe she danced even once last season.' "'I can confirm she did not,' Taylor replied. "'I know plenty who kept their eye out to see if she would. "'The girl, or lady, I should say, will not marry.' "'Oh, I am not so sure of such a thing,' George replied, leaning back. "'He had not intended to respond.' But since his mind had been full of Lady Alice ever since their meeting, he could not resist. It was refreshing to enjoy a woman's company, without fearing she would read too much into the attention. And since Lady Alice would not marry, he was safe from such a thing. At the same time, there was something grating about the way his friends had completely written her off. He took a sip of the claret and set his glass down. "'Perhaps she has not found the right candidate,' After all, she's a well-looking girl. Someone suitable is bound to attract her notice eventually. Impossible, Amos replied. 
But the woman is a cold fish and has made it clear she's above everyone. She won't contemplate marriage unless another heir to a dukedom appears on the scene, and I don't believe there is one of those that has not tried. George was irritated by his friend's referral to Lady Alice as a cold fish. Had Amos ever exchanged a single word with her? He didn't think so. She had shown herself to be an exceptional woman, and George could not remain quiet. I would be willing to lay odds that she will marry, this season even. It's wanting only the right man. Lady Alice, you say? Lord Harridan had come up behind George, having apparently overheard their conversation. The main room at White's was hardly an intimate location, and one had to be prepared for one's conversation to be intruded upon. George turned and greeted Lord Harridan with a civil nod, but he did not like him at all. Harridan had made improper advances to George's sister-in-law when she was still unmarried and companion to Harridan's widowed aunt. As though his presence must be welcome, Lord Harridan pressed for someone to answer. "'Is this a bet you're contemplating? Did it go in the books yet?' "'I believe Clavering was just about to do that,' Philbert said with a glance at George. "'He's not yet got around to it.' Now George was stuck. He had not meant to truly make a bet. Lay odds had merely been a figure of speech. But he had said the words and could not back down now. He nodded slowly. Yes, I am willing to bet Lady Alice will marry this season. Lord Harridan lifted his head and snapped at a passing servant. Bring the betting book. Turning back to their party, he said, I will take your bet. Lady Alice is famous for being proud and disagreeable. Even if she were to change her spots, a gentleman would have to think twice before saddling himself with a wife such as her. Duck looked at Harridan with barely concealed distaste. If a woman has expressed her desire to remain unmarried, she may do so with my good will. However, I say if Lady Alice does not marry, it will not be because she is unable to form an attachment. Harridan ignored him, and the next thing George knew, he was dipping the quill in the inkwell and shaking the excess ink. He was struck by a flash of conscience when he did so. He had never bet on a woman before, if he did not count his bet on Miss Chauncey. He would not count it, though, because it was a bet made with a woman about a woman. Besides that oddity, he did not, on principle, think betting on women a good idea. It had nothing to do with a woman's fickle nature, as he had earlier claimed, but everything to do with the fact that it wasn't honourable. Nor was it honourable to back down from a bet, and he would not do so now. "'Only fifteen shillings, then,' George said. "'And this is not a bet that holds my interest enough to put more.' It was a stupid concession, but he somehow felt that making the bet smaller reduced its offensiveness. Harridan scoffed. Oh, "'Come now, such a paltry amount. At least make it thirty. George gave a tight smile and wrote the terms in the betting book, followed by the words, thirty shillings. He signed his name, and Lord Harridan signed his name next to it. When it was done, George was left with a bad taste in his mouth. He participated in his friend's banter and sipped his claret, but his mind was occupied elsewhere. He did not stay long at the club after that. The next day George awoke, his conscience slightly eased about the bet he had made the night before. Lady Alice would never find out that he'd made one on her, and if she did, she couldn't possibly balk at the idea. After all, she had made a similar bet with him regarding Miss Chauncey. Nevertheless, he was unable to sleep as late as he usually did, and a ride in Hyde Park only ate up part of his day. He was in no mood to visit friends, so he went to see his sister. Philippa was married to Jack Blythefield, who had recently been appointed leader of the opposition in the House of Commons. It had taken him longer than he had hoped to secure the position, although he was still considered young for the role. George was sure that Philippa had been instrumental in her husband's appointment, she had a good understanding of the issues that came up in the Commons, and was able to host parties that created just the right atmosphere to discuss them in a relaxed setting. Philippa had always possessed common sense, but George was proud of her for this additional skill. Besides, he liked being in her company, which was not something he could say for some women who had more hair than wit. "'George!' she exclaimed when her butler announced him. 
What a surprise! And you here so early! What brings you? Jack is not here. He came in and gave his sister a kiss on the cheek. Can't a man visit his sister without raising questions? Philippa's look was dubious. In general, yes, but with you it does raise questions, as I know there are a hundred places you'd rather be. Jack is at the Commons. Weren't you planning to go one of these days? George shook his head. A life in politics is just not for me. You of all people should know that. I do know it. I'll ring for tea if you'd like some. Philippa got to her feet before she had George's answer, but he called out, None for me, thank you. She resumed her seat and waited in expectation for him to state the purpose of his visit. He hadn't known precisely why he'd wanted to visit his sister until his next words were out. Do you know a Miss Chauncey? She lifted her eyes in thought and after a moment refocused her gaze on him. No, the name does not sound familiar. All of a sudden she gasped and leaned forward. George, are you contemplating a match? He was too tired to respond with his usual teasing or evasive remark. No, not with her. She studied him closely, as if sensing that something was weighing on him. She was remarkably perceptive. Then with someone else? George bit his lip. The answer was no, of course. One day, perhaps. But at the age of twenty-six, he was too young to contemplate marriage. On the other hand, he could not stop thinking about his bet at White's and Lady Alice by association. When he returned his gaze to Philippa, she was waiting for his answer. No, I have no intention to make a match with anyone. However, I have been speaking with Lady Alice Sinclair. The Duke of Carr's daughter, Philippa exclaimed, her tone eager. You know her? George paused and rubbed his chin. He needed to throw his perceptive sister off the scent quickly. If she thought he was interested in Lady Alice, she would do everything to try to bring them together, and he didn't want anything to interfere with the easy rapport he had found with Lady Alice. We were presented, in a manner of sorts, if I can request your discretion on the matter. She appears to think that Miss Chauncey would make an excellent match for Duck. Philippa frowned in confusion. I wasn't aware Lady Alice knew Duckworth. I'm surprised that one of her friends should look so far beneath her. Duck has little to recommend him beyond his charms, as much as I love him. George's friends, including Duckworth, had all been like big brothers to Philippa, and he knew what she meant. Duck is beforehand in the world, though, and I should probably clarify that Miss Chauncey does not have the same breeding or beauty as Lady Alice. Honestly, I do not know how or why they are even friends. Miss Chauncey is the type of person who fades into the woodwork. Well, then she will never do for Duck, Philippa replied decisively. She won't keep him interested. Yes, but it's the strangest thing because Lady Alice appears to think she will. She bet that Miss Chauncey would be able to attract Duckworth. And I took her bet. George clapped his hand against his forehead. I must be bacon-brained. How could I have bet on my own friend? That made two unwise bets in one night. It must be this bet that was bothering him, more than the one he'd made on Lady Alice. He had really left his wits at home yesterday. Then again, the bet against Duck and Miss Chauncey made perfect sense. His friend was nowhere near being ready to give up his bachelorhood. What were the terms? Philippa asked. She showed no surprise that he had bet against Duck, but George could still not believe he had. For some strange reason, he was reluctant to tell Philippa that he had bet on Lady Alice, too. The terms. George had to remember the terms. She said that if she won, I must do whatever she requested, as long as it caused no harm to a person or a reputation, and that if I won, she must do the same. Interesting, Philippa said, in a way that soothed George. It carried no judgment, but rather curiosity. Well, I know the next move you must make. George turned to his sister blankly. What move is that? Why, you must find out more about this Miss Chauncey and what makes her so worthy in the eyes of Lady Alice. Point her out to me at the Harris's ball a week from Friday. That's the nearest occasion that is likely to attract everyone in the tongue, and I will see if I can't make her acquaintance. You won't say anything, though. 
George said, suddenly worried. He had not behaved with his usual circumspection, and that could get him into trouble. "'George,' she returned, with mild exasperation. "'Of course she would not.' Three. Alice liked to stay abed each morning. Her maid Daisy knew that, and would bring her coffee and a roll, and then leave her in peace for another two hours. It was a routine Alice had established, and one she quite liked. For one thing, she was not required to face anyone else before she'd had her coffee, and had lost herself in whatever book she was currently reading. So little of her time was her own, and it was only after she'd had a chance to do the things that mattered to her that she was able to face others with grace. Morning was, in truth, her favourite part of the day. And yet, something about her encounter with Mr Clavering the night before pushed her out of bed before Daisy arrived and had her going to her wardrobe to select something to wear. It was the first time she had found society tolerable at an evening event, and it was a novel experience. When her maid brought in the coffee, Alice directed her to assist with her gown and said she would take her breakfast downstairs. Daisy was too well trained to raise her brows at any sudden change her mistress might make, but Alice knew her behaviour would likely be talked about downstairs, as it was a departure from her usual habit. She chose a dusky rose-coloured walking dress with sleeves that gathered at the wrists. Alice's mother would expect her to accompany her on morning calls later, and she may as well prepare herself now. She left Daisy to return the tray to the kitchen and made her way downstairs. Alice blinked against the sunlight that streamed in under the azure blue drapery. Her brother Bartholomew, the Marquis of Anley, was sitting at the table, and Alice raised her eyes in surprise when she caught sight of him. She walked over and ruffled his hair. But, what a shock! I had no anticipation you would be here. I was sure you would sleep longer than I did. Why, it is only nine o'clock. Morning, Liss. The face he presented did not look quite as fresh as she was used to seeing, and she had a suspicion that he had not gone to bed at all. She was sure he had been out late gambling, attending cockfights, or doing whatever else it was gentlemen did. She hoped her brother, at the age of twenty-two, was not foolish enough to get into any sort of real trouble. But she knew she could not be naive. His honorary degree at Cambridge was behind him, and he was not interested in taking a more personal interest in his estate. It only made sense that he would begin doing what the gentlemen of his acquaintance did. Alice sat, and the servant came over and poured her coffee. He then brought her a plate of rolls, along with the crocks of butter and jam, and set it beside her. Her preferences were well known to the servants. "'Why are you up so early?' she asked her brother, as she stirred cream into her coffee. She wasn't sure she wanted to know, but she did miss their closeness. Since before Christmas, he had kept his own counsel, and had not invited her into his thoughts." I could ask the same of you. I don't believe I've ever seen you out of your room before noon. Bartholomew took another healthy bite of ham as he glanced at her. Noon is an exaggeration. In truth, you have no idea what time I leave my room, because you are not generally an early riser either. She was avoiding the question. Alice sipped her coffee, contemplating her brother, whom she loved more than anyone else on this earth. I don't know, honestly. I found myself too restless to stay in bed as I usually do, but this is no earlier than usual, for, as you must remember, I read in bed in the mornings. You used to come and join me there, and surely you could not have forgotten. Bartholomew shook his head, swallowed, and reached for his coffee. No, I've not forgotten that. Truth is, I thought I would just have something to eat before I went up and closed my eyes for a bit. <laughs> so my suspicion was correct then, she replied, suffering a slight disappointment that he had to grow and change, and in some ways not for the better. You've not gone to bed. You stayed out all night, and didn't even bother to relieve my boredom by coming to Almax. He glanced at her, a grin lurking on his face. What do you expect, Liz? Attending balls with one's family does not rank high on the list of a gentleman's amusements. I suppose. Alice's mood plunged. Why was she not permitted the same freedom? She studied him, scolding herself for thinking it possible to cling to an old relationship and old ways. You missed a bit of amusement at Ormax, however. I made a wager with Mr George Clavering. Bartholomew looked up, a glint of interest in his eyes. Clavering? 
Can't say I know him. Should I make his acquaintance? She shrugged. Oh, there's no reason to do so. It was just a friendly wager, nothing to speak of. I merely thought you might find it amusing. And what was it over? Bartholomew took another bite and glanced at her as he chewed. Whether Miss Chauncey could win the attention of Mr Duckworth before the season's end, she said, watching him for a reaction. More people I don't know. Bartholomew shook his head. Why you thought I'd find that amusing, I can't guess. Stung, Alice went silent for a moment, overcome with the sudden sensation of being alone in the world. Well, if you'd come with me to some of these events, you'd know who they all were, and we'd have a chance to dissect them as we used to. Bartholomew rested his hand on the table, his look softening. Yes, we would. I'm sorry, Liss. I wish I were more noble, but I cannot bear to sacrifice my amusements only to follow my mother and sisters around like a trained bear. Not even for you. His words mollified, and she shot him a smile. Fair enough. Just don't go and do anything foolish. Father will never forgive you. Bartholomew did not return an answer, but scraped the last bit of food from his plate. They both knew he was the apple of his father's eye and could do no wrong. In fact, the Duke of Carr loved his heir so much, he doted on him to the complete neglect of his five daughters. It had taken him, after all, twenty-two years for his wife to present him with a son. Their mother showed no preference in the treatment of her six children. All benefited equally from her correction— she liked to have a hand in the strict upbringing of each of her children, whether it was the heir to the dukedom, or one of her daughters who might otherwise disgrace the family name by committing a faux pas. Alice had managed to escape the worst of the discipline by being born the fifth daughter in line. Although her mother had not precisely run out of energy in her educational goals, her time was divided, and now grandchildren were included in the number of people she must instruct. Alice evaded much of the attention by saying little that was contrary. She looked up as her parents entered the room. Her mother went so far as to lift her eyebrows in surprise. "'Alice, you have come down for the morning meal this morning. Although your taking breakfast in bed is one of those indulgences I allow you, I must say how pleased I am that you have shown more resolution. I believe it high time you mature in this area.' One day you will have a husband, and you will be expected to grace the breakfast room with your presence each morning, so he might have the pleasure of your company. Lord Carr waited until his wife had finished, not looking as though he found much comfort in the pleasure of her company. He addressed a good morning to no one in particular, then walked over and laid a hand on his son's shoulder, before taking a seat at the head of the table. One of the servants brought over the teapot, and poured the hot beverage into the Duke's cup. "'I don't intend to marry, mother,' Alice said. "'It was the only subject upon which she had resisted her mother's expectations. "'She sipped her coffee, waiting for the remonstrance that was sure to follow. "'It did not require a wait. "'Don't speak nonsense. Of course you will marry. "'What else will you do with your life?' "'I don't know,' Alice said. "'Perhaps when I'm old enough I will buy a cottage and tend the garden there. "'I might even purchase one near the ocean,' as I find Brighton to be a delightful town. I will read and paint, and it may be that I learn to cook my own food. In any case, I have no need to worry about funding my cottage or library, as father so graciously explained to me. I have my own settlement. Her mother turned to the Duke with a reproving look. I told you that you should not have explained such things as settlements to a girl not yet married. It puts ideas into her head, as you can see. It was the Duke's aim to evade all manner of unpleasantness whenever possible, and he did so this time by saying, "'You are perfectly right, my dear.' The Duchess brought her attention back to her daughter. "'I will hear no more of this, Alice. A woman does not remain single unless she must do so because she has no offers, as you are highly eligible, and in fact are the most eligible girl on the market, which must surely afford you some degree of satisfaction.' You will certainly receive an offer that is palatable to you. Alice's mother did not allow her attention to her breakfast to deflect her instruction, and she buttered her roll as she continued. There has been no shortage of suitors presenting themselves for your hand in the past. If we have until now allowed you to indulge in this freak of yours of resisting all offers, it was because at first you were young, and then no truly desirable suitor had presented himself. However, 
this cannot go on for much longer, and I have been meaning to speak to you on the matter. We fully expect you to agree to a match by the end of the season, do we not, Duke? When the Duke did not respond, Alice's mother lifted her teacup to her lips and turned her attention to her son. Bartholomew, it is gratifying that you have also taken to heart my encouragement to rise early enough for breakfast. I hope you have an industrious day planned. There is the dinner at the Rembrakes that you have been invited to, you must remember. Bartholomew wiped his lips and dropped his napkin next to his plate. Yes, mother, I do have a number of engagements planned. In fact, so many you'll have to present my excuses to Mr. and Mrs. Rembrake. He stood and was about to leave when the Duchess looked up sharply. "'Are those the same clothes you had on yesterday?' She did not wait for her son to answer, before adding, "'I should not have to tell you at your age that each day requires a fresh set of clothing. I shall have to speak to your valet.' A flash of alarm crossed Bartholomew's features, and was gone instantly. Oh, "'No need, mother. I perfectly understand you. I will be sure to change before I leave the house.' Their mother nodded with satisfaction and turned to Alice. "'I shall not have to send word up, then, to see that you are ready for the morning calls?' "'No, mother. I will be ready at our usual time.' Alice glanced over at her father, who was reading the morning post. He rarely contributed anything to their conversation at any time, but was even more reserved in the mornings. They shared that trait, at least. Just afternoon, Alice followed the Duchess into the carriage— not bothering to ask her mother where they would be going. She knew they were bound for Lady Jersey's house first, as they always attended morning calls in her drawing-room after a night spent at Almax. A five-minute carriage ride brought them to 38 Berkeley Square, and they were soon ushered into the house. "'Sally, a pleasure,' the Duchess said. "'I could not resist coming to see how you fared after last night's opening ball.' Lady Jersey laughed. "'I knew you would come to get the latest on D. Come and join us in the drawing room. Barbara Gower is here, Alice, as well as Theresa Wolfe. You will wish to join them, I'm sure. Although Alice's mother would never admit to such a thing, the Duchess was addicted to gossip and was eager to learn what the latest scandals might be. She could not bear to be behind in such privileged knowledge. Lady Jersey talked enough without prompting, and the Duchess would not have to appear overly vulgar by asking, but would instead be supplied with a ready stream of gossip. Alice left them and went over to the younger ladies, who were gathered in a small circle. Sometimes there was pleasing company to be found in Lady Jersey's drawing-room, but today was not one of those days. She took a seat and accepted a plate with cake and a cup of tea, which the footman brought over from the hostess. She wasn't hungry, but would need something to do with her hands while she endured the conversation. Unlike her mother, she did not relish being fed a steady diet of gossip. "'We were just talking about Mr. Clavering when you came in,' Teresa said, startling Alice with the name of the man who had been occupying her thoughts more than she would have liked to admit. Teresa added, "'Not Sir Lucius Clavering, who is married, of course, but his younger brother, George Clavering.' Alice was thankful for her dull complexion that did not easily give way to a blush. She had no interest in Mr. Clavering, but had found his company enjoyable— that Teresa and Barbara should be talking about the one gentleman who had piqued her interest for the first time in years was so unusual as to be almost suspicious. It was as if they knew what was in her thoughts. Or had they perhaps seen her talking to him last night? She picked up her fork and took a bite of almond cake. Oh, and what did you conclude about Mr. Clavering? She was fairly certain no one had noticed them speaking in the alcove, at least no one of consequence who would spread rumours. But she could not be entirely sure, as London had many pairs of eyes. "'We were thinking it high time he settled down. I'm married, of course,' Barbara added, placing her hand on her heart and indulging in a condescending smile. "'But Teresa here is not, so I was telling her she should seek to make his acquaintance. He could be a fine marital candidate.' Teresa added, and I was saying that he is indeed a fine prospect. At the very least, he would be nice to look upon each morning. But I cannot say he would add to my consequence. He is only a younger son. Alice was out of all patience with them, and the irony was not lost on her that here were women talking about the importance of a pleasing face at the breakfast table, 
the very thing for which she had scolded Mr. Clavering. She fiddled with the handle of her fork. "'I'm sure you have enough consequence for you both, should you wish to marry him. Has he turned his eyes in your direction?' Teresa was a well-looking young lady, although her lack of wealth had been a hindrance to her marital prospects. Still, she replied without any trace of modesty. "'In truth, I do not think of him seriously, and have not attempted to attract his notice.' She tossed her chin and added, "'But should I wish to do so, I am quite sure it would only be a matter of time. Perhaps I will, just to enjoy the flirtation.' "'You must surely be right,' Alice murmured. A fleeting thought crossed her mind, to warn Mr. Clavering about the studied pursuit being staged. But then she wondered why she should do such a thing. He was no concern of hers. The butler came in and announced more visitors before ushering in two young ladies with their mamas. The first was Diana Moore, and she came to take the remaining seat next to Alice. Gwendolyn Chauncey was the other one, who trailed in behind her mother. It was the first time Alice had seen her at Lady Jersey's house, but then it was her first season. Her mother was wealthy enough to be accepted, but she did not have the bloodline to give her access to the innermost sphere. Miss Chauncey glanced at the circle of young ladies, which was now complete. Without showing any signs of regret, she went and took a seat on her own by the window, smiling up at the servant as he brought her refreshments. "'I believe I shall go speak to Miss Chauncey,' Alice announced. "'Who?' Diana Moore glanced over at Miss Chauncey, then drew her brows together. "'But she's barely out of the schoolroom. Surely she can have nothing of interest to say.' "'Enjoy your conversation.' Alice returned sweetly, and went over to sit in the unoccupied chair by Miss Chauncey, who looked up in surprise. "'Lady Alice,' she said in some confusion. She sat upright and waited for Alice to speak. Alice smiled at her. "'I saw you sitting here on your own, and I wanted to come and introduce myself. We were not presented at the Mayfair's card party, but that is easily remedied, and I thought I might enjoy your conversation.' Miss Chauncey allowed her gaze to drift to the circle of women Alice had just left, then turned her serious expression back to her. Perhaps it depends on what sort of things you like to talk about. Alice's esteem for Miss Chauncey was growing by the minute. Apparently she was not one to flatter people higher on the social ladder. This should prove a fruitful relationship, if given a chance to develop. I like to talk about all manner of subjects, although I am not overly fond of gossip. Miss Chauncey smiled for the first time, and Alice thought that if only Mr. Clavering had seen her face in this instant, he would not write her off as having no charms to attract a man. True, she might dress without much flair, despite her family possessing wealth, but that might only mean she was preoccupied with things of greater import. "'Then we are of the same mind,' Miss Chauncey replied. "'Although it is the reason my mother wished to come to Lady Jersey's house, to learn what she may.' She is hoping to launch me off creditably in my first season. It will be her triumph if she can. If only she did not have such an intractable daughter. Alice laughed. How alike we are in this. Are you able to resist her efforts? Miss Chauncey looked down at her hands clasped on her lap. Well, to a degree. But I do not have an independence. My mother's wealth is hers to use as she sees fit, and not even my father dares cross her will. She will force me into marriage, I fear. If you will permit me to meddle in your affairs, Alice said cautiously, do you suppose there is a way that you can marry to please your mother, but choose the husband to please yourself? Miss Chauncey held Alice's gaze. I would like that, but I do not know whom I might marry that would be acceptable to both my mother and me. We have such differing ideas about what is acceptable. What would you like in a husband? Alice asked, to invite a confidence about Mr. Duckworth, to be sure, but also to learn more about Miss Chauncey, whom she instinctively liked. A fleeting smile crossed Miss Chauncey's face. Someone handsome and fun, someone who will make me laugh. The Duchess stood, signalling an end to their visit, and for once Alice was not ready to go. She had not achieved her objective of learning everything about Miss Chauncey, Although their conversation must come to an end, she could not help but ask, "'Do you have anyone in mind?' Miss Chauncey hesitated, but shook her head, clearly not ready to share what was in her heart. Alice could not blame her. She would have done no differently. 
I won't press you, Alice said, wishing to set her at ease. I believe my mother is waiting for me. I hope we might meet again soon. I've enjoyed talking to you. As have I. Miss Chauncey's expression showed genuine pleasure. I hope we might be given the opportunity. Alice smiled and got to her feet. She went to join her mother, and was filled with a sense of satisfaction. She had not erred in her assessment. Miss Chauncey wanted someone handsome and fun. Mr Duckworth was the perfect candidate for that. And she was confident Mr Clavering would soon be made to see that Miss Chauncey's charms were no less present for being hidden. 4. George knocked at his brother Lucius's residence, and Briggs opened the door with a prim smile. A "'Good morning, Mr Clavering. You are early, if you will permit me to say so.' George entered and handed his hat to the butler, then allowed him to help him off with his cloak. "'Morning, Briggs. I assume you are already aware that my brother has sent me an invitation to wait upon him. Otherwise you would not see me here at this hour.' The butler bowed, then turned to place the hat on the chair underneath the stairs, and hang the coat on the rack there. "'Sir Lucius made me aware of your probable arrival.' "'My certain arrival, you mean to say?' George said with a laugh. "'If my brother sent the request, you know very well I must come.' He jogged up the stairs and leaned over the handrail to add, "'As they are expecting me, I will announce myself.' Lucius's wife, Selina, was allowing her toddler to lean upon a very round belly that looked as though her lying in were imminent, but which George was told was not for two more months. She smiled at him when he walked in and held out her hand. He bowed over it, and reached over to tickle the chin of his nephew. "'Hugh, you are growing into a fine young man.' George picked up the toy his nephew had dropped, and handed it to him. Hugh climbed down from the settee where his mother rested, stuck the toy back in his mouth, and peered at George. Although he could say a few words, he was choosing not to at the moment. "'Greet your Uncle George, Hugh,' his mother advised him. "'Like this,' George added, giving a bow to his nephew. This is how you properly greet someone. Hugh continued to stare at him, and Selina smiled and shook her head. Forgive him. I believe he is cutting some teeth in the back and is not his cheerful self. Lucius has invited you to come, I've been told. George sat on an available chair and shot his sister-in-law a glance. Both you and I know that a request from Lucius is nothing less than a summons, I assure you nothing else would have got me out of bed this early, had Lucius not added, at your earliest convenience, in that top lofty way he has. Selina laughed. I am sorry to hear it, but I'm glad to see you. It has been an age. Thankfully, Philippa keeps me abreast of your latest news, or I could almost imagine you had left London for all we see you. Hugh spotted a toy and began to walk toward it faster than his reflexes would allow. George reached out his hands and caught his nephew just before he tripped. Where's Lucius? Selina looked behind him as the sound of the doorknob to the nursery turned. Why, here he is just now. Her face lit up when her husband walked in, which in George's estimation made his brother a lucky man. Lucius had made a mull of it when he'd begun courting Selina, but she was filled with more grace than her husband deserved, and she'd forgiven him. From what George could see... Lucius never gave her cause to regret it. Lucius walked over to Hugh and swept him up in his arms, kissing the top of his head. He then came over to his brother with his hand held out. George, it was good of you to come so promptly. Hugh stared at George from the safety of his father's arms, his fingers in his mouth. He was the spitting image of Lucius, even in the way he looked at a person. For the first time in his life, George was struck with the thought of what it would be like to hold his own son the way Lucius held his, to be the person who had the greatest importance in a child's life. He dismissed the notion. A man his age was too young to consider setting up a nursery. Then, to George's surprise, Hugh leaned from out of his father's arms, showing his willingness for George to take him. George held his nephew, bouncing him up and down in his arms, and his eyes were on the child when he finally answered Lucius. With a request like that, I did not dare refuse. I imagine I can guess the topic of conversation. That will make my task a lot easier, Lucius replied, and come with me to the library. George kissed the top of his nephew's head. I shall not bring you with me, for you would not like it at all. 
I'm sure we are to talk of responsibilities. He said the word with an exaggerated despondency, causing Selina to laugh. George handed Hugh to his mother, giving Selina another casual bow, before he followed his brother out of the room. Would you like something to drink? Lucius asked when they were both in the library, and had shut the door behind them. No, I had breakfast not long ago. George took a seat without being invited to do so. Lucius sat in the seat across from George and folded his hands on his lap. You said you thought you knew why I called you here. Would you care to hazard a guess? George lifted his eyes to the ceiling as if in thought. Either you have heard some rumour about me, some shocking scandal, and I shall be made to marry a merchant's daughter whom I have compromised. George lifted his eyebrows in interrogation, and Lucius shook his head, amused. Or some of my debts have been inadvertently sent to your house, and you are shocked by the scope of them. I have gone through my quarterly revenue and have ruined you besides. George paused, again looking at Lucius, who shook his head in weary patience. George sighed and folded his hands. Well, that can only lead me to one conclusion. You wish me to attend to the affairs of my estate. Now, see, there you have it, Lucius said. It is your estate, after all, and something must be done about it. Twinings cannot run itself, and certainly not with that steward I put in place while you were still under age. The man has had no proper surveillance, and I cannot feel sure he is doing what is best for the property. Lord, I feel old. Lucius paused, and George did not break the silence. He glanced over at the chimney, where a cheerful fire crackled in the grate, and waited for his brother to continue. I need not remind you how fortunate you are that father left you something in the way of an inheritance. So few men have the advantages you have when they are not direct heirs. But if you are to make something of twinings, you must soon take it in hand. Lucius was giving a rare scold, and George was mighty uncomfortable waiting for him to get to the end of it. For the moment you're only living off the land. You're not increasing its capital or investing in it in any way. And you haven't gone to see the tenants for yourself— you will end up with a very pitiful inheritance to leave to your heir if you don't begin to manage your estate. George remained silent. He wanted to protest, but he knew there was much truth in what Lucius said. Still, why couldn't he live a few more years in peace without having to take on this responsibility? George's mood plummeted. He had known this interview would come, but it was not any easier to hear because of it. Lucius rested his hands on the armrests of his chair and met George's gaze. I know you don't need a scold from your older brother. Trust me when I say I don't like to give them. I have enough things weighing on my mind in my own life without trying to run yours as well. But I thought I would tip a warning in your ear. I too was young once. Ha! There I must disagree with you, Lucius. George had meant it for a jest, but with his current mood it was coming out heavy-handed. I don't believe you were ever young. You were born already at the head of the family, and father was merely holding the position for you. Amusement pulled at his brother's lips. No, halfling, I had my own desires. I wished to play, but there were obligations pressed upon me that I could not avoid. I suppose you were lucky you had no such pressure. Lucius rubbed his chin and looked at him. Then again, where there is no pressure to take on responsibility... There is no pressure to grow. I think it would be tempting for you to leave Twinings for another year, but the longer you neglect it, the more difficult it will be to build something worth handing down. You are of age now and may do as you like, of course, but if you don't despise a word of warning from your older brother... He let his words trail off. George stared across the room, his thoughts sombre. He rested his chin on his hand. No, of course not. You know how thankful I am for all you've done. But I hope you don't expect me to run off to my estate now. The season has only just begun. Surely it can wait until the summer. Lucius's lips tightened. He seemed to be wrestling within himself. But at last he answered, It can wait until the summer, but perhaps not for much longer. I've held the responsibility as long as it was legally mine, and, as I've said, I have my doubts about that steward. I'm still getting the reports, although the estate was fully yours as of three months ago. George exhaled. Very well. I give you my word that I will look into it.
Once he left Lucius's presence, George pushed the conversation out of his mind. It could wait until after the season ended. He had more pressing things to take care of, such as making an overdue visit to his tailor and responding to the invitations that had piled up on his desk. That night, George and his friends arrived at the Blakeleys for a private ball that promised to be entertaining, as there would be a separate room with tables for playing cards. He wondered vaguely if Lady Alice had been invited. He had enjoyed talking to her, enough to know that she would add to the evening's amusement. George had never before thought about who her friends might be, and what connections she might have. He had never paid her the least heed. But in this instance, since Mrs Drummond Burrell was present, and she and the Duchess of Carr were friends, he dared hope Lady Alice might be in attendance. The intimate ballroom was packed with people, and a stream of them flowed past him, Miss Chauncey followed the crowds, her path crossing his. George could not help but glance at Duck to see if he would notice the girl, and was unsurprised to see that he did not. When Miss Chauncey walked by, Duck stared right through her until she curtsied in front of him. This made Duck snap to attention and train his gaze on her. His expression changed into one of interest as he bowed. "'Good evening, Miss Chauncey. You look very well tonight.' She wore a smile that improved her, and at Duck's words Miss Chauncey turned pink with pleasure. It further enhanced her appearance. "'Good evening, Mr Duckworth.' With a tiny nod she moved on, and did not try to further the conversation in hopes that Duck might invite her to dance, which George thought was wise. At least the girl had some brains. He had not talked to Duck about his strange conversation with Lady Alice, and he was reluctant to do so. However, when she left... He could not help but ask, "'How do you know Miss Chauncey?' Duck watched her walk off. "'You know of her. Charming girl, isn't she? We were paired together at the Mayfair's card party. I was lucky in my choice of partners. She doesn't talk your ear off, besides being amusing, and she certainly knows how to play cards well. As a matter of fact, we won.' George nodded. Duck's focus on Miss Chauncey's ability at cards was not exactly promising for Lady Alice, who had expressed certainty that he was infatuated. At the same time, George did not detect any strong aversion in Duck toward the girl either. He needed to find out what made Lady Alice think so highly of her. You'll have to introduce me to her. Duck stepped back to look at George, bumping into Amos, who made a protest and caught his drink before he spilled it on himself. After a quick apology to Amos, Duck returned a surprise gaze to George. You actually want to be introduced to a young lady. Don't tell me you're interested in her. George was merely trying to gain knowledge of the terrain and figure out what had made Lady Alice take note, but he might have made a misstep. Duck almost looked jealous. But surely it must be some other emotion, since Duck had never given a second glance to a girl who dressed so simply and made little effort to enhance what was a rather plain, if sweet, face. You know very well I'm not interested in anybody, but if she makes for a clever conversational partner, perhaps I might dance with her. Duck looked back at Miss Chauncey as if with fresh eyes, considering the idea. And that is very true. Perhaps I should ask her to dance as well. We laughed a great deal when we played cards. It is much better to dance with someone who has conversation than one who has no more than a fine figure. George realised his strategical error with chagrin, he was only increasing Duck's interest in Miss Chauncey by offering competition. He attempted to regain ground. I never thought I would hear you say that. I was certain you would list a beautiful face and fine figure as the most important attractions for a dancing partner. Duck shook his head. No, fine figures are better appreciated from the sidelines as they dance with others. But for the ones I have to stand with, I would prefer they have two intelligent words to say. "'Perhaps you are not as much of a flirt as everyone claims you are,' George said, an eyebrow raised. Duck took pride in his ability to charm women. "'That's just jealousy talking,' Duck said, with his usual grin. "'Of course I am. But I'll introduce you to Miss Chauncey before I ask her to dance, as a sign of my good nature.' He started after Miss Chauncey, who had come to rest on the sidelines not far away. George saw the flash of pleasure on her face at seeing Duck approach before she schooled her features. That hardly surprised George, but what he hadn't expected was to see Duck reciprocate the look. 
There was only a slight pause before Duck indicated George at his left. "'Please allow me to introduce you to Mr. Clavering. George, this is Miss Chauncey.' Miss Chauncey pulled her attention from Duck and turned to curtsy, bestowing her smile upon George. Her face was much prettier and more animated when she smiled. Duck then bowed formally and extended his hand, lifting his head with the smile that George knew he used when he wished to slay hearts. "'May I have the pleasure of the next dance?' To Miss Chauncey's credit she answered with subdued pleasure and did not seem particularly slain. Had Lady Alice not put the idea in his mind, he would have been hard-pressed to see her infatuation. Her reticence only caused Duck to double down on his charm, and he began to regale her with a funny story as they moved on to the dance floor. George was then given ample time to berate himself for focusing Duck's attention on Miss Chauncey after she had passed by, rather than distracting him from it. He turned to face the crowd, and for the first time spotted Lady Alice on the other side of the room. She had arrived then. Lady Alice was watching Duck and Miss Chauncey begin the figures of the dance. She caught his gaze, and her arched brow accompanied a self-satisfied smirk, before she turned away. George was frustrated, but he also knew it was his own fault. He longed to get one the better of Lady Alice, to goad her in some way, but he was not sure it was possible. Could he speak to her when they had never been formally presented? All he knew in that moment was that the urge to spar with her was strong, and he almost risked attempting it, no matter the consequences. Fortunately, he thought better of his plan. He would likely be snubbed if he did, for it was one thing to approach her in an unusual circumstance, and another to approach her brazenly at a private ball. Instead, he sought out Mrs Drummond Burrell. He bowed before the formidable matron, patroness of Olmax, and even though this was a private gathering, she still reigned supreme. "'Ma'am, would you do me the honour of introducing me to Lady Alice Sinclair?' Mrs Drummond Burrell assessed him, weighing his worth, and whether she should accord his request. On one hand, Lady Alice was far above him in station, but on the other hand, she was old enough to fend off improper advances. And to George's advantage, he knew he was a valuable addition to any party, with his polite manners and pleasing address, which was why so many hostesses invited him. In the end, this combination of facts in his favour seemed to win her over. "'Very well, Mr Clavering. She won't dance with you, I can assure you of that, since she has not done so at all since the season before last. But if you'll come with me, I'll introduce you.' She brought him over to Lady Alice, who had her back turned while in conversation with a group of two other women. Her dress, the colour of champagne, sloped down in the back, revealing the top of her very pretty shoulder blades, where a long curl rested that had been pulled strategically from her chignon. "'Lady Alice!' Mrs Drummond Burrell said. When she turned, George had a glimpse of her face, which was difficult to read. "'Allow me to introduce you to Mr George Clavering.' George bowed. When he lifted his head, the young woman before him had a wary look in her eyes. It was not Lady Alice at her warmest, the one he had seen when they were talking in the alcove. This was Lady Alice of society. She assessed him, aloof, as though she were above him, as though she doubted his purpose in seeking her out, and dreaded being forced into an intimacy she would not like. George wondered if he had imagined their connection at Almax the other night, if he had imagined her enjoyment of their conversation had matched his, he almost lost his courage. "'Mr. Clavering, this is Lady Alice Sinclair,' Mrs. Drummond Burrell went on. Lady Alice curtsied, her expression still reserved. "'A pleasure.' "'The pleasure is all mine,' George said. Mrs. Drummond Burrell gave him a nod and moved on, her business having been completed.' When she left, George indicated an area with more space in the crowded room, and Lady Alice walked at his side. He was just coming to the realisation that he had not thought through what he should say to her, when Lady Alice broke the silence in a cold tone. "'Why did you request an introduction?' "'Because I wish to speak with you,' he replied, looking at her with surprise. Then his humour returned, at least in small part." and one cannot speak to a woman, as you know, if one has not been properly introduced, apart from those extenuating circumstances I told you about. 
I see. She looked over the crowd, making no attempts to assist him with the conversation. The onus was to fall on him. George came up blank, apart from the only subject that connected them, the subject that he was not currently very confident in. I was wondering if you had made any headway in bringing about the match you were so sure of. Her eyes took on a more interested, less wary look. As a matter of fact, I made Miss Chauncey's closer acquaintance at a morning call two days ago, and I count that as a step in the right direction. George nodded, as if absorbing this. Then he started suddenly, as her meaning penetrated his understanding. I had thought Miss Chauncey a friend of yours. Lady Alice smiled enigmatically. She is now. What would have caused Lady Alice to interest herself in the fate of a woman she scarcely knew? It was one thing for him to intercede on behalf of a friend, whose tastes he was acquainted with. But how could helping Miss Chauncey benefit Lady Alice? George would have to puzzle that out at some point. He focused instead on that goading he had hoped to do. I hate to inform you of this, but I was able to witness Miss Chauncey and Mr Duckworth interact this evening. She crossed his path, and he looked right through her. I would not say it is a promising beginning. This was a gamble. Right now she held the stronger hand, since Duck was currently dancing with her protégé. It was a weak gambit, and he knew it. He wondered when she would show her trump card. Instead, Lady Alice sent him a look of tolerance and said, Of course he did. Men only react on the surface level until they can be made to see what matters. George was feeling his way through this conversation in hopes he could gain the upper hand. That would give him great satisfaction. If he could just sow doubt in her mind about why Duck and Miss Chauncey were dancing together, he might be able to mitigate the damage. It was time to bluff. Despite his lack of interest... Duck did say something complimentary about Miss Chauncey. He said she was decent at cards and did not trouble him with boring conversation. It won't be enough for matrimony on his side, but at least he appreciates her as a harmless companion who won't importune him by falling in love. Yes. Lady Alice gazed at him shrewdly. Is that why they are now dancing together? So they might converse? Ah, the trump card. Must tread delicately. George took on an air of nonchalance. As a matter of fact, Duck said something along those lines. If he wished to dance with someone, he preferred conversation over a fine figure. This was supposed to be his riposte, but with that, Lady Alice foiled. I make my point. They are perfectly suited. A pretty face will only ensnare a man's foot. A pretty conversation will snare his heart. George was able to get out one word, Hardly, when Lady Alice interrupted him with sudden suspicion. Did you speak to Mr Duckworth about our wager? He put his hand on his chest, as if affronted. I would not do such a foolish thing. Nothing would make him turn against the idea more than my bringing it up. But then you would win the wager. You would be acting in your own interests. Lady Alice had left off her icy tone, reserved for society, and her teasing was back in full force. George shook his head. But I would not be playing fairly by the rules. We need to see if, left to their own devices, they will seek each other out and form an attachment. Lady Alice smiled for the first time that evening, and he thought how much more charming and approachable she looked when she did. That was one trait she shared with Miss Chauncey. Although, when Miss Chauncey smiled, she only looked tolerable. When Lady Alice smiled, she looked... Well, that was not a thought worth pursuing. So you play fair, she said, her eyes sparkling with good humour and speculation. I always play fair, he replied, allowing indignation to colour his tone, although he was not in earnest. He had better quit while he was ahead. George looked down at her train and saw that she had left it down. I see your train is not pinned up, so I shall not ask you to dance, but I have enjoyed these few minutes speaking with you and I look forward to seeing our match played out. As do I, Mr Clavering. George bowed and left, feeling that he had fared well enough at the end of their conversation. At the same time, he had to own that his hand had not been strong in this round. Next time he would be better prepared, and would acquit himself properly. He was already looking forward to it.
Chapter 5 Alice waited for her mother in the front hall, wearing a walking dress that was designed with the lower waist and broad-cut shoulders that were coming into fashion. It was the hour for them to take the carriage to Hyde Park. She no longer had interested gentlemen inviting her for these promenades, which perfectly suited her long-term goal of not marrying, despite her mother's insistence she make a greater effort. With each passing year, there had been fewer and fewer suitors desiring her company, believing her to be aloof, and knowing her to be adamantly against marriage. With her train continually down at each event where there was dancing, she further enforced this message. As much as Alice was glad that the gentlemen were at last respecting her wishes, she was discovering there was one inconvenience in deciding not to marry. Until such a time as she was considered old enough to be permitted to establish her own residence, she was at the mercy of her mother and sisters for entertainment. She could not go riding in Hyde Park alone. Her mother came out of the drawing-room, accompanied by Elizabeth, Alice's second oldest sister. Elizabeth genuinely appreciated Mother's company and always found excuses to come and visit her. She rarely brought her children, as Elizabeth could only handle their young exuberance in short doses, and their mother was not precisely a doting grandmother. The Duchess liked to make a great show of bestowing her regard, whether it be through affection or correction, but was happy enough after a few moments in their company, at which point the devoted offspring were carted away by their nurse. "'Good, you're ready,' Elizabeth announced, when she spotted Alice. Elizabeth turned to their butler, and as one born to the household, though she was no longer living in it, said, "'Horace, you may send for the carriage. We are ready to go.' Alice rode with her mother and sister in the barouche on the rear-facing seat, relieved to be out in the brisk March air instead of cooped up in the drawing-room. Although she did not care for gossip, like the other women in her family— it was interesting to see who walked with whom and what people wore. The path was muddy, and there were bits of snow melting on the lawns on either side of the broad path. Alice still needed her muff to stay warm. Her mother and sister carried on a conversation about the Earl of Gravely's wife, who had been spending a shocking amount of time in the company of an unmarried gentleman, a confirmed bachelor, whom she appeared to have loved even before she'd married— they interspersed this discourse with observations about the people in nearby carriages, attired in what they deemed to be sadly out of fashion. No one was spared from their dissection. Alice tuned out their conversation and contented herself with watching people and inhaling the scents of fading winter and the flowers poking through the earth. Hyde Park promenades were another of those small pleasures she enjoyed, along with her mornings spent in bed reading. If for no other virtue, her time in the park at the fashionable hour was colourful, required little from her, and was held in the fresh outdoors. A carriage approached them at a quick pace from behind, inching closer. As Alice was facing the back, she could see the couple quite clearly, although she could scarcely credit her eyes. The carriage belonged to Bertram and Cleophus Bell, or Cleda as she had always called her. Alice's jaw dropped. "'Why, yes, Lady Alice!' Clada called out, laughing. "'Your eyes do not deceive you. "'I have returned from Paris, as you can see. "'Surprised?' "'Astonished,' Alice called out. "'Her day had suddenly grown much brighter. "'Clada Bell was her closest friend "'and the only one she could truly be herself with. "'Alice had been dreading the long season "'without Clada's company to laugh at suitors "'and sigh over rude young women of their acquaintance. "'She was supposed to be on her honeymoon in Paris,' and had not been expected back until after the summer. At last, Clada's carriage pulled up alongside theirs. "'Good afternoon, Your Grace, Lady Elizabeth. I am hoping you will permit Alice to join me in my carriage. It has been many months since we've enjoyed a comfortable cosy, and I would love to do so now.' Clada then turned to her husband. "'Oh, you don't mind, do you, Bertie?' Their match had been arranged by Clada's parents, but during their courtship, Mr. Bell had shown himself to be a kind, generous-hearted man. If Alice were in the least inclined to marry, she supposed she would not mind someone a bit like Bertram Bell, a man who took his wife's needs into account, in addition to his own comfort. It was such a rare thing to behold in the male species. "'Not at all,' he replied. "'In fact, as I know you shall have a great many things to say to each other, I will risk the mud and walk over to greet my friends who have come on foot.' Alice looked at her mother, certain she would approve. She had always liked Clada, and what was more, as a former Langley, Clada came from a long, impeccable lineage. Her mother gave a gracious nod. 
Glefus, it is good to have you back on English soil. Alice has missed you, and I am sure she will be most happy to be informed of your latest news. Mr. Bell jumped down, opened the door to Alice's barouche, and helped her cross over to the other carriage, without having to set her foot on the muddy soil. When the transfer was successfully accomplished, he said, "'Even though my valet will surely take me to task for muddying my boots, I believe a walk will suit me just fine. Your Grace, I will have our carriage take Lady Alice home when she and my wife have finished their time together, if that suits you.' "'You are all kindness,' Alice's mother said. She nodded at the groom, who started their carriage forward, and Alice's spirits lightened as she watched it drive away. "'Oh, you are a dear, Bertie,' Clada told her husband, holding her hand out to him so he could kiss it. He did so, and smiled at both ladies before walking off. Their carriage moved forward, and Alice ignored everything around her in favour of her friend. "'How is it that you did not let me know you would be coming back early, Clada? I'm beginning to call into question the depth of your affection.' Alice teased. She had not for an instant doubted their friendship, but she really was most curious, as it was unlike her friend to change her mind. Furthermore, their honeymoon had long been planned and anticipated. Clada linked her arm through Alice's in their seat and leaned close enough that the coachman in front of them would not be able to hear. "'I know you will keep this to yourself, but I am expecting a happy event.' She raised her eyes in significance as Alice's heart leapt in understanding. "'It has not been an easy beginning, and Bertie feared for my welfare. He decided to cut the trip to the continent short and bring us back where I might be attended to more properly.' Alice knew better than to give way to the excitement she felt. It might provoke stares. She settled for lifting her eyebrows and squeezing Clayda's arm even tighter as she grinned. "'How very exciting!' And as much as I wouldn't want you to suffer for anything, I am indebted to the happy event, for it has saved me from a season of boredom. She narrowed her eyes at Clada, or well, provided you are still well enough to attend society events. You see me here, do you not? Clada said. She did indeed appear to be the picture of health. So tell me, what have I missed? Or oh, do not hold anything back. It will be as though I was right here from the beginning. In truth, as much as I loved Paris and Rome, I am glad to return and find what is familiar. Alice allowed her eyes to drift ahead. Scarcely anything is new. The season has only just begun. There was a card party at the Mayfairs. And who were you joined with? Clada prodded. Alice groaned. Oh, do not make me relive it. My partner was Lord Hicks. He asked me before I had a chance to secure another partner. In fact, his attention was so pronounced, I am sure he came with the intention of seeking me out. And to think he had never approached me for more than one dance, even when we were first introduced all those years ago. I thought myself safe. Clada's face showed commiseration. He was only biding his time. He waited for a couple of seasons and watched your disinterest and thought... She paused, her eyes laughing. I suppose he thought that since you had not already been snatched up... There'd been no one tempting enough to win you over. It needed only him to try his hand, or so he surmised. Alice laughed. If there was one blessing, it was that we were sitting across a long table from each other, and I could scarcely smell his breath. Honestly, the man has a valet. Surely his servant is optimistic enough to lay out the tooth powder. Oh, you know men who are such desirable catches. They don't need to do anything so mundane as clean their teeth or wash to make them acceptable to young ladies. Alice shuddered. Oh, let us move right along. Next there was Almack's opening night, where I'm sure you found someone tempting enough to cause you to pin up your train and dance. Alice laughed again. It came so easily with Clada. Actually, you would be surprised. I had the chance to witness Gwendolyn Chauncey there, and later at the Blakely's private ball. She's the younger sister of Dorothy Chauncey. You remember her. Miss Chauncey had been paired with Mr Oswald Duckworth at the card party. I can see you don't know who that is, but he's been out for a few seasons and is known as a flirt. Although I have observed him, and he possesses more of a kind nature than he lets on. He is of medium height, and has light brown hair and an irresistible smile. And you are smitten at last... Clada said, without any real conviction in her voice. You speak too soon. It was Miss Chauncey who was smitten. And at Almax, I was merely urging her from the sidelines not to accept the advancing Mr Lloyd. Heavens! Clada interjected. 
No wonder you are not tempted to the altar if these are your only prospects. You have perfectly summarised the matter. I was also watching the scene in hopes that Mr Duckworth would see true value right underneath his eyes. Clada lifted her hand to wave to someone, but although the other carriage began to slow, she turned back to Alice. I am to assume Gwendolyn Chauncey is not much more handsome than Dorothy? Unfortunately, no, although she has countenance. Despite that, I was impressed with her when we were placed at adjacent tables at the Mayfairs, for she was unfailingly polite to Lord Hicks when he was gauche enough to talk to the party at the table next to us, though she was sitting much nearer to him than I was, and must have suffered from his pungent smell. She did not follow Lord Hicks's example and treat me with unbecoming familiarity, and despite laughing a great deal with Mr Duckworth, she hid all signs of her infatuation from society, and I might have missed it too, were it not for my keen eyes. "'I know all about those keen eyes,' Clada stopped herself from saying more, lifting her gloved hand to her mouth for a moment, before turning to Alice, as though determined to be well. "'And so that was all that was of interest at Ormax? "'Not quite.' Alice found herself blushing. "'I was merely commenting to myself aloud about what Miss Chauncey should do, "'when who should step out from behind the window curtains behind me but Mr Clavering?' Clader looked at her in confusion. "'Sir Lucius Clavering, who is married to the former Selina Lockhart?' "'Alice shook her head. "'I don't know them, but I believe it must be his younger brother George. "'Although we had not been presented, "'he took my talking out loud as an excuse to answer me, "'and I found him difficult to snub.' "'Clader pulled away to look at her. "'Difficult to snub? You? "'Now this is interesting. "'You have found someone who at last catches your fancy. "'Admit it.' "'I will admit nothing,' Alice replied. "'Nothing has changed. "'I made it very clear I would not be dancing "'and that I would not be marrying.' "'Clader's eyes twinkled. "'Only you could say such a thing to a chance-met acquaintance.' "'Alice smiled and shook her head. "'But we did end up wagering on whether somebody "'with as few outward charms as Miss Chauncey "'could attract someone like Mr Duckworth.' I don't know why I entered into a wager with a man I'd never met. It is only that I was particularly irked at that moment by the idea that only the best-looking women should attract someone, or only those with the best settlements. It makes me angry for our sex. We are nothing better than a commodity to be bid upon and added to a man's collection. Clader sighed. I know all about your feelings on the matter, and I agree with you. I understand why you would not wish to marry when you do not need it in order to survive in society. Furthermore, I suspect another reason you have no interest in marrying, although you have never expressed such a thing yourself. Conversation with Clader was always interesting and often enlightening. And why is that? If I may say so, you have a secure place at home, but you are not overly, shall I say, cherished. You have no wish to enter into another household where not only are you possibly not cherished, but your settlement will become the property of your husband. You fear you will be left with nothing. Clader had dropped her voice again so that the groom could not overhear. The words hit their target. Alice had never been able to truly identify why she did not wish to get married, other than a sense of overall stubbornness, as it seemed to her, and from what her mother accused her of. But what Clader said was true. Why give up freedom as she knew it for a situation that was likely to be no improvement? Certainly, it could at times be lonely, like today, when she had thought she would have to endure the company of her mother and sister just to take an airing in the park. But at least she had her place in the household, and she knew her brother would never force her to leave it, even if he took a wife. She also had her settlement, and could go build a life somewhere else, should she choose to. What was more, it was a handsome independence that would not leave her in any kind of pecuniary difficulty. In marrying, she would give all that away in exchange for... What? Life chained to someone who would likely stop paying her consideration the minute he had his hands on her money. And then she would be alone and destitute. I dare say you are right, she said. She did not have to drop her voice. It did that of its own accord. "'Now do not fall into melancholy,' Clader nudged her side. 
I did not bring up such a heavy subject only to plunge your spirits. Rather, I wish to tell you that there is a whole world waiting out there, a world full of unimaginable delights in being married, if only you would make a love match. Alice sighed and looked over at the parade of carriages crossing in front of the line of trees. A love match? Oh, you cannot expect me to believe such a thing exists. The closest I can hope for is something like what you have with Mr. Bell, where you are on exceedingly cordial terms. I know your marriage was arranged, so you won't convince me it's anything like a love match. Her friend surprised her by grasping her arm. Look at me, Alice, she commanded. When Alice did so, Clayda spoke, her voice low and intent. Ours is a love match, even if I had no idea what such a thing was, and even though we did not enter into it with that intention. That is what it is now. Alice raised her brows. She could not believe what she was hearing. Clayda, how did this happen? How is that possible? Clayda laughed and blushed a little. Let me just say that it is very hard to remain perfect strangers when one is married, and I dare say that is what happened, but we found ourselves quite enjoying each other's company. She turned her gaze on Alice. And I do not want you to miss this great thing that could be yours, with only a grain of faith and a little resolve. No, I'm not suggesting you marry the first person who crosses your path, but I want you to have the deep happiness that I have, and I think you are missing out if you don't try for it. Two gentlemen rode toward them, drawing Alice's eyes up. The one closest to her lifted his hat, and she recognised his square jawline, and the cheeks now flushed from the brisk air, his shining eyes set under those dark curls. His breath came out in a cloud, and when he looked at her, his lips curled in a saucy grin. Her heart did a little flip. It was one thing to stand close to him at Ormax, hanging on to an intimacy that was not properly theirs. It was another thing to see him as a sportsman, enjoying the fresh air as she did, and watch his eyes light up when they landed on her. She could not help but be influenced by Clayda's words in this collision of moments, and wonder if she were not indeed missing out on something. In the next instant, her common sense returned. Mr. Clavering pulled to a stop. Lady Alice, please allow me to introduce my friend Matthew Evans. He is married to... He screwed his eyebrows up, as if contemplating how to explain the relationship. My sister's husband's sister, but he has been a friend from childhood. Enchanté, Alice replied, smiling at Mr. Evans and then back at Mr. Clavering. As an afterthought, she turned to Clayda. Mr. Clavering, may I also present you to a close friend of mine, Mrs. Cleophas Bell, formerly of the Langley family. Why was she telling him that? He wouldn't care about Clayda's family. Enchanté, Mr. Clavering said in his turn. There was a pause that grew weighted when they did not move or speak. She longed to indulge in more of the playful banter they had shared in the two times they had met, but could not do so with two other witnesses. Before she could be tempted to act out of character and do something stupid, like flirt, Alice sat up straighter. She put on her society mantle. "'Have a good afternoon, Mr. Clavering, Mr. Evans.' She turned to Clayda, adding, "'Shall we drive on?' The carriage moved forward, but not fast enough for her to miss Mr. Clavering's friend, saying in a dry tone, "'I'm speaking French now, are we?' Clayda was looking at Alice keenly. "'Mr. Clavering, now I see who that is. How very, very interesting!' Six. George dressed for Mrs. Harris's ball, where he was to present Philippa to Miss Chauncey. He was still questioning the wisdom of whether he should have brought the problem to his sister, who could not help but meddle. He hoped she would have the wherewithal to refrain. After the ball, he would go to the club with friends, in the usual fashion. In his earlier London years, the ball had been a penance that must be paid to not offend society hostesses before he could be liberated to spend the rest of the night as gentlemen did, meeting at the club, watching a fight, or gambling for moderate stakes. George never gambled with the goal of winning money from his friends. He went for the pleasure of spending time with the people he liked best. Until now, he'd had yet to find anything more worthy to do with his time. 
Goodness knew the household in which he'd grown up had not taught him that happiness might be found in the bosom of his family. It was a place where the brother he'd looked up to had scarcely had time for him. His mother had been there to harangue or coddle him, and he had been sure to endure a scold under his sister Mariah's sharp tongue. Philippa and he had always been close, but they did not share the same interests. The best source he'd had for fun and larks had been the friends he'd made at Oxford. This had continued past his school days and into his life as a gentleman, giving him the somewhat rakish reputation he did not entirely deserve. Only his closest friends knew that he had never taken a mistress. George dressed in black silk pantaloons, square ballroom slippers, and a black waistcoat, topped with a black coat, whose pointed tails fell to his knees in the back. He was relieved that men's fashions were changing, so he could do away with the breeches and silk stockings that had once been needed for private balls, although all Macs would likely require breeches until the end of time. He could not see that mammoth institution ever adopting any modern codes. Tonight, George was looking forward to attending the ball more than the club, which was a change. As he tied his cravat, he mused over why that might be. Philippa would be there, for one, which always provided relief to the tedium of balls. But he guessed that his particular interest tonight would be in watching Philippa try to make what she could of Miss Chauncey, and in being amused by Lady Alice's certainty that Miss Chauncey could secure Duck for her husband. George was equally certain Lady Alice was wrong. After all, apart from Matthew Evans, not a one of them was ready to settle down. Duck least of all. They were committed to the bachelor lifestyle for at least another five years. George arrived alone, and after greeting the hostess, sent his first glance around the room in search of Lady Alice, rather than his friends. That realisation did not sit entirely comfortably until he explained the lapse to himself by the fact that he had something at stake, and only the two of them could discuss the progress of their bet. Philippa was already at the ball, in the company of other wives to influential men of politics, her elegant gown no longer concealing the bump that showed she was expecting. He put his hand on her shoulder, and as she turned, he bowed before the women. "'George!' she exclaimed, bidding farewell to her friends, before grabbing his arm and saying in a low voice, "'I've not found anybody who can introduce me to Miss Chauncey.' She leaned her head toward him and continued as she led him away. "'No one seems to know who the girl is. There's only one thing for it. You shall have to introduce me to Lady Alice, so I might meet Miss Chauncey through her.' George pulled her to a stop and stared at her for an instant, before giving a dry laugh. "'Yes, of course. A brilliant idea.' Then Lady Alice will know that I've been talking to my sister about our wager. And of course she will be more than happy to introduce you to Miss Chauncey, a woman she scarcely knows, thereby revealing to that young lady our scheming over an infatuation Miss Chauncey obviously hopes to keep secret. What a wonderful idea! Philippa did not show herself in the least bit daunted by this derisive summary of her plan. Do not think that I have been in political circles without learning a thing or two, if there was anything to learn that I did not already know. Just introduce me to Lady Alice and I will do the rest. George stopped and turned to Philippa. In all seriousness, I cannot do such a thing. We barely know each other well enough for me to claim even a connection with her. I've already introduced her to Evans. It will seem as if I am seeking a more intimate connection if I introduce her to my sister. George was generally of a sanguine temperament, but he knew he had allowed his temper to rise when she exclaimed in an elated whisper, "'Why, George, you do like her!' Thankfully, George was not required to respond to a statement that was so obviously false, as Philippa spotted Duck and Amos coming their way. She held out her hand and allowed them to bow over it. "'How do you do, gentlemen? Your customary appearance at the Tant event before going to the club?' I see this season is no different, and that you continue to amuse yourselves in much the same way as always. She sent Duckworth a direct look when she added, Have you not thought about settling down at some point? Philippa was provoking. Was George's sister working on his behalf or against it? He should not have consented to her meeting Miss Chauncey. He had just been looking for her to agree that he was right about the wager. Why? He could not say. Perhaps simply so he might gloat in private. Duck placed his hand over his heart. Philippa, 
Surely you know me better than to ask such a question. And just because you and Evans have both found matrimonial bliss does not mean it is something we are each of us striving for. I have many more years on the playing field before it is time to think about marriage. George sent his sister a meaningful look. I, for one, would like to get married, Amos said. The words had a pronounced effect on the group, like that of a dropped bombshell, and everyone turned to look at him. When he saw the questioning gazes turned his way, he flushed up to his roots. I'm sorry to say, as much as I enjoy all of your company, I'm starting to tire of joining you for late gambling sessions every night. I'm beginning to think that it might not be such a bad thing to settle down with a young woman who has something in her brain box so I'll not be bored to tears, and who has a pretty enough face to look at. That's not so much to ask, is it? George, although reeling from the pronouncement that was a sudden shift from Amos's customary view, exchanged humorous glances with Duck. Well, we shall not bet against you settling down in the clubs. We don't want to lose our money over you. Duck smiled at a woman who passed by and bowed in her direction. She stopped and curtsied in return, sending a glance over her shoulder. George watched the encounter with satisfaction. At least one of them would not be giving up his flirts too soon. Lady Alice entered George's field of vision, drawing his attention, and he wondered if she had just arrived. Her back was turned as she moved in the opposite direction. Philippa had clearly seen her too, because she said, "'Gentlemen, if you'll excuse us, George and I were just on our way to speak to somebody.' Without waiting for an answer, and to George's apprehension, she hooked her arm around his and began to follow Lady Alice, who was walking with her companion from the park. They appeared to be very close, from the way they brought their heads together. Lady Alice laughed, and George was glad she had someone she was that close to. He'd had a vague sensation when speaking with her that she suffered from loneliness, although why she should was beyond him. She had everything she needed at her disposal. Alice and her friend came to a sudden stop, and because the room was crowded, Philippa allowed herself to bump into the two women. "'Oh, please forgive me,' she said with a friendly smile. I was not paying attention to where I was going. George, shall we go to the refreshment table? He could not remain silent now that the two women were looking at him. By all means. But first, allow me to introduce you to Lady Alice Sinclair. Lady Alice, this is my sister, Mrs Philippa Blythefield. Lady Alice gave him an assessing glance before offering Philippa a curtsy. Her pleasure. This is my friend Mrs Clay de Bell, she has recently returned from touring the continent with her husband. Oh, that is something I would like to do, Philippa said, clearly in her element of whipping up conversation from scratch. After Mr. Blythefield and I were married, we considered what we might do in the way of a honeymoon. Unfortunately, he could not leave Parliament for any length of time, and we did not wish to travel all that way just for a short trip. I suppose we should have gone when we had a chance. Philippa glanced down at her belly by way of explanation. Mrs. Bell smiled in sympathy. Yes, that does make it infinitely more difficult. Am I correct in thinking your husband is the Mr. Blythefield who is leader of the opposition? Philippa nodded, and Mrs. Bell continued. My husband is one of his supporters. He doesn't have any great role in Parliament, but he attends the debates and admires your husband's passion for unpopular causes. Philippa laughed at the unexpected flash of humour in Mrs. Bell's voice. Then I must acquaint your husband with mine. Is he here? He is, on the other side of the room. Mrs. Bell glanced at Lady Alice, hesitating. Oh, yes, do introduce them, Lady Alice said. I shall be fine. Philippa turned to leave, and George was glad to have escaped Philippa's scrutiny of his interactions with Lady Alice. However, before his sister left, she turned back to say, oh, Lady Alice, should we not have a chance to speak further this evening? It was a pleasure to meet you. I hope we might become better acquainted. Lady Alice surprised George with her warm response. Oh, that sounds delightful. I am often in Hyde Park. I only miss the fashionable hour for inclement weather. I'm fond of parading there myself. Philippa's eyes lit, and she drew an inspired breath. I've just had an idea. If it would be convenient, I could come and pick you up in my carriage on one of these days. That way we could go together. Certainly, Lady Alice replied. So promptly, George could barely recognise this as the same woman he had verbally sparred with. Either she was much friendlier with women, 
or had been particularly taken with Philippa. Or, George thought with sudden suspicion, she hoped to gain the upper hand in their wager by pressing his sister for information. Or Thursday, if that suits you, Lady Alice said. Philippa linked elbows with her new friend, Mrs Bell. It does. I'm sure my groom will know how to find your residence. She offered something between a nod and a curtsy. Until then... When they walked off, George was reeling at how his sister had managed the meeting and what it could mean. He turned his thoughts to what Philippa might gain from the friendship. Was she simply going to see what Lady Alice saw in Miss Chauncey, or was she going to try to assist the match, thereby making him lose the wager? Speaking of which... Where is the subject of our wager tonight? I do not see her, but I was happy to make the acquaintance of your sister... I believe she is also a friend of Mr. Duckworth's, and she will be able to secure me an introduction. As a woman, she also has a degree of common sense most men lack, which will make her an agreeable addition to my circle of friends. I am looking forward to our outing on Thursday. Lady Alice gave him an enigmatic smile, curtsied, and took her leave. George watched her, petite though she was, weave her way through the crowds as though they proved no obstacle. A degree of common sense most men lack. He had been so busy watching her leave, he only now registered her words. Lady Alice was by far too quick an opponent, and he would do well to keep her away from Philippa. George would find his sister as soon as she and Mrs Bell had parted ways, and he would let her know that he'd be accompanying her on their outing to Hyde Park. On Thursday, George appeared at Philippa's house at about the time he thought she would be leaving to collect Lady Alice. Philippa came out of the drawing-room and lifted her brows in surprise. "'George, I did not think you were serious about accompanying us. It is ridiculous. I am a married woman, and this is Hyde Park in the middle of the day. Lady Alice and I do not need an escort.' George put on his overly patronising elder brother look, which he knew Philippa hated. You, my dear, are in a delicate way. I do not want any harm to befall my future niece or nephew. I must insist upon seeing to your welfare. Philippa studied him with narrowed eyes that looked just like Lucius's in that instant. How odd that this side of you as the doting uncle has not appeared until now. The footman opened the door for them, and George gave her a nudge outside. I'm always this way with little Hugh. You haven't had much chance to witness it, that's all. "'but you cannot find a more doting uncle than me.' "'Hm,' she said, tightening her lips in disbelief "'as he led her to the carriage and helped her into it. "'An easy ride brought them to Lady Alice's door, "'and George held up his hand to stop the footman from climbing down. "'I will go and knock.' "'And leave me to the hazards of the street on my own, dear George?' "'Philippa called after him, in a tone overly sweet.' He ignored her and went and rapped on the door, where he was admitted by the butler. As he stood in the entryway waiting for Lady Alice, the Duchess came out of the drawing-room. Horace, we... She stopped short at the sight of George, then advanced forward to meet him. Good afternoon. I believe we have not been introduced. George bowed. Good afternoon, Your Grace. My sister is to ride with Lady Alice today in Hyde Park, and as the two women are unescorted, I wish to lend my protection. The Duchess stared at him blankly for a moment. It did not appear she was aware of her daughter's plans, and he wondered if she would refuse to give consent. And who is your sister? Mrs. Philippa Blythefield, he answered, feeling as green in her presence as a boy attending his first ball. The Duchess narrowed her eyes in thought. Blythefield... Is she the wife of Mr. Jack Blythefield in Parliament? Although Jack held a prominent position as leader of the opposition, George was still somewhat surprised that the Duchess had made that connection. She is, Your Grace. The Commons, was all the Duchess would add. He could see that to her it was a gross failing indeed that they were not speaking of the House of Lords. George nodded. That is correct. Not many people made him nervous, but he was beginning to hope for Lady Alice's arrival. He did not dare to proffer any other subject of conversation. After a minute of uncomfortable silence, the Duchess turned her gaze to him. 
Although she was petite, she gave the impression that she was looking down at him. "'And you are?' "'Mr. George Clavering, Your Grace. My brother is Sir Lucius Clavering, Baronet of Mardley.' The Duchess lifted her eyes, as if searching her memory, adding, "'And he is married to—' George thought it strange that she would care for all these particulars, but he filled in the answer. "'To Lady Selina Clavering, nay, Lockhart.' The Duchess of Carr's eyes flashed in understanding. This was a woman who had the pulse of society's en dit. He could only guess what she made of his sister-in-law— who had fallen out of grace at one time because of her father's indiscretions. Lucius had given her standing again, but she was content to live quietly at her husband's side rather than reclaim her position in the temps. At last, Lady Alice appeared at the top of the stairs and came down the steps, her eyes fixed on the contents of her reticule as she searched for something. She paused midway, caught sight of George, and raised an eyebrow before continuing her descent. "'Mr. Clavering, what a pleasure. "'I had thought my outing today would be with your sister.' "'George bowed, still feeling out of his element. "'Lady Alice had not shown pleasure at seeing him. "'It is, but as my sister is in a delicate way, "'I wish to lend my escort. "'I hope you do not mind.' "'Lady Alice examined him shrewdly, "'in a way that was very much like her mother. "'Not at all.' "'She turned to the Duchess.' "'Mother, I will be home in time to dress for dinner.' Oh, "'See that you are, for we are to attend the opera,' her mother replied, as the butler opened the door and allowed them to exit. Once outside, Lady Alice ignored George, but smiled at Philippa, allowing the footman to help her into the carriage. George didn't care. He was not about to let his sister and Lady Alice become better acquainted, without knowing what sorts of things they would talk about— he could see that his wager against ducks being married was far from a sure thing, and if he knew his sister, she would turn on him, assist with Miss Chauncey's match, then start to plan Lady Alice's own before their carriage ride was over. George was not about to lose the first bet, and as for the second, he hardly thought Lady Alice needed any help. "'George, you shall have to take the rear-facing seat since you have forced your presence upon us.' Philippa flashed a conspiratorial grin at Lady Alice, who returned it. George took the seat opposite to them. "'The pleasure of your company is enough to make up for the inconvenience of my position,' he said. "'How flattering,' Lady Alice replied, in a dry tone. But her glance was curious. She was probably wondering what had prompted him to come. Never mind, he was not going to give up his advantage now. They rode into Hyde Park, and as the three of them were all well known, they were constantly hailed from one side or another as they progressed down Rotten Row. "'I do believe it is Miss Chauncey and her mother,' Lady Alice remarked, with a knowing glance at George. Philippa snapped her parasol shut. "'It is a beautiful day out, and there's not a speck of mud anywhere. Lady Alice, what do you say to our walking together?' "'That is a fine idea,' George interjected. "'We will all benefit from the exercise of walking.' Philippa gave him a severe look. "'My invitation did not include you, dear brother.' George pretended to look hurt. "'But you would hardly abandon me to sit in the carriage all by myself. "'A gentleman as personable and handsome as you "'would surely not end up sitting in the carriage alone for very long,' "'Lady Alice observed. "'This park must be filled with your flirts.' "'Lady Alice thinks I am handsome.' "'I do believe I see Mr. Duckworth over there,' she continued. "'Why, and so you are right,' his sister said, with a gleam in her eye. Lady Alice lifted her hand to her bonnet to adjust it against the sun. "'Let us get down and walk.' "'These two women should not be left alone together,' George decided. "'They were much too dangerous. "'He descended from the carriage and followed the ladies over to Miss Chauncey, "'whose face lit up at the sight of them.' She turned her back on her companion. Her mother was walking far ahead with an acquaintance, leaving Miss Chauncey to the dubious pleasure of Lord Hicks's company. George had not bet on or against Lord Hicks, but he had no desire to see Miss Chauncey endure his company for longer than necessary. They came upon the group. "'Miss Chauncey,' Lady Alice said, ignoring Lord Hicks, "'allow me to introduce you to Mrs Blythefield.' Philippa smiled broadly. 
"'It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Miss Chauncey.' "'Miss Chauncey returned it, and with a glance at Lord Hicks said, "'My lord, it was kind of you to walk with me, "'but now that I have found my friends, "'I shall not trouble you any longer for your escort. "'I wish you an excellent day.' "'She curtsied and turned to walk with Philippa and Lady Alice. "'When they had gone out of Lord Hicks's hearing, Lady Alice said, "'Miss Chauncey, you have the makings of a duchess. "'It is too bad my brother is too young for you.' They laughed. George was beginning to feel de trop with three women who were determined to ignore him, but he would not lose sight of his quarry. Duck and Amos spotted him then, and as Duck's gaze slid over to Miss Chauncey, George regretted his having insisted on escorting the women. Duck would never have noticed her if George had not been there. George! Duck came over with Amos trailing behind. Afternoon, Philippa. You've just missed Whitmore, who's heading to some meeting with his father. Those in politics lead such dull lives. Duck added, with a wicked grin at Philippa. Of course, if I were in politics, it would be quite a different affair. I would carry out such fiery debates. If only, if only, she mocked with a grin. Lady Alice, may I present Mr Duckworth and Mr Amos? Philippa turned to George. I suppose you should be performing these introductions as they were first your friends, but since I have begun I shall go on. This is Lady Alice Sinclair, and this is Miss Chauncey. Miss Chauncey, allow me to introduce you to Mr Duckworth and Mr Amos. We have met. We are acquainted. Duck and Miss Chauncey both spoke at the same time, then looked slightly embarrassed. After the curtsies and bows were exchanged, they all moved forward as a group. At the narrowing of the path ahead of them, Duck offered his arm to Miss Chauncey, and George had the questionable pleasure of watching them move forward, heads bent together. Philippa remembered something pressing she needed to speak with Amos about, or so she said, but George wouldn't have put it past her to prevaricate if it suited her. It only made sense for George to offer Lady Alice his arm. It was the first time Lady Alice walked closely at his side, as if this were a proper courtship, and the sensation stole his words for a few moments. He had wanted to talk to her, but now that he had the chance, he had no idea what to say. He wasn't sure if he should try to pull her ahead, to intercept Duck and Miss Chauncey, or take these few minutes to try to see what Lady Alice was thinking. As these thoughts turned in his mind, George became increasingly aware of her touch at his side. He feared when it came time to hand her back into the carriage, he would be reluctant to let her go. It was an illogical and unnerving thought. Seven. Alice should not have taken so much pleasure in Mr. Clavering's company, but she could not deny the fact that she did. When her eyes had lit upon his form, standing so incongruously in the entryway to their house, her heart had given a decided thump at the sight. It annoyed her that her body should betray her thus, and she could only attribute such an odd reaction to surprise. No gentleman came to call on her any more, and now that there was one such man— she was lulled into remembering what an agreeable sensation it was. Of course, it helped that the gentleman was good company, even if she still did not wish to marry. They had walked silently for long enough, and she was beginning to become aware of his physical presence in a way she did not relish. It was time to speak. "'It is gratifying to see Mr Duckworth and my new friend getting along so famously. I will need to begin thinking of what I shall request of you,' "'A lock of your hair?' Alice pretended to muse. "'No, such a thing is only worth something coming from a woman. "'Shall I order you to dance with five of my closest unmarried friends?' "'Have you so many?' Mr Clavering asked, in an innocent tone. Alice continued as though she had not heard him. "'Perhaps you shall be required to come to my rescue "'every time I am forced to converse with someone I don't like. Hmm. In any case, victory is all but assured, and I'm eager to claim my prize. Lady Alice, he said, lifting his gaze to the sky. She could hear the playfulness in his tone. I would be horrified by the prospect, were I actually in fear of losing this wager to you. But as I have no such fear, I shall have to begin thinking of what I shall require of you. Perhaps it is for you to accept an invitation to dance at last, and with any man of my choosing... "'How unoriginal,' Alice replied, pursing her lips and looking straight ahead. "'Or 
it could be to accept the hand in marriage of the first person who asks you, Mr. Clavering continued, looking for all the world as though he was enjoying himself. That Alice did not find amusing. The terms were no harm done to either party. Mm, fair enough, Mr. Clavering replied, relenting instantly. But the possibilities are endless. I shall look forward to discovering more ideas and sharing them with you. Now that I think of it, your having stated the terms in such broad measures was a boon. It can only work to my advantage when I win. Alice was about to retort, but Mrs. Blythefield turned back. Gentlemen, ladies, forgive me, but I find that the walk is tiring me just now. Would you mind very much if we went back to the carriage? Well, not at all, Alice replied, thinking of a way to dismiss Mr. Clavering before she grew too comfortable at his side. Oh, but gentlemen, do not allow us to ruin your fun. We shall bring Miss Chauncey back to her mother and release you to find other company in the park. We would not dream of curbing your amusement in any way. Lady Alice is solicitous, gentlemen, George said. But have no fear on that score. I will be here to see that my sister and Lady Alice come to no harm. Once we've brought Miss Chauncey to her mother, you may safely leave them in my hands. How attentive, his sister said, in a tight voice that sounded as though she was choking down a laugh. After Duck and Amos had bid farewell, and they had brought Miss Chauncey to her mother, Mr. Clavering did not leave Alice's side until he and his sister had deposited her back on her doorstep. She did not know whether to be pleased at the attention, happy that for once she had enjoyed an outing in Hyde Park with unmitigated pleasure, or cross that he had stuck to their side like glue. He clearly did not like the idea that she would come to know his sister better, which led to only one conclusion. She would have to bring Mrs. Blythefield into her inner circle. That night, Alice stepped into the drawing-room to join her mother for the opera. She found both the Duke and Duchess waiting for her there, and she drew back in surprise. "'Father, do you intend to come with us tonight? "'That was most unusual. "'The Duke rarely attended the opera "'or any other social activity "'that meant accompanying his wife and daughters, "'save for the more formal events, "'such as presentation at court. "'He flicked his eyes up from the pocket watch "'he had pulled out at her arrival. "'I had thought I would attend, yes. "'It has been some time since I've been to an opera.' The Duke's voice did not betray any enthusiasm at the idea. In fact, he appeared particularly austere. Alice scrunched her brows when her mother gave him a look. There seemed to be some underlying current between her mother and father. Since they were not about to disclose it to her, a mere daughter, she put it out of her mind. This was their problem, whatever it might be, if a problem there was. Alice walked over to the side table and opened the drawer that held the lorgnette she used for the opera, she was wearing a gown the colour of Bordeaux, with long sleeves made of sheer muslin, capped at the wrists with a band of lace. There was a sash that cut diagonally across her bosom in an asymmetrical way that was quite modish, she thought. The gown was loose enough to swirl about her feet as she walked, and she knew the colour was particularly flattering against her brown hair and complexion. It pleased her. A woman should feel pretty in her own right, even if it's not for the purpose of attracting a man. In the silence of the carriage, she wondered if she might bring Miss Chauncey more closely into her friendship with Clayda. Together they could better help her achieve her desired match. Alice's mind was still full of this project when they arrived at the opera. She followed her parents up the broad marble steps, welcoming the heat that emanated from the candles and throngs of people. Now late March, it was still cold outside, and it had been a particularly bitter week. Alice was looking forward to seeing Clayda, and now Mrs. Blythefield, whom she had already begun to consider as a friend. She almost chuckled to herself as she remembered how Mr. Clavering had anxiously watched over their growing intimacy that afternoon. But it was not just to thwart him that she sought Mrs. Blythefield's company. Apart from Clayda, Alice had never met anyone so similar to her in temperament. From their afternoon together, she quite thought they could see eye to eye on any subject— although she suspected Mrs. Blythefield had a determined flair for matchmaking that outweighed her own. Whereas Alice was doing it for sport, prompted by a meeting with a certain young gentleman, along with a desire to help Miss Chauncey, who had looked to be a lamb going to the slaughter, Mrs. Blythefield appeared to matchmake because she thought everyone should be so happily riveted as she was. Before the end of their carriage ride together, 
Alice had made it clear she had no interest in such a thing. At the time, Mrs. Blythefield had replied with, Of course, but Alice had a sneaking suspicion she was not convinced. She searched the crowds for Cleda, but had the misfortune to cross paths first with Teresa Wolfe. She did not have time just now for idle chatter. Lady Alice, don't you look delightful? I see you are embracing the newest fashions. Alice's smile was impatient, as she looked ahead, eager to continue the search for her friend. Teresa darted a glance behind Alice at her parents, who had stopped to speak to a couple they knew. She leaned in to say, I see the Duke has graced the assembly with his presence tonight. How unusual! Apparently, Alice was not the only one who'd noticed how strange it was for her father to attend the opera. He's not particularly fond of opera, but he wished to see this one. As she could not, for the life of her, remember what opera they were there to see, Alice could not justify his presence by claiming his famous passion for Handel or Mozart. "'Is that so?' Teresa raised an eyebrow. "'I had quite thought it was for the other reason.' Alice could see she was bursting with news, and a sense of foreboding crept upon her that the news was connected in some way to Alice's family. She did not wish to satisfy Teresa's desire to gossip, but she could not help but wish to know what it was. She said nothing, hoping her silence would prompt Teresa to openness. "'You must know, of course, to what I am referring.' Teresa leaned in, giving an intimacy to their conversation that Alice did not want. She nodded, keeping her expression perfectly blank, as Teresa raised a hand to her forehead. "'Oh, that is such a relief. I am glad I did not have to be the one to tell you. I hope your family has taken the matter well in hand, for Lord Anley is much too young to be snared by the likes of Mary Morgan.' Alice's mind was whirling. Mary Morgan was not a name she could identify in any context. Was she supposed to know this woman? Was her brother in some kind of trouble? She sought the right words to respond that would not reveal her ignorance. I am sure you will understand that I do not discuss my family's affairs with anyone. Or not even with old friends? Teresa asked, placing a gloved hand on Alice's arm that left her longing to swat it away. I'm afraid to tell you that this news is circulating amongst the entire audience tonight. I'm sure every set of eyes will be on your family. Where is your brother? Alice had no idea, but she longed to see him at that moment. What sort of trouble had he got into? She hadn't even crossed his path often enough at home to be able to guess. He is of an age to attend the opera with friends rather than his family. This declaration only frustrated her, as it reminded her of the fact that, technically, so was she. She just happened to be a woman. Yes, I'm sure you're right. Teresa looked around, searching the crowds as she added, oh, But he's not old enough to avoid the snares of an opera singer. An opera singer? So that was who Mary Morgan was. Her father must know about this, which was why he'd come, and which was why he looked so severe. Bartholomew was setting the town ablaze over a woman who was wholly ineligible, thus disgracing his family's name. Alice's heart sank. She was sure her father would be displeased about any talk that occurred over his son's behaviour. She wondered what her mother made of the situation, and whether she would try to scold her son into obedience. Alice had watched Bartholomew grow from boyhood to manhood, and knew all too well the stubborn streak that his mother did not seem to notice. Alice's thoughts were whirling, and she wanted to leave Teresa's presence. "'It sounds as though the opera will begin soon. Have a good evening, Teresa.' She gave a slight smile and nod as she moved on. Her parents had by now walked ahead, and her mother turned back to say, "'Come along, Alice. We must take our seats.' Alice did not bother to resist, although she had hoped to find Clada and sit in her box seat with her. She was still in the corridor outside their own box, when that very friend intercepted her path. "'You've arrived. I was coming to look for you.' Although Clada's smile was ready, it had none of its usual brilliance. "'You've heard, haven't you?' Clada only briefly hesitated before nodding. "'I see your father has come. He shall nip this thing in the bud, I'm sure. No one will dare gossip in the face of a duke. Besides, your brother is not the first person to be snared by the advances of a piece of muslin.' He's more likely to outgrow it than he is to run off to Gretna Green, I assure you. 
her mother came out of the box and stopped when she saw Cleda. Good evening, Cleofas. Alice, come inside. It was an order, but Alice was too alarmed to protest. Gretna Green? Her friend had meant to reassure her, but that only made the problem take on alarming proportions. No sooner had she sat than the lights darkened and the comedy began, followed by the first act. Alice could not focus on anything but the alarming news. What did it mean that her brother was ensnared? Surely Bart would never marry some woman of low repute. But what other consequence could there be to a situation so dire as to bring her father out? Alice eyed her parents. Neither of them appeared to be enjoying the evening either. In the first intermission, Alice could not leave the box seat without accompaniment, and her parents showed no desire to move from their seats. Her father's gaze was fixed on something in the orchestra seats, and she looked down. Bartholomew was making his way down Fop's alley to the pit. He turned and smiled at someone who clapped his shoulder. He greeted someone else, looking perfectly at ease, as though he had no idea what a stir he was causing. But his steps were firm, and she thought he must be going to see his opera singer. Alice glanced at her father, whose expression was more grim than ever. "'Good evening!' At the sound of the voice at the entrance to their box, the three of them turned. Alice saw with relief the cheerful face of Mrs. Blythefield. "'If you will excuse my interruption, Your Grace,' she bowed first to the Duke, then the Duchess, adding again, "'Your Grace, I thought Lady Alice might like to take refreshments with me.' Alice glanced at her parents. Normally she would not ask their permission for anything, not at her age, but everything tonight seemed upside down. Her mother nodded, unsmiling, but it was a yes. Alice stood, relieved that she would be free for a few minutes. As they walked in the corridor, Mrs Blythefield took her arm. I did not come by with the intention of bothering you, but when I saw you sitting there, I thought you might like to walk around a bit. Oh, you've saved me, Mrs Blythefield, Alice said. That was precisely what I wished to do. But if my parents make no move and I have no one to escort me, then I'm stuck one of the disadvantages of being an unmarried woman still living in her parents' home, Mrs. Blythefield observed, steering their path to the refreshment table. Lady Alice glanced at her sharply, wondering if she had heard criticism in her voice, but Mrs. Blythefield saw her look and only shook her head at the unspoken question. My mother has never been very present in our lives, but my older sister served the purpose well. She has a very heavy hand, Maria. Alice couldn't help but ask. Now that you are married, do you see her often? Mrs Blythefield bit her lip and smiled. Maria's family, so I must pay my respects, but I do not seek out her company. She turned to Alice. If this is not too forward, I would ask that you call me Philippa. I'm not overly formal. Alice smiled at her. That would be nice. She did not offer the use of her name without the title, for her mother had impressed upon her how few people could address her as such, but Philippa did not seem to mind. Alice felt a kinship with Philippa. How was it that they had not met before? They must be about the same age. Then again, Alice's parents restricted her friendships to those in the same social sphere, and their sphere was small. That was surely why. They went to take champagne and watched the people walking by. Quite a few of them glanced in Alice's direction, and she now knew why. It bothered her, but there was nothing she could do about it. Philippa did not address the subject of Lord Anley, but instead led the conversation to indifferent topics, and that cheered Alice. At least not everyone in the town was interested in gossip. They stood near one of the marble pillars on the side of the broad corridor that held a vast number of people moving in both directions. Alice spotted Mr Clavering walking with another gentleman, and Philippa brightened at the same sight. "'You should be given a chance to meet Mr Blythefield. "'He is the handsome fellow walking next to my brother.' "'Alice smiled. "'Mr Blythefield was indeed a well-looking man, "'but this was a delightful sign of partiality. "'As an impartial judge, "'she would have to give the honours to Mr Clavering.' "'The men arrived, and Mr Clavering bowed before her. "'Lady Alice, it is a pleasure to see you again.' "'Jack, you are here.' "'Mrs Blythefield took her husband's arm.' "'Lady Alice Sinclair, may I present to you my husband, Mr Jack Blythefield?' They exchanged greetings, 
Then Mr. Blythefield turned to his wife, saying, "'I wish you will permit me to escort you back to your seat. You complained earlier today of being fatigued. And no sooner had I finished my conversation with Whitmore than I found you gone.' The tone of his voice was playful, as if he knew his wife all too well. He then turned to her. "'Lady Alice, if you would permit me to leave you in the care of George here, I would like to see that my wife is not overly fatigued by this evening. She pretends to have boundless energy, but I'm not entirely convinced.' "'Oh, yes, of course.' Alice turned to Mr. Clavering. "'That is, if Mr. Clavering does not mind so onerous a task. He has, after all, assured me that no gentleman wishes to be tied down in any way.' Who am I to insist upon his walking me all the way back to my seat, when that might be construed as restraint? Mr. Blythefield clapped him on the shoulder, laughing. I shall trust that his sense of chivalry will win out. He bid them farewell, with his wife on his arm, and Philippa gave Alice's hand a squeeze before leaving. Mr. Clavering turned to Alice. You already have something to drink, so I shall not ask if you need one. It is fortunate for you. Your duties are thus limited. She smiled, knowing she was being ridiculous, but Mr. Clavering brought that out in her. He gave an appreciative grin. I saw Miss Chauncey tonight. I will own that she does improve upon acquaintance. Ah! Alice raised her brows. So you stopped to speak with her, and learned that her intelligent conversation and charming smile make her more worthy in your eyes than when you had only her face and figure as measure. I will not go so far as that, he said, his grin turning reluctant. But I will own to a little more understanding of why you thought she would be a good match for Duck. When her face lit in triumph, he lifted a finger. Not that I have budged from my position in any way. Duck is no more ready to be married than I am, and she will be launched by her determined mother before even the whisper of the idea reaches his brain. Alice shrugged. Perhaps... But then a little competition never hurt anyone. Maybe the sight of a determined suitor in her orbit will awaken something in Mr. Duckworth's breast. So that is your next move. I had wondered. Mr. Clavering looked self-satisfied. Alice smiled demurely. You think you are trapping me into revealing something, but I never reveal anything I don't intend to. He laughed. Very well, Lady Alice. Shall I walk you to your seat? She set her champagne glass on a tray and slipped her arm under his elbow, and they began to move toward her box seat. He had made her forget the worries over her brother for those few minutes. As the intermission came to a close, the worries came back in full force. She had not wanted to share them with Mrs. Blythefield, though she trusted her. But now she had a strong need to unburden herself to someone not connected so closely with her family. In a strange way, she trusted Mr. Clavering more. At least in this situation, he was a man, and would have different understanding. She tugged gently on his arm to pull him to a stop, as the first bell sounded throughout the hall. Mr. Clavering, have you heard the whispering about my brother? He stopped and met her gaze, and his usual teasing expression grew serious. In that moment, for the first time, she perceived in him a depth and kindness that she was almost sure was authentic. He glanced around at the crowd and the sets of eyes turned toward her darted away again. Your brother is young, and he is showing particular attention to a certain woman, going beyond what is usually accredited to calf love. But he is not the first person to be tempted by a woman it would be impossible for him to marry. He is not even the youngest. Alice lifted her eyes and studied his face. You? He smiled and hesitated before answering, but finally shook his head. Not exactly, not quite as naively, or publicly, shall we say, as your brother. In some ways it is a rite of passage for young men. He placed his hand over hers, that rested on his arm. His hand was warm, and it brought her immense comfort. But I would not be overly concerned at this point. I am not acquainted with your brother, but I don't believe he is at great risk of being harmed by the connection. Her heart lifted insensibly at his reassurance, but there was something else bothering her from their conversation that she would have to identify later. Alice allowed Mr. Clavering to bring her back to her parents. At their box he bowed over her hand, and when her mother and father turned toward the entrance and caught sight of him, he bowed to them as well, saying to each, "'Good evening, Your Grace.' 
Have a good evening, Lady Alice, he then said to her, before leaving. Alice sat as the audience began regaining their seats, and the second bell sounded. Her mother's voice came to her ear as she leaned in to speak. That is the second time Mr. Clavering has seen fit to escort you. It was seemingly only an observation, but Alice knew that with her mother it was never just an observation. She shrugged by way of answer. It is gallant of him, is it not? He's clearly beneath you, but not so much that it would give rise to talk, her mother said, before leaning back in her seat. Her mother was considering suitors still, and Alice hoped she would leave it at that. She hoped her father was too distracted to have heard anything at all. The second act started, and as the music swirled around her, Alice finally figured out what was bothering her. She allowed herself to dwell for a moment on the pang of disappointment she had experienced when Mr Clavering had confessed that he, too, had been caught in the clutches of an opera singer. She didn't know why she had hoped he would be above such a thing, but at least she had identified the emotion mingling with the relief he had brought regarding her brother. Disappointment. Alice exhaled quietly, grateful for the shroud of music. This was another reason she would never consider marriage. She would not, could not, share her soul in such a way with a man who would only be unfaithful. And as Mr Clavering had only reinforced her belief that all men were incapable of fidelity, she was determined to cling to her spinsterhood, as though it were the last garment she owned. Eight. George dressed for a night at Ormax, wondering if he was going to meet Lady Alice there. It had been almost a week since he had spoken with her at the opera. He didn't see any reason why he should not see her tonight. After all, she was an unattached young lady of the Upper Ten Thousand, and even though she was no longer in her first bloom of youth, she was hardly too old to ignore the Wednesday gatherings. He reluctantly pulled on his silk stockings and breeches, the obligatory dress code that must be tolerated, as he thought back to his conversation with Lady Alice at the opera. She had looked vulnerable when she'd questioned him about what kind of trouble her brother might be in. George had wanted to comfort Lady Alice, and he quite liked the feeling that she had looked to him for reassurance. He enjoyed their friendly banter, but there had been a deeper undercurrent in their relationship that night, and he'd enjoyed that too. The truth was, Lord Anley was making a name for himself, and it was being spread about town. He haunted the footsteps of that opera singer, and she had put off all of her older, more renowned patrons for him. Lord Anley acted as though he was set on making a love match, and word on the street was that nothing his family or friends might say could have the power to influence him. George wasn't sure what kind of advice the Marquis of Anley was getting from his young friends, but perhaps, if given the chance, he would listen to George. He had not wanted to elaborate when Lady Alice had asked him if it had been he who had fallen into the same predicament as her brother. But no, his schoolboy crushes had been much more innocent and had never crossed the line. He had been tempted to tell her everything at that point, to say that setting up mistresses went against something ingrained deep inside of him. But he could hardly tell her that. For one thing, it was not fit for a lady's ears, even one as easy to talk to as Lady Alice. For another thing, it had been Duck who had been ensnared. Not only had Duck fallen into the same trap, but he had done so at the age of nineteen, and with no other woman than Mary Morgan. George could not betray his friend like that, no matter how tempting it was to do so, considering the irony of the circumstance. But perhaps chance would give him an opportunity to talk to Lord Anley. George frequently saw the Marquis at Gentleman Jackson's boxing saloon, though they had never been presented. If given the opportunity, he would attempt to secure an introduction and see which way the conversation led. It might be that he could lend his wisdom in a way the young man would not object to. When George arrived at Almax an hour later, he looked around for his friends, but for some time had no luck. In such a crush as this, it was difficult to see anyone he wished to speak to. It was worse than the opening night. He spotted Amos first and headed his way. "'Where's Duck?' he asked. Whitmore was standing next to Amos, and he indicated with a nod toward the other side of the room. "'He and Miss Chauncey have struck up a discussion, and he's not left her side for a full twenty minutes.' George looked at Whitmore in alarm. 
a discussion, whatever are they finding to talk about for such a length of time. He finally spotted them on the sidelines, and Duck's face held a look of focused interest that was different from the face he used for flirting. Just a discussion, then. But have they stood up together? No. Whitmore's expression looked grim. That's the worst of it. You know Duckworth. He never stays talking to a lady unless they are in between sets. If he's standing there talking to her instead of inviting her to dance, he's in greater danger than we know. This was a ridiculous conversation to be having. One day they all must marry, and to call it a danger to hold a discussion with a personable young woman, that was folly. But this was Duck, and from what he could see, Duck was not only talking to Miss Chauncey, they were laughing together. George narrowed his eyes. I'm going to do something about this. As he walked toward the couple, he wondered if Lady Alice were here, and if she was witnessing this unusual turn of events. He did not want her to gloat over what she must surely consider a victory. He could just picture her doing such a thing. Well, Lady Alice, if you call this a victory, it's a mild one at that. I'll see that it goes no further. One could hardly assume marriage, just because a man and a woman shared a conversation on the edge of the ballroom. That was the argument he would use, at any rate. However, George knew it was highly unusual for Duck to spend considerable time speaking with any woman, and when the evidence was before him, all George could think was that his best friend would no longer have any time for him. He continued his march forward, his gaze intent on the couple, when Lady Alice stepped in his path. She, too, kept her eyes trained on Duck and Miss Chauncey, hardly batting an eyelash his way. "'Charming evening, is it not, Mr. Clavering?' George tightened his lips. Just as he had expected, of course she would gloat. He stopped and folded his arms. "'You do realise that their simply holding a conversation means nothing?' Now she lifted her eyes to him, and the sardonic glint in them both infuriated him and attracted him, although that was not something he would dwell on. He continued his protest. And you do realise this is hardly grounds for marriage. It's not even grounds for courtship. They have merely held a conversation for a few minutes. You, my dear, are a long way from winning our wager. He fully expected her to retort with, Is that why you look so worried? Which was the truth. Instead, her eyes flashed with anger. Do not, my dear me, if you please, sir. George stopped, struck by her displeasure. She had taken it in the wrong way. He hadn't meant anything by it. But after a moment's reflection, he supposed it had been patronising. He was therefore sincere when he said, I beg you will forgive me, Lady Alice. I shall not use this term with you again. She stared at him for a split second, before he saw her features soften. He had surprised her with his apology. But what did she think? That he was a boor who did not know how to apologise when he had offended a woman. Apology accepted. Lady Alice's voice was quiet, and she looked down when she spoke, so that he barely caught her words. When she lifted her face again, her saucy expression had returned. Not everyone is as adamant in their convictions about remaining unmarried as we are. She turned her satisfied gaze back to Duck and Miss Chauncey. I've asked around, and I do not believe Mr Duckworth has ever shown so singular an attention to a woman before. You can hardly have talked to anyone who knows him as well as I do, George retorted, piqued despite himself. He was still trying to sort through his feelings on having angered Lady Alice and the realisation that it deeply bothered him to have done so. Well then... Lady Alice turned to him, her lips curved up in a smile. You tell me, have you ever seen him show so much interest in someone before? She had painted him into a corner. George faced her, glaring, then suddenly became conscious that they were standing much closer than he was used to standing with a woman he was not dancing with. She only came up to his chin, but she had a tiny waist that would make it easy to pick her up and kiss her. Good heavens! Where had that thought come from? George's mind was not heading in any sort of suitable direction. Although just because you have a passing fancy to kiss a girl does not mean you want to marry her, he reminded himself. He took control of his whirling thoughts. My lady, I've already made it clear I'm not going to help you win this wager by telling you more about Duck than you need to know. I understand. 
Lady Alice's voice was deceptively soothing. You feel threatened and are trying to pull back. If you do not wish to tell me more about Mr. Duckworth, I have other ways of finding out. I am not threatened. George folded his arms again. That had become his natural posture when standing with this woman, as though he were offering himself protection. And what ways are those? Lady Alice had not backed away or backed down, and he found himself staring into her brown eyes. There was a range of emotions in them, and he could not read them all. But he thought there was defiance and humour. Was there also the same sort of pull he felt? She raised an eyebrow. Just watch me. He had already forgotten what he had said to make her respond in such a way. Lady Alice reached down and lifted the train of her dress and hooked her wrist through the loop, pulling the train up. She turned and marched over to where George's friends were standing, to his considerable astonishment. He could only follow behind, numbly, to see what she was up to. She chose to approach Robert Whitmore. Mr Whitmore, Lady Alice curtsied before his friend. Whitmore stilled, his hand coming up to his breast. He looked astonished that she had spoken to him, and that made George even more certain she was contriving something. But he didn't really have a clear idea of what it was. "'I trust you remember our meeting,' she said to Whitmore, hesitating slightly at her audacity, if George was reading her correctly, but valiantly squaring her shoulders as the formidable young woman she was. "'It was four years ago at an Almax assembly. Princess Esterhazy presented you to me so we might dance the waltz.' Whitmore finally caught on to his manners, and he bowed. Uh, "'Forgive me, Lady Alice. Of course I remember. Who would not remember dancing with you?' He looked to his side, as if suddenly noticing Amos. "'May I present you to Mr. Nicholas Amos?' Lady Alice nodded, a pleased smile on her face. Then she curtsied before him. "'It is a pleasure, Mr. Amos.' Amos, at his best, was never a lady's man, and he was somewhat cowed by the august figure before him. "'My lady,' he murmured, cheeks flaming as he performed a bow. Lady Alice was studiously ignoring George in favour of his friends, and she turned back to Whitmore with a smile on her face. The man was a politician, but he was now at a loss for what to say. George would have laughed had he not been so provoked at Lady Alice's conniving. At last, Whitmore noticed her train pulled up and opened his mouth to speak. "'Lady Alice, I, I would be delighted if you would dance with me. Uh, that is, are you dancing? I believe you do not generally do so, but I see your train is up, and I've concluded uh, I should not like to be remiss.' Whitmore was faltering badly, and George had to turn away to hide his amusement. He turned back in time to see Lady Alice send Whitmore a brilliant smile. "'It is true I do not generally do so, but I would be delighted to dance with you tonight. Thank you for the invitation.' Whitmore turned a set of bemused eyes to George as he led Lady Alice over to the sidelines to wait for the set to begin. George watched them go, half amused and half irritated. "'She did not dance at all last year, and now she's going to dance with Whitmore just to milk him for information.' Amos came to stand at his side, his mouth still open. At that he shut it, and turned to George, confused. "'Milk him? For what?' "'Blast it! George had forgotten to keep quiet about their wager. "'Nothing. About something political, I suppose.' Amos turned back to stare at the couple as they waited on the sidelines. "'Lady Alice is acting strange, you must own. Not once did she dance last year. Now she's dancing with Whitmore.' Perhaps she fancies him. And you say she wants information? I cannot imagine he would have any knowledge she could not get by any other means she wishes. George remained silent, refusing to commit himself, as he watched Whitmore and Lady Alice enter the set. Amos turned to George with a calculating look. Don't you have a bet on Lady Alice that she will marry? He shook his head. I wish I had had the foresight to side with you. I wonder if it's too late to change my bet. George shot him a glance. You will not need to change your bet, believe me. I know what she's about, and it's not in search of a marital partner, and certainly not with Whitmore. I will not be surprised if she disposes of him as soon as she finds out whatever it is she's looking for, and then lets down her train again, putting a stop to any other invitation to dance. 
As soon as Lady Alice had finished dancing with Whitmore, the murmurs of surprise had become audible in the conversations throughout the room. Lady Alice had finally agreed to start dancing again. What did this mean? Was she now looking for a husband? There could only be one reason for it. No sooner had the dance ended than a handful of gentlemen dared to approach her. George folded his arms, amused and feeling smug. That will show her. Now she's stuck dancing with all of them. However, when the next gentleman bowed before her, the expression on Lady Alice's face showed unalloyed pleasure as she held out her hand to place it on the man's arm. She gave every semblance of a woman enjoying herself, even as she went on to dance with the next man after that. Lady Alice had a delicate step and danced prettily. She was as light on her feet as a bird and would soon be flooded with requests. He squeezed his fists together. Whitmore made his way back to their side of the room, having recovered all his usual urbanity. He stopped to talk to a gentleman, then stopped again to bow to a lady before finally approaching. Before he had reached their side, George questioned him. What did the two of you discuss? Whitmore looked at him, a new gleam of understanding in his eyes. Do not fret, we just discussed Duck and Amos, and she asked questions about me. Very easy to talk to, Lady Alice. Strange to say, but she didn't ask anything about you. George was not to be deterred. What sorts of things did she want to know about Duck? Whitmore nodded sagely, as if expecting such a question. Ah, you are most astute. As you say, she was quite interested in Duck. I can only guess that she wished to find out more about him, as he appears to have some interest in Miss Chauncey, who I am to understand is a particular friend of hers. Barely, George muttered. Whitmore went on. She wished to know whether Duck had ever formed an attachment. She assured me she had no desire to be overly familiar, and although the questions bordered on personal ones, it was done in such a delicate way. No one could have accused her of such. She also wanted to know how we had all become friends. Honestly, she didn't ask me anything that stood out as being familiar. I don't think you need to worry, if that is what you're doing. George scowled. I'm not worried. He did not have a chance to speak to Lady Alice again that evening, although he was reluctant to leave, and stayed at Almack's much later than he usually did. She went from one partner to another, without sparing him a glance. Finally, Duck came over and tapped him on the shoulder. "'Shall we go to the club?' George was relieved that at last Duck had stopped focusing on Miss Chauncey, but he was still hoping to have a word with Lady Alice. However, as he had no good reason to give for not leaving at that instant, he followed his friends out the door. He shot one last glance at Lady Alice, but she was talking to some gentlemen in between sets and did not even look his way. He pressed his lips together. He would have to wait until the next time to secure her attention. He was not going to beg for it, after all. He just hoped she was not questioning people too closely about Duck. All that talk would eventually get back to him, and Duck would be intrigued and be led to inquire more deeply into the matter. He would then find out that George had bet on his own friend. That simply could not happen. Nine. Alice had not spared another glance for Mr Clavering the rest of the night. It had been too much fun to torment him, especially after seeing the look on his face when she'd hooked her train over her arm. The last thing he'd expected was for her to stoop to dancing again so that she might gain more information about Duck. Although really, why had she needed to stoop to that at all? She did not need more information about Mr Duckworth than what was plain as day. He and Miss Chauncey would make a fine match. In the end, all that mattered was that the two became riveted. Seeking to obtain the information had been merely another means of provoking Mr Clavering. It was proving to be a vastly entertaining thing to do. A successful match would answer two things. She would win her wager, and Miss Chauncey would go into the arms of a man who would make her happy, rather than being forced into a match with the highest bidder who applied to her mother. And although it was the end result that mattered, Alice was beginning to realise her quest to gain more information was not done so that she might win. It was the pleasure of matchmaking that drove her. It was the sport of it, especially when enhanced by a wager from a man who was entirely too sure of himself and who would benefit from being put in his place. Alice smiled at the memory. 
Mr. Clavering had not looked quite so sure of himself last night, and she had enjoyed keeping him on his toes. Toward the end of the evening she had allowed her gaze to roam over the crowds, and found that he had slipped off while she was dancing. That was when she had been ready to end the evening as well. The dancing had been pleasant, and Alice hadn't regretted her decision to put up her train, a discovery that brought her a degree of surprise. True, some of the men were clumsy and stepped on her feet more than she would have liked, but many of them were agreeable to talk to, and dancing could be fun, even if, after a year of not partaking in the sport, she had been easily winded. On the ride home her mother had commented on how pleased she was to see that she was accepting partners again. Alice had not thought about that irritating aspect when she had decided to put up her train. It was almost like playing into her mother's hands. The false hope would only fuel her mother's determination. The next morning the Duchess was ready to set off for Lady Jersey's house, and, of course, there was no question about whether Alice would accompany her. When they arrived, Miss Chauncey was already seated in the same place she had been the last time they had met there. This time it was a deliberate choice, since there was still an available chair next to the other young ladies. Alice liked that Miss Chauncey did not seek to ingratiate herself to others. "'Lady Alice!' Annabel Grey called out upon seeing her enter. "'There is a seat for you here!' "'I beg you will forgive me. "'I have wished to speak to Miss Chauncey for this age, "'perhaps in a moment.' "'She gave them a friendly smile and turned her back on them, "'going over to Miss Chauncey. "'It is good to see you this morning,' Miss Chauncey said, "'once Alice had taken the seat at her side. "'Usually I find morning calls insipid. "'I detest talking about inconsequential things.' "'Alice laughed. "'As do I, which is why I came to sit with you.' Miss Chauncey smiled at the compliment. "'I saw you danced at Ormax last night. Did you enjoy yourself?' "'Vastly,' Alice replied. "'It has been some time since I have agreed to dance, and I found it more enjoyable than I had remembered. When I was younger, every dance was received as pressure to marry. It was not until I had made a decision that I would not succumb to any pressure on the matter that I felt free to follow my own inclination. Now I believe I may dance without giving rise to speculation.' "'Did you enjoy your evening?' "'I had the most splendid time,' Miss Chauncey said, her eyes shining. "'It is true I have only attended Ormax a handful of times, "'but I don't remember when I've enjoyed myself more.' "'Alice could hazard a guess as to why. "'She decided to risk broaching the subject that interested her, "'although she wasn't sure it would be well received. "'I am being impertinent, I know. "'I hope you will forgive me for it.' I could not help but notice that when you are in Mr. Duckworth's company, you seem to amuse yourself more than at other times. Miss Chauncey's open, friendly look shuttered, and she pulled herself up. I do not mean to be rude, Lady Alice, truly I do not, but I do not wish to discuss something so personal. At least, I do not wish to enter into a discussion that associates my name with anyone else's, without there being some kind of formal declaration. I hope you will understand. Oh, perfectly, Alice said, but she suffered a mix of embarrassment and chagrin. In her life she had only ever given snubs, she had not received them, and now she could understand what it felt like. Besides, she could hardly blame Miss Chauncey. They might have begun to seek out each other's company, but Miss Chauncey didn't know her well. Alice supposed she would be just as cautious were the situations reversed. They spent a few moments in an uncomfortable lull, and Alice strove to find a new topic of conversation, until Miss Chauncey blurted out, "'How well do you know Mr. Duckworth? I'm just curious why you brought up his name. Is he in your confidence?' Alice did not allow a smile to touch her face. Miss Chauncey, as private as she liked to be, did indeed have an attachment to Mr. Duckworth, and she could not refrain from asking about him. Alice might have erred in bringing the subject up, but perhaps it would allow for further confidences that could lead to the happy resolution she wished for her. "'I'm sorry to disappoint you,' Lady Alice said. "'I do not know him. In fact, we had only just been introduced in the park that day. I do have a passing acquaintance with some of his friends, Mr. Clavering being one of them.' "'Ah!' Miss Chauncey's gaze dropped to her hands, and she intertwined her fingers. "'Mr. Clavering does not appear to like me very much. "'In fact, he positively scowls at me.' 
Mr. Clavering scowls at everybody, Lady Alice said, her voice dripping with irony. She wished to say that it was because he saw Miss Chauncey as a threat to Mr. Duckworth's bachelorhood, and seeing his friend tempted to forego that status only threatened Mr. Clavering's own devotion to bachelorhood. But it would not be fair to give Miss Chauncey false hope when she had no grounds for it. Alice might believe that such a thing was true, but until a declaration was made, there could be no banking on it. Mrs. Chauncey had decided they had stayed the allotted time, and she called her daughter over to take their leave. Miss Chauncey looked up and nodded at her mother, then turned to Alice. "'I hope you will not have any hard feelings. I'm rather a private person, and I'm afraid I was unkind just now.' Any vestige of defensiveness disappeared, and Alice smiled and shook her head. "'Don't apologise. You need not disclose anything of your heart you do not wish to. I shall not think the worse of you because of it.' Miss Chauncey gave Alice a grateful look and bid her farewell before following her mother out of the door. That had been interesting. What she wouldn't give to be in Mr Duckworth's confidence. Now that she was alone, Alice decided it would be more prudent to go and sit with the other young women, despite the fact that, at times, their conversation could be tiresome. She had not even arrived at their side when the discussion was directed at her. "'Lady Alice, what a stir you caused last night when you began dancing!' The author of this comment was Miss Grey, who had made her come out two years prior and possessed a flair for the dramatic. Barbara Gower was there, as usual, along with Teresa Wolfe, and she leaned in to add, "'I believe we may not despair of you yet.' "'I hate to disillusion you,' Alice said, "'but my desire not to wed remains unchanged. "'I merely dance because I wish to do so.' It is not because I am on the hunt for a husband, and you may spread that about if you'd like. Teresa Wolfe shared a pregnant look with the other women, before turning to Alice. You may not be, but I am wondering if there is not some interest on the side of Mr. Clavering. He is a second son, to be sure, but I do catch him seeking you out more than any other lady. Alice was startled, and two thoughts flashed through her mind in rapid succession— if anything further had been needed to understand how Miss Chauncey might have felt when Alice had asked about her budding friendship with Mr Duckworth, this made things all too clear. Her meddling had been impertinent. Her second thought was one of alarm. People were noticing her relationship with Mr Clavering, although she had taken special pains not to give him any preferential treatment. Alice did not like gossip being spread about her. She did not want him questioning what their interaction might mean, and she did not wish to encourage the competition that would ensue among other gentlemen if it was spread about that she was open to receiving a, an offer. There was only one solution. She would have to begin ignoring Mr Clavering. If only it did not bring her so much pleasure to wrangle with him. All this rushed through Alice's mind as she considered how to answer. She could nip everything in the bud by replying that yes, he was a second son, so she couldn't imagine what they were thinking of. But that would be unfair to Mr Clavering. Instead, she would have to go back to her initial position. You mistake the nature of our relationship. I have no reason to marry when I have a standing in society and a comfortable independence. And just because I talk to a gentleman does not mean I wish to be married to him. Barbara Gower looked sceptical, and Miss Grey leaned into Teresa Wolfe with an exaggerated whisper. I might not want to marry Mr Clavering, but I certainly would not mind being kissed by him. He is rather dashing. Alice did not allow her face to change, but she hoped poor Mr Clavering would not be led to kiss Annabel Grey. It would take only one meddlesome person to force a match between the two of them, and then he would have to follow her around with her fan and smelling salts for the rest of his life. He was too worthy for that. She thought about his apology, that made two times he had apologised for something another man would have just brushed off, and he had looked sincere when he had done so. Her heart melted a little when she remembered his expression, stricken and vulnerable, as he had waited for her to respond. If he ever fell for someone like Annabel Grey or Teresa Wolfe, he would positively sink in Alice's esteem. He could not think them suitable for the role of his wife. Then again, he'd had a mistress— which made him like every other man in London. She supposed his taste in women must not rank high. 
As Alice and her mother rode to the next of two morning calls that would make that day, the Duchess turned to her daughter. They were in a covered coach, protected from a light spring rain that had begun to fall, as the weather turned warm at last. Alice enjoyed a feeling of peace as she contemplated her brief conversation with Miss Chauncey. Her circle of friends was expanding to include more people of depth. "'Alice,' her mother said, interrupting the pleasing line of her thoughts, "'your father and I have been discussing something, and I believe this is the perfect opportunity to tell you of it.' Alice groaned inside. Whatever her mother was about to say, it could not be good. Any decision that required her mother to speak to Alice's father was not likely to be one Alice would like or agree with. Yes, mother, what is it? We have decided, the Duchess went on, that although Mr Clavering, with whom you have been seen in company numerous times to my knowledge, is of a family far beneath our own, and is only a second son, we have decided to accept him as a potential match for you, if you are so stubborn as to wish to marry only for love. Mother, I never said I wished to marry for love. Her mother went on, as though she had not heard. We would rather see you suitably tied, although to an inferior connection, than remain unwed. Therefore, she finished with all the complacence of one bestowing a great gift. We have decided to give you our blessing. Alice remained speechless for a moment. Beyond her initial irritation over being managed, she was chagrined to find how pleased she was that her parents had not dismissed Mr Clavering outright, as they were sure to have done in her first or second season. Perhaps they so despaired at the idea of her remaining a spinster, they were willing to settle for someone they considered to be an inferior connection. Likely. She wondered if her brother's imbroglio had caused them to become less circumspect in their acceptance. Did they fear he would create a scandal that would lessen her prospects for suitors? She quickly dismissed the idea. Alice knew she was considered a great catch. This rapid succession of thought quickly made way for the more painful knowledge of how little her mother knew her, and that was what she chose to voice. Mother, I wish you would understand me when I say I do not want to marry. It is not because I am hankering after a second son that I have withheld all willingness to tie myself with an earlier suitor. It is simply that I do not wish to take a husband. That is it. Such a thing cannot be so difficult to comprehend. The Duchess lowered her brows at her. That last remark borders on impertinence, my child. Alice sighed. Forgive me, mother. And as for your declaration, you say you don't wish to marry now. To some degree you have youth on your side, which might lend some naivete to your remark, and for that reason I shall decide to ignore it. But I find this stubbornness in you very unbecoming. I will not upset myself now, especially since we are about to arrive, but I wish you will reflect upon our concession and give the matter some serious thought. Alice turned to her mother, now exasperated. I assure you, Mr. Clavering has no interest in pursuing me, and I have none in him. He has never made anything close to a declaration, so I believe your blessing is premature. A premature, perhaps, but hopefully not wasted. Her mother looked through the window as they rolled to a stop. The footman opened the door of the carriage in front of Mrs. Hastings' residence, and the Duchess stepped out, leaving Alice to silently draw her breath and garner her composure. Would there ever be anyone who understood her? Ten. At a corner table at White's, George sat with Duck and Amos, plagued by a sense of frustration. He could only assume it was because two of his wages were not going well. Normally, such a thing did not bother him in the least. He was not a compulsive gambler, and made sure never to gamble what he could not afford to lose— and neither of these two bets would strain his purse strings overly much. In fact, one would not dip into them at all. He still had no idea what Lady Alice would ask of him were she to win the bet regarding Duck. As for himself, he hadn't even thought of what he would ask of her, which was not a good sign. Perhaps that was why he seemed to be losing the bet. He had not had enough faith to even think of what her forfeit would be. But it was not the forfeit, or the money, or, really, the idea of losing a wager that troubled him. It was the fact that the two wagers he appeared to be losing both concerned Lady Alice. 
He was still not fully convinced that betting with a woman and over a woman was an honourable thing to do. In his heart of hearts, he suspected it was not. He certainly would not want Lucius to find out what he had done. His brother was a stickler for etiquette. George took a sip of his drink and gave a half-hearted laugh at some jest of Amos's to show he was listening. Considering his friends both gave him a strange look, he was not sure how convincing he had been. The bets were made, however, and George supposed that if he'd had the stupidity to wager about these two things, he had better win the bets. At least then he would have been betting on something that was a sure thing, where it all came out right in the end. He was mulling over whether that particular reasoning was any good, when Amos called his attention. A clavering, you're brooding again. You were doing so tonight at Almack's as well, and honestly, you're no joy to be around like this. He glanced at Duck. I suspect I know what the cause is behind it. Duck leaned back in his chair. Do you? I can't for the life of me figure it out. He tapped George on the shoulder. You declared that Lady Alice would marry this season, and she chose last night to start dancing with just about every gentleman who asked her. If that is not a clear sign of a woman looking for a match, I don't know what is. You should be thrilled. Ah, the very words I was coming over to say. George did not need to turn to know who that voice belonged to. Lord Harridan circled the table to face George, where he met his gaze with a haughty look. If I had my guess, I would say that your Friday face comes from the fact that you had hoped to be the one to woo her, and she's turned her attention away from you and to just about every other gentleman at Ormax. George really disliked Lord Harridan, and the measure of that dislike only increased with time. Don't you have a wife to go home to? He stopped just short of adding, If she's there, it would be too cruel, and he would not do it. Still, Lord Harridan's face flushed. It was known theirs was not a happy marriage. He quickly schooled his features. I believe I've hit upon something, otherwise you would not be so quick to change the subject. As I was saying, you had hoped, when betting on Lady Alice, that you would be the one she'd turn to. You may end up winning the bet, but you won't win the lady. George ignored him, wishing Harridan would go away, but he continued... Then again, if she shows no partiality this season, and lives up to her reputation, I will have won the wager. It is such a fine thing to win another person's shillings. George glared at him, his lids heavy with derision. Are your pockets so empty you depend on shillings to fill them? He was being rude, and he knew it. But really, a man's patience was only so deep. Harridan was not at all put off by this remark. It is not the shillings I crave in this case. It is the victory. His grin was more of a smirk that left George with a strong desire to remove it from his face. Thankfully, before he acted on the impulse, Harridan left them to sit with friends at the opposite side of the club. And he's gone, Amos observed. He placed both hands on the table. A gentleman, I shall return. He left without any further explanation, which meant he had some personal business to attend to. All the better. George had wanted to speak with Duck privately, and given that they had little time, he decided to get right to the heart of the matter. I saw you spent quite a bit of time talking to Miss Chauncey tonight. Duck allowed a smile to touch his lips. Miss Chauncey really is a most remarkable young lady. Every word that leaves her lips surprises me, and that makes her a most diverting young lady to spend time with. You just never know what she will say next. He mulled over that for a minute before going on. And she shows spirit, despite the fact that she's young and has an overbearing mother, and no portion to speak of. She does not follow her mother around like some foolish miss, but speaks her mind. If only more women were like her. George needed to broach the topic on his mind, and thought about how he might say it delicately. As he fiddled with the stem of his glass, he knew he was going to botch it. She does not appear to have that fine face and figure you normally appreciate. Duck glanced at George and frowned. What are you talking about? She has a charming face and figure. George was treading on dangerous ground, but he still stared at his friend in surprise. Duck scolding him for talking about a woman in the same manner they always did. His friend saw his confusion and softened his tone. I esteem Miss Chauncey, though I do not know her well. 
It doesn't seem fair to treat her with the same standards by which we rate other women. I can't quite explain, even to myself, why I wish to defend her in such a way. We haven't even held that many conversations. The longest we spoke was that first time we met at a card party. But I'm finding more and more that I want to talk to her every chance I get, and she makes me want to be a better version of myself. Although Duck was George's most recent friend, he easily considered him his best. They usually thought alike on all matters, and they never tired of each other's company. But Duck's words put a distance between them. It was as though George's world was slipping away from him. "'You once esteemed Mary Morgan,' George said. "'You thought you loved her.' He was grasping at straws. Duck's brow lowered. "'You cannot think I can compare my feelings toward Miss Chauncey with an opera singer I was infatuated with when I was nineteen. "'His feelings for Miss Chauncey? It sounded like much more than simple esteem. "'But he could see that Duck was unusually serious, and it would not do to provoke him. "'No, no, of course not. There can be no comparison.' "'There was nothing else to say, but the whole thing was beyond his understanding.' He just couldn't see what Duck saw in Miss Chauncey that would make him start to act so differently. After an awkward silence, Duck glanced around the room, then back at George. We are going to see the fight on Thursday night together, are we not? George returned the gaze, still wary. This olive branch in the way of a return to their usual conversation was something George was grateful for. He did not want to see Duck get married, but he had no desire to wound or irritate him. Their friendship meant too much for that. Certainly. Allow me to invite you for dinner at my lodgings first, he said. From there, the conversation shifted to more comfortable subjects, which grew lighter with Amos's return. He was followed by Whitmore joining them. George was shaken after this conversation, but he could not see what he was going to do about it. The whole thing between Duck and Miss Chauncey had sprung up out of nowhere, as a result of his wager with Lady Alice, it seemed, and not in spite of it. Would Duck have even looked her way a second time, had George not asked about her? He was sabotaging his own wager, and, with it, his bachelor lifestyle. George was at Jackson's saloon with Matthew Evans, and he was warming up the way the pugilist had taught him. He and his friends had been coming for many years, and although George was not the best student, he was not far from that honour. At times, Gentleman Jackson had him give pointers to some of the younger men. A movement at the entrance caught George's eye, and he turned as the Marquis of Anley walked in. He was alone for once, and George wondered if it was fate giving him the opportunity to speak to him. Although men left their peerage and status at the door, George did not want to be overly familiar by engaging Lord Anley in conversation. He knew how monumental was the task he was considering— realised the impossibility of not only making the Marquis's acquaintance without being introduced, but also of bringing up a topic that was absolutely none of his business. But he remembered Lady Alice's face, and he remembered how thankful Duck had been to have had his eyes opened all those years ago. George decided he would take any opening given and see what could be done. The gentlemen were being matched while George was still warming up, and Evans had paired up with someone else. Gentleman Jackson brought the Marquis over to George, saying, uh, "'Please allow me to introduce the two of you. Uh, Lord Anley, this is Mr Clavering, who is one of my better students. I think you would do well to pair up with him and see if you can learn a thing or two. "'I couldn't have said it better myself.' George just wondered if the Marquis would be willing to learn something more than the science of boxing. Lord Anley stuck out his hand, and George shook it. Anley had a similar colouring to his sister— but in some ways his look was more classically drawn. His expression could be defined as romantic, with a mouth that tended toward a pout, whereas Lady Alice possessed lips that showed firm resolution. "'Pleasure,' George said, and gestured to the table that held the gloves. He waited while Anley wrapped the bands around his wrists and hands before pulling on his gloves. Anley glanced at George. "'So, you're the clavering that my sister spoke of.' George caught himself before showing surprise that she had mentioned him to her brother. The very one, he said. He wondered what she had told him, and what Anley had made of their unusual introduction. Anley threw a few practice punches, and gave a quiet chuckle before standing upright. 
This is just what I need to work off some of my frustration. George threw a few practice punches himself. Oh, a rough week then. Anley turned to face him and got into position as George put his hands up. He threw a punch that was not technically impressive, but had energy. You could say that, Anley said. I'm sure you remember what it's like. Parents thinking you're a babe that needs guidance. Busy-minded people believing you're just a greenan that's about to run off and do something foolish. He narrowed his eyes and threw a strong hit to George's chest, which he intercepted with ease. Which shows how little they know me. Of course, George said, throwing a punch, which Anley just managed to block. It eventually gets better, but it can take a few years for well-meaning people to leave you alone. They went a few rounds, with George getting lost in the pleasure of a fight with someone who was good and lacked only experience. He remembered being in the same position and began to give a few tips. You're too slow when you pivot. Angle your fists this way when you dart them out. Oh, that's it. George remarked the progress of his new protégé with satisfaction. After some time, Gentleman Jackson came over to offer his observations, and by the time the sparring was over, George had been given an opportunity to know Lord Anley that went beyond the commonplaces. When they were done, the two of them shook hands. "'You've done very well,' George said. "'You've got plenty of bottom.' The Marquis grinned at the compliment, looking young. "'Thank you for your help, Clavering. I can only hope I will continue to improve.' I have no doubt that in a few years you will be able to get a hit in under my guard, less if you are a quicker study than me. George grinned back at him. The praise seemed to please Lord Anley, and he nodded. Well, I thank you. I suppose we shall see each other at White's. To be sure, George said. He waited for Evans, who was just finishing up. He wasn't about to bring up the subject of the opera singer to Anley without a proper lead-in. He had already put his foot in his mouth with both Lady Alice and Duck in speaking too quickly. But he was satisfied with having met the boy. That was already a promising start. 11. Alice found herself looking for Mr Clavering at each gathering she went to. She tried to spot him in Hyde Park. She looked for him at the theatre, then at three different parties, although she had only expected to see him at one. She looked for him at Gunter's, and even at Hookham's, although she had some doubts over whether he was the reading type. Everywhere Alice went that week, she paid close attention to the faces around her, with the expectation, and the hope, that she would see Mr George Clavering. And yes, she had seen the irony in the fact that she was searching high and low for him, only to inform him that she could not be seen with him any more. In the end, Alice did not encounter him until a week later, back at Almack's, her heart gave a jolt as soon as she saw him, and she started forward before she caught herself. What in heaven's name? She had been so accustomed to looking for him, she had forgotten that she was completely unavailable, and that if he wished to speak with her, he needed to come and talk with her. Fortunately for her sanity and her dignity, Clayda approached her from the stream of people passing by, and stopped at her side. "'You are in luck, my dear. I am here. I almost did not come today because I was not feeling at all well.' but in the end I was able to overcome those disagreeable sensations and rush to your side. Alice linked arms with her friend, grateful for the distraction. I am glad you're feeling much more the thing, and am very glad to see you here. Does your husband regret your rush back to England, now that it appears you were in much better form than initially thought? He did not say, but I am under the distinct impression that he would do anything to keep me protected, and that he does not regret a thing. "'Although I protested when he first proposed the idea of returning, "'I'm now glad that we have come back.' "'Clader looked around the room. "'Have you been inundated with requests to dance?' "'Clader had followed Alice's impetuous decision "'to hook up her train at Almack's, "'and her subsequent evening going from one partner to another. "'No, I believe it is because I've only just arrived. "'I suspect that the invitations will not be long in coming.' "'Clader turned to study her. Oh, you do intend to dance, then? She looked around, as if searching for someone, and her gaze landed on Mr Clavering. Is there anybody in particular you are interested in dancing with? I can tell you one man I do not wish to dance with, and that is Mr George Clavering. Alice tossed her head impatiently. Can you believe Teresa Wolfe had the audacity to say he's haunting my footsteps? 
It has got so bad, my own mother has stooped from her lofty position and has actually sanctioned the match. Clada put a gloved hand to her lips, her eyes brimming with amusement. Alice could hear the barely controlled quiver in her voice when her friend replied, I'm very happy for the common sense that your mother shows in giving her approval, if you'll excuse me for saying something so impertinent regarding the Duchess, but I suspect her sanction does not please you. Alice shook her head firmly. It does not. What would please me is if my mother would allow me to take my settlement and live on my own. I know such a thing might not be thought of for another two years at least, but to know I had that possibility is what matters to me. Clada nodded soberly, and Alice saw the variety of emotions that flitted across her face. She knew her friend wanted to respect Alice's wishes, while also urging her to try for a love match, like the one she had. If only Clada could be brought to realise how unlikely such a thing was for Alice. She simply did not trust men, not with her position, fortune and experience. Oh, there is Mr Clavering, Clada said, after a moment's pause. It was spoken as an innocent observation, but Alice knew her far too well to think there was anything casual in it. I have seen him. In fact... Alice stopped short, before revealing that she had almost been on her way to talk to him. For some reason she could not put her finger on, Alice was reluctant to let even her closest friend know that she had been tempted to march over there and engage him in conversation. Mr Clavering was taking on entirely too much significance in her thoughts. "'In fact,' Clada prompted, "'in fact this is the perfect time to let Mr Clavering know that we will need to be more circumspect and not seek each other out each time we are at some assembly together.' Alice glanced at him, and at her look, Mr Clavering began to move her way, in that jaunty manner of his, full of confidence, as though he had not a care in the world. How she would love to be able to carry herself in such a way. How she would love to have no worries. Lady Alice, Mr Clavering said, sweeping a bow. He looked at Clader and paused as if searching his memory. You remember my friend, Mrs Bell? Alice said, coming to his aid. All of her senses were heightened at his presence, although that particular knowledge did not please her. It was a timely decision to inform him that they must now act as indifferent acquaintances, rather than people who shared a closer connection. It shouldn't be hard, really. After all, they did not share a closer connection. They barely knew each other. Of course, Mr Clavering said with a gallant bow, Mrs Bell, it is a pleasure. Clada curtsied, not bothering to hide the satisfied smirk that had touched her lips. She was enjoying Alice's predicament. The pleasure is mine, Mr Clavering. She glanced at Alice. I will be sure to come find you later, but I must speak to Mrs Gower, whom I have just seen enter the room. Clada walked off, and since her friend had no more affection for Barbara Gower than Alice did, she knew it was merely an excuse to leave her alone with Mr Clavering. In some ways... Alice was relieved for the solicitude, for she would rather that what she had to say to him not be done under Clader's all too perceptive gaze. At the same time, she was chagrined to discover how happy she was to talk to Mr Clavering for his own sake. It was not a good beginning. She turned back to face him. Mr Clavering, I have not seen hide nor hair of you since last week. She had striven for a light tone, but it had come out accusatory. Mr Clavering's brow rose, and if his smile was any indication, her words had pleased him. Oh, have you been searching for me? Irritation warred with embarrassment. Alice had failed at being as elusive as she liked to be in her dealings with men. Normally it was easy to hold them at arm's length, and she did not want him to get the impression that he had a privileged place in her thoughts. She attempted a recovery by deciding to go straight to the matter at hand. Yes, as a matter of fact, I wished to speak with you on a particular matter, and that was why I was looking for you. Mr Clavering's gaze was intent on hers, and at the seriousness of her tone, his pleased expression vanished. It was replaced by curiosity and concern. I do hope there is nothing amiss. Does it have something to do with our wager? A look of hope grew on his face. Has Duck given Miss Chauncey a cut direct? causing her to take refuge in her tears for having mistaken his attention. He leaned in, and the sensation of his nearness was so appealing, Alice did not pull away. She wondered where her resolve had fled. He murmured, 
I am glad she has you to console her. I will need some time to think of what my terms will be for our wager. She had misread him. The look on his face had not been hope. It was teasing. Something in her breast responded to it. It was a desire to tease back, and to spend more time in the company of a man who amused her, and also possessed more depth than the ordinary London gentleman. Except for his mistress. She must not forget that. You are premature, Alice allowed a dry tone to seep into her voice. I have observed no developments on our wager, other than the fact that I have some cause to be encouraged. While I did not see you this week, I have twice seen Mr Duckworth and Miss Chauncey deep in conversation. She leaned in to deliver the thrust. And one of those times was while he was escorting her for a promenade in Hyde Park. Mr Clavering drew back at the news she'd imparted and stared at her in surprise. From her position, she was able to get a glance at his face, and she could not read any pleasure in his expression. Alice sensed that winning this wager was not so much about winning for its own sake. He truly did not seem to desire a match between Miss Chauncey and his friend, and she could not say why. Surely he would want his friend to be happy. Every time she had seen Mr Duckworth in Miss Chauncey's presence, he had shown himself to be that. Interesting was all Mr Clavering said at first, his voice flat. She watched him, and after a moment he made a recovery and moved in closer again. Alice held her breath in anticipation. However, you know that when one bets on a horse, one often thinks that it is a sure thing until some unknown by the name of Topsy Turvy jumps to the lead at the last possible second, upsetting the entire bet. A wager is never won until the favoured one crosses the finish line. Alice allowed an incredulous smile to touch her lips. "'Are you comparing your friend and mine to racehorses?' Mr Clavering shrugged, the corners of his lips curling upward. He showed no signs of impatience to leave her side, a sentiment she reciprocated. The idea that she would have to abandon their burgeoning friendship left her feeling empty. "'There have been worse analogies,' he replied. Streams of people flowed around them, but neither moved their gaze from the other. It was an island of comfort in the sea of fatuity. It had to end. Taking a deep breath, Alice came to the point. To return to the reason that I was seeking you out, she began, then stopped. Yes? Mr Clavering stilled, waiting for what she had to say. There have been comments made about our tete-a-tetes, linking us together in a way that I'm sure neither of us wants. I think it will be in our best interest to put an end to them. Mr Clavering did not move, and his expression remained unchanged. Only the narrowing of his eyes gave indication that he had understood her. What are these people saying? He had still not moved away from her, and the edge of his arm brushed against hers. One of my acquaintances, I shall not call her a friend, has remarked upon how many times we have been seen in each other's company, and appears to think there is some deeper connection growing between us. Alice gave herself only a slight second's pause, in which to consider whether she would speak of her mother. She would. Surely it would convince him how serious the matter had become. And what is more, my mother has actually supported the idea of our making a match of it. When we were on our morning calls last week, she announced that she and my father agreed to countenance it. His gaze grew more intent. Did she? Alice almost could not breathe through the intensity of that question and the look that came with it. She had expected him to go into gales of laughter, and instead his reaction caused some strange fluttering in her belly that had never been there before. She was unable to achieve the teasing tone she had hoped for, but she managed to reply, She did. Of course it is most ridiculous, and I beg you all disregard it. As you can imagine, I have done nothing to encourage her to think you were attempting a courtship, or to persuade her that such a thing was my desire. By now her face must be glowing with the embarrassment that coursed through her. What a ridiculous conversation, and it was not going at all the way she had hoped. Where was the teasing, bantering Mr Clavering she had come to know? She drew a deep breath. And so I'm sure you must understand that we cannot be seen too often in each other's company, or be seen sharing conversations that go beyond the merest pleasantries. 
Like this one, he clarified, his voice deep. She nodded, though all she felt was regret. Like this one. They stood for a moment, both seeming reluctant to move. At last she found her voice. So, if you will excuse me... I met your brother at the boxing saloon. Alice had started to turn and make her escape, but at this she turned back. Oh, did you? Her mind reeled with the implications. Did you speak to him about anything in particular? Mr. Clavering had lost some of his shine, or perhaps the evening was wearing on them both. It truly was hot inside the ballroom, and there was not a breath of fresh air nearby to relieve her. We spoke only of boxing, Mr. Clavering replied. But your brother is an excellent fellow. I suppose we might have been friends had we gone to school together. Alice found the notion agreeable that her brother could become friends with Mr. Clavering. She supposed there were few people she would rather he followed as an example in the ton, considering how respectful and kind Mr. Clavering was. Then she remembered once again that he had kept mistresses in the past, and probably had one even now. The recollection brought her back to reality. There was a good reason she was curbing her interactions with Mr. Clavering, and should continue to do so. He was too much like the rest of London gentlemen. If only she could remember her determination when she stood near him and her body wanted to lean into his. She wondered what had possessed her to begin dancing again and carrying on what looked like a flirtation to the rest of London. Where had her will gone? She came back to their conversation, knowing he was waiting for a response. How nice! Alice did not know what else to say, and after another awkward pause, Mr. Clavering gave her a tight smile. Well, Lady Alice, I shall not importune you any longer and cause more tongues to wag. We must continue to follow the course of our wager, as one of us will have a debt of honour to pay. His eyes gleamed with teasing, but they had lost their sparkle. In sympathy, her own evening fell flat. Yes, we must. Good evening, Mr. Clavering. Lady Alice curtsied. Mr. Clavering bowed and turned to leave. For the rest of the evening, Lady Alice managed to sense where he was, despite not having any sort of view over the crowds. She accepted more invitations to dance, which lost their amusement when she was not giving an indirect challenge to Mr. Clavering. Fortunately, there were still some men who did not dare approach her, and she was given some periods of rest in which to talk to Cleda. Throughout the evening, she caught glimpses of Mr. Clavering talking and dancing, and carrying on as though he had never heard of an Alice Sinclair. She tried not to look, though. She did not want anyone to say of her that her heart had been given at last. It was not true. Of course, such a thing could not be true. Twelve. George carried on his usual conversations and flirts throughout the rest of the night at Almax. The only difference was that he danced more often than was his usual habit. It was unconsciously done. Something in him did not wish to stand around on the sidelines, watching Lady Alice, who was now dancing and mingling with the others, as opposed to hiding in alcoves, and, to any impartial observer, was perfectly indifferent to his presence, as though they had never met. Duck had stood up with Miss Chauncey for a dance. He did not stay talking to her, and instead invited other women to dance as well. But George had caught him looking her way more than once. He was now in conversation with Filbert and Taylor, who had shown at Almack's for once. Amos was currently dancing with a shy young lady in her second season. It was as though they had all taken an unconscious plunge into the marriage mart, a step that felt a little to George like he was being drawn and quartered. Everyone knew that once you were married, you could no longer stay out all hours as you once did. You had to answer to your wife. Why, just look at his sister Maria's husband. He barely had a say in anything. George wished to talk to Duck about this promenade in Hyde Park that Lady Alice had spoken of, but now was not the time. He was surprised that Duck had not said anything to him, even in passing. Generally he went to Hyde Park with friends, and he rode rather than walked with ladies, and to the best of George's knowledge, it was the first time Duck had ever singled any woman out by taking her to Hyde Park. It was such a visible step as was sure to give rise to talk. It might not be much remarked upon were it another gentleman, but Duck, 
It was so unlike his friend. He could only think that Duck must truly be growing serious in his attachment. It was a blow to George's bachelorhood. Who else would he haunt the clubs with at night? Or the gaming hells? Or the racetrack? Or the fights? Amos was fun, but he lacked the easy laughter and the ready comprehension that Duck had. Matthew Evans had never been a prime candidate for the role of friend with whom to get up larks. Evans had always possessed too serious a nature, even before he had settled down and married Susan Blythefield. Robert Whitmore could not take Duck's place either. He was not as readily available, could not stay out all hours, given his commitment to his political career. No, Duck was the only one who fulfilled this role of best friend, and the thought of losing him to marriage was too depressing to think about. It was not until the next morning that George decided to pay him a visit at his lodgings to discuss his friend's intentions. It was a sure place to get his ear. Duck was seated at the breakfast table and had just begun partaking of a hearty breakfast when George was shown in. Sit, Duck said, revealing only the barest hint of surprise at seeing George at his doorstep at such an early hour. Serve yourself some ham. He gestured to his servant. Bring Clavering here a tankard of ale. The servant did so, and when he left, Duck paused from his meal long enough to meet George's gaze. You look full to bursting with news. It must be something to bring you here this early. George took a long pull of his tankard and set it down on the table. Not news, he stated. Questions. Duck paused in the middle of chewing and glanced at him with an inquisitive look in his eyes. Go on, he prodded. George leaned forward for emphasis, his arms on the table. What is this I hear? Now you are taking walks with Miss Chauncey in Hyde Park. Duck sat back, as if to reclaim the distance that George had seized by leaning forward. His posture had grown wary, but he kept his tone light. Heard about that, did you? Duck, you never take a woman walking. You never show partiality to anyone. And you haven't ever since m- Don't say her name, Duck said more sharply than was his wont. He was never this prickly, and why he should be about an opera singer he'd had a calf love for at age nineteen, George could not figure out. He sat in silence, considering how to respond, but he had no clear idea how to go about it. In the end, Duck resumed in something closer to his usual tone. Besides, what of it if I go walking with Miss Chauncey? It really is none of your concern. George knew how ridiculous it was to insist, but he could not help himself. If you are growing serious in your attachment, it will only lead to one thing. Marriage. And that means that our days of going out together will be at an end. Well, surely you can understand the reason for my distress, even if you don't share it. We always said we wouldn't get hitched too early. It ruins the prime years of one's life. Duck looked down and took a bite of his eggs before setting down his fork. He leaned back and folded his arms. Like Amos said the other night, it gets old. If I caught Miss Chauncey, and even if we were to marry, although such a thing is by no means sure, as I do not know if she will have me, it does not mean that I would never go out with you and the others. It only means I would do so less often. So you are not sure about marrying, George said, clinging to that hope. Duck shot him a wry look. Don't get your hopes too high. I am very attached to Miss Chauncey. It is her mother who poses the greatest threat. She is determined for her daughter to marry a man with a title, and not even Mr Chauncey has much say in the matter. The fortune comes from Miss Chauncey's mother. If it were up to me, I would marry her, although I have not quite said those exact words to her. George suffered a shock. You are that serious, then. Why did you not tell me you had discussed marriage? Duck shrugged, but his look was closed. Why should I, if I am to get interrogated? I know you're not keen on the idea, so you're not the first person I wish to open up to about this. George fiddled with the salt cellar. A year ago, we were all firm in our resolve not to attach ourselves to any woman. Only Evans had already lost his heart, but he never liked going out with us all that much anyway. George could hear the despondency in his own voice. I wonder if I'm going to be the last man standing, the only one of our group who has no interest in settling down. Duck glanced at him, 
and in a tone that was deceptively casual, said, "'Are you certain you have no interest in settling down? I see you enjoying yourself hugely whenever you are in Lady Alice's presence. And don't tell me she's just like everyone else, for I know you. I've never seen you so persistent in seeking out the company of a woman before.' "'This was not supposed to be about me,' George mumbled, causing Duck to laugh. Although nothing had been said to ease the tension, the spirit that had settled between them was less antagonistic. George raised his eyes. "'In any case, Lady Alice has made it clear that we must not spend time together any longer, for it has given rise to a speculation that neither of us wants.' Duck glanced at him quickly, then picked up his fork again and began to eat. Disappointed? he asked, barely sparing a glance for George. Yes, George replied begrudgingly. He hadn't even planned to admit to such a thing, but he found it to be true. I may not want to marry her, but I enjoy her company. She is amusing to talk to. I wish she were a man so that we might spend time together in the clubs. Do you? Duck's voice was laced with heavy irony. That pulled a reluctant chuckle out of George. No, I suppose not. She's much too fine to look upon. He raised his finger. But let it be known that I am not seeking any further intimacies with her, and definitely not marriage. I would never dream of suggesting such a thing, Duck said. Their conversation then turned to other things, and the easy camaraderie between them was re-established. George's visit had not achieved its principal aim, which was to help Duck see reason. Did he not realise they were all too young to be thinking of marriage? What brought satisfaction to one's life was the routine of camaraderie. You knew you could count on friends in a way you couldn't always count on family. Once their friends started marrying, they would drop off like flies, and George would have no one left to fill his days with. And Duck was the one he counted on most. If he started paying particular attention to a woman especially one whose mother was as determined as Mrs Chauncey, no matter if Duck thought she wanted a title for her daughter. Marriage would be his destiny, and in short order. However, with their usual tone settled back between them, George supposed the visit had been beneficial. He had cleared the air with Duck, and in doing so saw how serious his friend was. It caused George to view the situation with more complacence. If his friend was truly happy with Miss Chauncey, he could not, in good conscience, be the one to tear him away. The next day, the servant brought George's mail into the dining room and set it beside him along with his breakfast. George had spent the night before in a rather unsatisfactory manner. He had attended an event where Lady Alice was present, but had studiously ignored him, save for the one time their paths had crossed. Then she had merely graced him with a courteous nod. "'Mr. Clavering,' she had said, in that voice that was icy in its formality. It had caused his spirits to plunge. Lady Alice, he returned, as though they were nothing more to each other than the most chance-met acquaintances. Even Mrs Bell's greeting had held more warmth. Then George had gone with his friends to the club, where the conversation had circled around the same subjects as always, except that now Duck was distracted Furthermore, George had had the dubious pleasure of being singled out by Lord Harridan, who had approached him to say, "'I've been giving the matter of our wager some thought. If I had known that you were pursuing Lady Alice, I would not have been so quick to take you up on the bet. I almost think that the whole thing was done with something bordering on dishonesty.' George looked at him sourly. "'If you will recall, I did not invite you to take the bet. You came and interrupted our conversation and forced the bet on me.' He faced Lord Harridan fully. Perhaps this was his chance to end the bet he had long since regretted. If you have any doubts on the wager, let us agree to end it now. No harm done to either side. Lord Harridan pulled back, with an air of disdain mingled with scepticism. I don't know about you, but I never go back on a wager. Once my word is given, it is my bond. Mine is the word of a gentleman." George could barely contain his annoyance toward Harridan, or the fact that he was implying that George's word was worth less. "'Well, then, you may set your mind at ease. Besides, Lady Alice and I have nothing even close to an understanding. Why, we've only just made each other's acquaintance, and we don't even hold a conversation every time we cross paths.' 
If George was grateful for one thing to have come as a result of her resolve not to meet, it was that he could claim this as truth. Still, Lord Harridan insisted, I'm not entirely convinced this bet can be considered on the up and up. George was betrayed into losing his patience. You seem to be goading to no end, Harridan, unless you're trying to force a duel on me. Lord Harridan was known for falling on the side of cowardice where duels were concerned, and he certainly did not force one on anyone if he could avoid it. In his present mood, George would have been glad for a fight. Sure as anything, Lord Harridan looked startled at the notion. No, no, I was only saying that if one is about to bet on a thing, one should not try to alter the circumstances in any way. Now anxious to get rid of him, George had ended the conversation by saying, Then let's assume it was not my objective and leave it at that. In the dim morning light, the threatening clouds outside were so grey he'd had to order a candle. George took a bite of his toast and picked up a package that had come with the morning mail and which contained several documents. The direction was written in his brother's handwriting. He slit the seal. "'George, this is the last of the documents pertaining to your estate that will come to my residence. I have directed all future documents to come directly to you. I am sure you will see the wisdom in such a thing.' as this estate is not mine and I should not be handling its affairs. Eventually you will have to come to terms with its management, and what better time to start than the present. Come by the house and see Hugh. He asks for you. Selina has charged me to send her love. Yours, etc., Lucius. George had mixed feelings about the note. On one hand, his brother was perfectly in his right to forward all matters of the estate to him. On the other hand, George was being forced to enter into all the affairs— problems and complications of his inheritance that he had until now tried to avoid. If anything further was needed to seal the demise of his bachelor lifestyle, this was it. He opened the first of three sealed documents, which was from his steward, Mr Hartzell. George's fears about having to deal with complications had proven true. The letter stated that the tenants' roofs had been destroyed by the mounds of snow from a particularly brutal winter, and more money would have to be poured into their maintenance in order for the tenants to be properly cared for by next winter. If Mr Clavering could send the sum of £3,000 under the care of his banker, he, Hartzell, would see that it went to the right repairs. George perused the other two documents, one of which came from the long-employed butler whom George had met only once or twice on a rare visit to the estate. The other was from his man of business. Mr Cummings had noticed a drop in the revenue from the estate, and recommended that George have a look and see to what it could be attributed. He rather thought the crops should have yielded at least as much as the previous years, and there had been no demands made for significant repairs. George put the letters down on the table and picked up his cup of coffee. The rain had begun to fall outside, and it quickly turned into a downpour. It was evident from these documents that George would be obliged to visit his estate and see where matters stood. His brother had said he was not sure that the steward was doing all he could, and after reading this, George was inclined to believe it. He would not be able to put the visit off any longer. Besides, with Dark mooning over Miss Chauncey and Lady Alice refusing to see him, what was the point of hanging around in London anyway? 13. Once Alice had made it clear she could not be seen in Mr Clavering's presence any more, she would have been infuriating if her wish had been ignored, because he was a man and thought he knew better than her. What she did not expect was to have Mr Clavering disappear entirely from the social scene. A week went by, then another, and there was no sign of him. She could not ask his friends. Such a thing would be impossible. She didn't know his friends or family well enough. She would have asked his sister, but Philippa had only been spotted twice— once she had been in a conversation and had been unable to do more than wave. The other time she had grasped Alice's hand with a warm smile and explained that she was not feeling well and that her husband was escorting her home. At every gathering Alice found herself looking for Mr Clavering. Could he have been hurt and have withdrawn from her presence? She could not credit such a thing. He was a flirt and nothing more. Was he pouting? No, if she knew anything of him, he was too good-natured to do such a thing as pout. "'You appear downcast,' 
Clayda observed, when they had returned to Almax, and once again found no sign of Mr. Clavering. It had been more than two weeks since she had sent him away, and she had only seen him at one gathering since. Oh, no, I assure you, Alice replied, attempting to brighten her expression. She could not even confess the turn of her thoughts to her best friend. The sentiments were too confusing to confess to another person. She could hardly make sense of them herself. Clodagh studied her for a moment with that perceptive gaze of hers, but she did not reply. Instead, she looked across the room and said, "'Oh, Miss Chauncey has arrived. Have you spoken with her of late?' Alice looked up. "'That would be a happy diversion.' "'No, I've had no chance to speak to her. But there she is, standing at her mother's side. Miserable again. Let us go and rescue her.' "'Happily,' Clayda replied, turning to follow Alice." When they reached Miss Chauncey, her mother regarded Alice with an air of surprise. A delighted smile crept on her face, and she gave a low curtsy. "'Lady Alice, what a pleasure it is to see you. Isn't it, Gwendolyn?' Miss Chauncey gave her mother a veiled look, and responded with a nod. She turned to Alice. "'It is indeed a pleasure, Lady Alice.' Alice gestured to Clayda. "'I don't believe I've introduced you to my friend Mrs. Bell.' The two women curtsied and murmured greetings. There was a slight lull in conversation, as Mrs. Chauncey hung entirely too much on what word would be spoken next, in all likelihood with the goal of spreading choice morsels of gossip about her daughter's new best friend, the Duke's daughter. It took only a second for Alice to realise it was time to whisk Miss Chauncey away from her mother, or they would not be able to have two words free of eavesdropping. "'Shall we take some refreshments?' she asked Miss Chauncey, "'trusting her mother would not say no to the daughter of a duke. "'She did not. "'Mrs Chauncey smiled at her daughter and gave a benevolent nod. "'Miss Chauncey waited until they had all taken a cup of lemonade "'from the table in the corner of the room, "'before allowing her shoulders to relax. "'She breathed out. "'Thank you. "'I needed to be away from my mother, "'but there was no one to rescue me until you came along.' "'Did no handsome gentleman ask you to dance?' Alice asked her. Miss Chauncey smiled at the teasing note in Alice's voice. Oh, not a single one, with the exception of Mr. Lloyd. At that memory, her smile fell. Oh, you poor dear, Mrs. Bell murmured. Alice tightened her lips. Percival Lloyd was known to be eager for a wife, and to torment every unmarried woman in his path, except for the ones who might actually consider him. She desired to bring up Mr. Duckworth's name, but did not want to embarrass Miss Chauncey, at the same time, if he was not here either, perhaps he and Mr. Clavering had gone away together, and Miss Chauncey might know where they were. She looked around the room, searching for a casual tone. "'I wonder where our friends are, Mr. Clavering, Mr. Whitmore and Mr. Duckworth. I had been quite in the habit of seeing them at All Max this season, but have not caught a glimpse of them anywhere of late.' Clayda remained silent, transferring her gaze to Miss Chauncey, who had a faint blush on her cheeks. She gave a small shrug. "'I saw Mr. Duckworth two days ago. He paid us a morning call, but left shortly after Lord Hicks arrived.' Miss Chauncey's tone was void of feeling. Alice and Clayda exchanged a sympathetic glance at the notion of exchanging Mr. Duckworth's attention for that of Lord Hicks. Mr. Duckworth was in London, but he was not at Almax either, did that mean that Mr. Clavering was simply busy, and they were finding employment elsewhere? At least Mr. Duckworth was not here. Alice might have been tempted to feel disappointment at how easily Mr. Clavering had abandoned their friendship, if she had cared about such things. "'I believe Mr. Duckworth has just arrived,' Clayda announced, and Alice looked up in time to see him enter. He sent a searching gaze around the room as soon as he stepped into the ballroom." Miss Chauncey's face took on a heightened colour, and she stood straight before looking away. Alice had not missed her brief exchange of glances with Mr Duckworth. Her pleasure at his arrival was evident. "'I should not wish to intrude on a private matter,' Alice began. She knew she should not. Miss Chauncey had said she was not open to discussing matters of her heart. But Alice wanted to see if she could learn something of Mr Clavering's whereabouts— not to mention find out if she were close to winning their wager. Then he would have to come and speak with her. It seems Mr Duckworth has grown particular in his attentions. There, Alice would leave it at that. 
Miss Chauncey could say what she wished. She sighed. It does seem so, does it not? And yet my mother made it perfectly clear after Lord Hicks left that she would not entertain a suit with Mr. Duckworth. If Lord Hicks were to ask for my hand, not that Mr. Duckworth has made any sort of declaration. Clada narrowed her eyes. Oh, forgive me, it is not my affair, but Mr. Duckworth is reputed to have quite a comfortable living. Surely where there is affection... Miss Chauncey shook her head. Mr. Duckworth does not have a title, and that is of paramount importance to my mother. She already has wealth, but wishes to elevate the standing of our family through a connection to the peerage. Mr. Duckworth had made his way over, and he bowed before the ladies, his eyes resting on Miss Chauncey, to whom he addressed his words. "'I hope you will do me the honour of dancing with me this evening.' She curtsied, her smile broad. I would be delighted. Excellent. I believe there is a set about to begin. Gratified, Mr. Duckworth held out his arm, and Miss Chauncey placed her hand on it. Alice fought an almost irresistible urge to ask him where his friend was. She found she could not speak the words. She had been too used to remaining aloof from men, to show particular attention to one in such a way that was sure to spread rumours, not only to him but to everyone else, was simply impossible. She pressed her lips together before she could make such a gaffe. After a few minutes spent observing the people around them, her conversation with Clada turned to Bartholomew. There were only two people with which Alice could talk about her brother, and one of them had disappeared completely from London. Unfortunately, Clada had heard nothing new, although she had asked her husband to keep his ears open for talk, and Alice had not seen her brother in days. Despite the lack of helpful information, Alice was relieved at being able to unburden her heart to her friend. When the set was over, Mr Duckworth brought a smiling Miss Chauncey back to them. "'I hope you don't mind that I had him bring me here,' she murmured, when he had walked away. "'I did not have the courage to return to my mother's side.' "'I understand you perfectly,' Alice replied. Their conversation continued, now including Miss Chauncey, as Alice occasionally glanced around the room, searching, she knew, for a glimpse of Mr. Clavering. He could not be present. She had looked everywhere. To her dismay, the solidarity of three women standing together in a tight circle did not preclude Lord Hicks from coming up to them. He bowed before them, then inhaled deeply before speaking. Alice held her breath. Uh, "'Mrs. Bell, Lady Alice, and Miss Chauncey, I had no idea you three were acquainted.' Lord Hicks laid his hand on his breast. Alice took a cautious breath, then held it again, waiting. He looked her over carefully. "'I see you have not pinned up your train this evening, Lady Alice. Must I take that as a sign that you will not dance?' "'I am afraid not, Lord Hicks,' Alice replied, smiling politely, and turning her face to the side to look over the crowd and take a discreet breath of fresh air. "'Shame! Miss Chauncey!' he continued, turning to her. "'It appears that you are. Will you do me the honour of standing up with me for this dance?' She exchanged a doubtful look with Alice. Her voice was faint as she replied, "'If you wish it, Lord Hicks.' Alice's heart plunged. She could not toss her new friend to the wolves like that. On impulse she said, "'Actually, Lord Hicks, I might be able to make an exception.' She smiled at him politely, only noticing the eager light in his eyes when it was too late. "'Why, this is a delightful turn of events!' He held out his arm, and Alice put her hand on it, already regretting her generous impulse. As they stood on the sidelines, Lord Hicks turned to face her, and although she did not wish to be rude, she kept her face turned forward. "'Lady Alice,' he said, "'I hardly dared hope that I would have the pleasure of dancing with you, but as you are now accepting invitations, I find that I am most amply rewarded for attempting to secure your hand. She gave a tight smile, and was relieved when the music called everyone to their places. Fortunately, the dance was a reel, and she was able to endure it without too much time spent at his side, or prolonged conversation that would severely tax her good graces. When the dance was over, Alice followed Lord Hicks over to the sidelines, she gave her friends a long-suffering look after he had bowed and gone away. "'Thank you,' 
Miss Chauncey said with feeling. Alice smiled at her, thinking that perhaps it had been worth it to save her. At least Lord Hicks was not likely to accost her again. He could not have thought Alice received any pleasure from being in his company. At that moment, Miss Chauncey was invited to dance, and she sent them a grateful smile as she was led away. "'You poor thing! He's not easy to tolerate, is he?' Clayda said. "'He left you alone readily enough,' Alice replied, knowing why, of course. Clayda smiled at her with pity. "'Yes, we married women can get away with a great number of things, such as escaping the attention of intolerable men. But I shall not tease you on that head.' "'Good evening, Lady Alice.' She turned to find Philippa approaching her. Her heart leapt at the sight. Here was someone connected with Mr Clavering, at last. Philippa would be able to tell her where he had gone, if Alice had the courage to ask. "'Good evening, Clayda.' Philippa smiled at the two women, and Alice wondered how she had managed to gain the use of Clayda's Christian name in such a short time. She seemed to possess a gift for putting people at ease— Alice's own social restrictions were so binding at times. "'It's a pleasure to see you, Philippa,' Clayda responded warmly, glancing across the room. "'Ah, I see your husband is lending my husband his ear. I appreciate your introducing them. Oh, Jack is glad to make his acquaintance. They're speaking of a particular committee to appoint land tax commissioners that Jack is interested in. Perhaps you might have heard of it?' Clayda laughed. I regret that I do not share your enthusiasm for political issues. I am just unfashionably enthusiastic about my husband. Philippa returned a dimpled smile. Now, that is a committee we are both part of. Where is Mr. Clavering? Alice had not intended to blurt the words out. She had meant to be much more circumspect in her question, as if the whereabouts of Mr. Clavering had only just occurred to her. But the way she said it sounded as though she had only been waiting for a chance to talk. It was embarrassing, especially when Philippa stared at her so keenly. After only a split second's pause, in which Philippa showed surprise, she answered, "'My brother was called away to his estate. Apparently there are some issues there that needed attending to, in particular the tenant's roofs, which might not survive another winter. He thought it best to travel there without delay.' Alice was surprised. Oh, where is his estate? The fact that he was a landowner was not something she had expected, although her parents must certainly have known, or they would not have sanctioned his suit, if Mr Clavering had actually been courting her. It's in St Ives. In Cornwall, Alice exclaimed, even more mystified. I did not take him for someone who had connections in Cornwall. Alice was being overly familiar, she feared, but Philippa answered her readily. "'Our family is from Hertfordshire, but my father was bequeathed a small estate in Cornwall from his godmother, and he left it to my brother George.' Alice nodded, not asking any further questions. She had asked too many already, but the conversation had given her a different idea of Mr Clavering. She had known he was a decent man, but she thought him much too frivolous a man to see to the welfare of his tenants. She burned with curiosity to know when he would return— but knew enough to keep silent. The next morning Alice came downstairs, expecting to accompany her mother to Lady Jersey's house, as was their custom. Her mother was not in the hall, so Alice went into the drawing-room in search of her. The Duchess was seated, and she gestured to the sofa next to her. "'Have a seat, Alice.' Alice remained frozen, staring at her mother in puzzlement. "'Why are we not paying morning calls?' Her mother rested her hands on her lap. "'I thought we could stay in today and receive people rather than go out on morning calls. Sit.' She obeyed, her brow furrowed. "'Mother, anyone who is on intimate enough terms to pay us a morning call will expect that we are out, as we invariably pay morning calls the day after Almack's.' Her mother's expression was impossible to read. I have let it be known that we are entertaining today, so I expect that some will come and visit us. Alice knit her brows, absorbing this highly unusual turn of events. She wondered who her mother considered close enough to visit. She doubted Miss Chauncey would be on the list, and Alice had not had time to beg Clayda to come. A knock sounded on the front door, and her mother's expression grew tight, 
so that she was almost frowning with anticipation. A frisson of nerves coursed through Alice. This was unusual enough behaviour from her mother that a sense of foreboding struck her. Horace entered the room and announced, "'Lord Ix to see you, Your Grace.' Alice turned a stunned gaze to her mother, who stood. Alice stood as well. Surely he could not be here on her mother's invitation. Her mother had never spoken of the Earl before. Lord Hicks bowed before the Duchess, and then before Alice, with murmurs of, "'Your Grace,' and "'My Lady.' Her mother invited him to take a seat, which he did. He looked around the drawing-room. "'A very tastefully done, Your Grace.' Alice's mother accepted the compliment with a nod. "'It is a particular passion of mine, although I have not had this room done since my early days as Duchess. I shall have to redecorate it soon.' "'There is no need to make any change, Your Grace,' Lord Hicks assured her. "'It is perfect as it is.' Alice looked from one to the other, barely able to conceal her surprise. What was Lord Hicks doing here? Her mother stood. "'I shall see that the tea is brought.' I won't be but a moment. Although her mother always rang for tea, in this instant she left the room, to Alice's considerable dismay. Lord Hicks turned in his chair to face her, a smile pasted on his lips. She looked at him, attempting to master her growing alarm so it would not be apparent in her rigid features. An awkward silence fell as he studied her. At last he sat back and put his hands together. "'It appears to me that you are not aware of my objective in calling today.' "'I am afraid I am not, my lord.' Alice glanced at him, now fearing, almost knowing, what it would be. "'I have come to ask for your hand in marriage, Lady Alice. Your parents have approved my suit, of course. Otherwise I would never dream of approaching you. They are aware of my situation, and know that in addition to my viscountcy I have quite a healthy estate.' I do not need to marry, but I wish to. Alice searched her mind for a suitable reply. She had never been approached with an offer without having had some warning that had allowed her to consider how to turn the suitor down. She could think of nothing other than her usual response, which happened also to be true. My lord, I'm afraid my parents brought you here on false pretenses. You see, I have no plans to marry, ever. They know this. "'so I am astonished that they allowed you to come here and propose to me. "'Astonished, and truly sorry, "'for I would not have you suffer a needless rejection for the world.' "'Alice could not think of what to do with her hands, "'so she sat back and folded them, waiting for his reply, "'hoping he would take that as an excuse to leave. "'I suppose it is my teeth,' Lord Hicks sighed, looking resigned, "'and Alice's heart started hammering in her chest.' "'No. I am aware, Lady Alice, that I have not been blessed with what you might call a stunning smile. I—I I, I assure you—' She could not go on. No suitable reply came to her lips. "'I had considered replacing them with Waterloo teeth,' Lord Hicks went on. "'But I'm afraid that if I pulled out my own teeth, and I am sure you could imagine how one might fear the pain of such a drastic gesture, in order to replace them with false ones—' They might not stay in my mouth when I talk or eat. I have heard of some people who lay their false teeth by their plate as they eat, and of course the food is mashed up into something that can be consumed without teeth, but I fear that it might cause indigestion to eat food that is not thoroughly chewed, and I already have some digestive troubles that I shall not enumerate at present. He lifted a hand as if to reassure her on that head. No, I fear I have not been able to envision such an irrevocable solution— as such, I am far from ready to take such a measure. A maniacal urge to laugh seized Alice, and it took everything within her, every last ounce of training, to keep her face immobile. It was the most ridiculous conversation she had ever had. She had always said she longed to leave the realm of superficial conversation. But this? Her first impulse was to wish that Mr. Clavering was present, to hear it so they might laugh together. Lord Hicks's humble confession— had softened her at first, and made her consider how uncharitable she had been. That was, until he had gone on about laying his teeth beside his plate. What kind of man talked about those things in polite company, much less during a marriage proposal? That thought was all that was needed for Alice to replace her urge to laugh with indignation. 
She welcomed the emotion, because it was much easier to control than laughter. In the end, she was able to formulate her response in a polite, cool tone. Lord Hicks, I thank you for the honour of your proposal. It was a good one, was it not? I always believe in setting everything on the table, and I am so glad we are agreed upon that head. Now, what say you, Lady Alice? May I call you mine? Alice inhaled quietly. As I have mentioned, I have no intention of marrying. I am afraid my refusal is final. Lord Hicks sighed again. Oh, it is just as I expected. It's not an easy thing, this business of finding a wife. One would think the matter would be a simple one when you have a title. The door opened, and Alice had never in her life been more relieved to see her mother. The Duchess paused on the threshold. I have had the tea tray ordered. She hesitated, as though wondering if Lord Hicks had needed more time to perform his mission. When she returned to her seat, Lord Hicks lifted a hand. I would like some tea, thank you. Alice looked from Lord Hicks to her mother, then back again. She could not leave, could she? Her mother had trained her that she must stay put when there were visitors, and Lord Hicks had not fled, as a proper rejected suitor should. He was actually going to stay for tea. She could not believe it. Lord Hicks stayed a full hour. Alice did not assist in the conversation in any way, but let the bulk of it fall to her mother. If her mother thought she would be willing to entertain his suit, to the point of springing such a disagreeable proposal on her without warning, well, then her mother could suffer the consequences. In the end, the Duchess had to rid herself of her invited guest by hinting that they needed to run errands. Only then, and by her standing, did Lord Hicks finally get to his feet and bid them both farewell, before taking his leave with a mournful look. When he was gone, Alice turned to her mother. "'What have you done, allowing him to come here?' Her mother swivelled to face her. "'My child, I should be asking what you have done. You have turned him down, haven't you?' "'You need ask,' Alice cried out. "'How could you think I would accept his suit if I did not accept the other ones you'd approved of? And this time you did not give me any notice.' "'I thought a surprise proposal might be the only way to get you to accept,' her mother replied calmly. "'Nothing else has worked.' "'Well, this did not work either,' Alice grumbled. "'Of course I said no. Of course I will not marry him.' The Duchess allowed her gaze to settle on the mantelpiece. "'I must own I had no idea he was so encroaching. One would not expect such a thing from a peer.' Alice sighed. Mother, why can you not simply accept that I do not wish to marry and leave it at that? The Duchess turned her gaze directly on Alice. What happened to Mr. Clavering? He was so intent upon seeking your acquaintance, even coming to call on you and taking you walking. Mother, it was Mrs. Blythefield, his sister, who came. And he escorted you to your seat at the opera. I believe his sister's presence was only a pretext. But now we have not even his suit to hope for. It is because he was never a suitor, Alice said wearily. He knows I will not marry. I am beginning to believe you, the Duchess said, but her tone afforded Alice no satisfaction. It did not bode well. At last, Alice replied. But she could say nothing else, for her mother continued. And it is the most foolish, hair-brained notion I have ever heard of, if you are unwilling to marry, then I have but one choice before me. I am going to send you to your sister Anne's estate in Cumbria. There you can see what life will be like with no marital prospects, and decide for yourself if it's the life you truly wish to live. With these quelling words, Alice's mother swept from the room. Fourteen. The City of London was a mere ten miles away, and George could not have been more weary or grateful to be back. He had been gone an entire month, half of which had been spent travelling, and this on horseback, for it was faster than the carriage. He still could not believe he had consented to leave in the middle of the season, just to see to the affairs of his estate, when such an idea would have been foreign to him a mere month ago. But he could not have done otherwise. For the first time since reaching his majority, 
George had personally cared for the land he had always known belonged to him. And to his surprise, he had found that he liked doing it. The couple that ran the estate as butler and head housekeeper, Mr and Mrs Kettering, had welcomed him in proper style. Although they had not had more than a day's notice of his arrival, they had been ready to receive him with a clean and warm bed in the master's bedroom and a hot meal with several removes, despite his being the only one to sit at the table. The house needed refurbishing, but the bones were good and the rooms were well kept. He wasted no time in praising them for their faithful service. For Mr Herzl the steward, however, he had no such praise. It was clear that Herzl was attempting to siphon money from the estate into his own hands. George had given him no notice of his arrival, and the steward's obvious discomfort at his sudden appearance and demand to see the books would have made George wary had he not already had his suspicions. Within a day he gave the steward his leave and wrote to his banker to ask for recommendations. At first, George continued to bemoan having to leave London right in the middle of the season, but it was obvious he could not leave his estate until he had replaced Mr Herzl. So he stayed, and while he was there, he rode those few miles to the coast, where he stood looking out over the cliff. A crisp wind embraced him and filled his nostrils, and he could hear the surf pounding below. It settled something in his soul. On his return trip to the estate, he admired the silvery, almost bluish tone to the long grass on the sides of the path, so unlike London or Hertfordshire. Then he turned on to his property and left the wilds of Cornish scenery for the sedate, well-kept English garden that framed a charming house. His hands resting on the pommel, he paused to look up at the ten windows visible on the second storey, and could almost imagine having children to fill some of those rooms. As he waited to receive word from his banker, George followed one of the more outspoken tenants around, visiting the land and learning what needed to be done. The man had no hesitation in listing the repairs that George would need to take care of, and in the end George was able to leave some of them in the man's hands. He took notes as Mrs Kettering listed the needs of the household and followed Mr Kettering into the attic to inspect a leak in one area of the roof that was causing some damp. A few months ago, George would have been anxious to leave it all and hoped that someone else would take care of it. But he supposed he had changed. The topics grew in interest as he applied his mind to finding economical ways to resolve them. There was something satisfying about improving a property that belonged to him, something that was his own. And for the first time, he could understand Lucius's charge to leave something behind for his heirs. Throughout the course of the visit, George rode around his land and familiarised himself with the tenants, who began to greet him more warmly as some of the improvements had already begun. Every day he found himself wandering through the big empty house to examine the rooms, and for the first time imagined himself here, surrounded by a family. He would even have room for guests to come. George wondered if Lady Alice's family would ever visit such an out-of-the-way estate. No sooner had that thought barrelled through his mind than he pulled himself up short. He had been standing in the stillness of the bedroom that adjoined his master suite and was staring absently at the large looking-glass that hung above the fireplace. He walked over to it and pointed to himself in the mirror. That is not an option, he scolded himself severely. The idea, once it took hold, did not leave easily and he began to think that maybe it was just a question of finding a wife it did not have to be Lady Alice, who, as she had made perfectly clear, was not available. As soon as the new steward was put in place, another Cornishman from Truro, whom the banker had found through one of his contacts, George left with the promise to return over the summer to see how the repairs were going. One fortunate thing was that his land was good for farming, and his tenants brought in enough in the way of crops to sustain the estate. George found time to be thankful his father's godmother had not bequeathed him a mine, for running an estate was complicated enough as it was. He packed up his few belongings and bid farewell to the Ketterings, promising not to be so long in visiting them the next time. As he started on his journey homeward, he wondered whether Duck and Miss Chauncey had advanced in their courtship. For the first time since the notion had taken root, George did not begrudge Duck his happiness. The same night he returned, George walked into White's, hoping to surprise his friends. What he would have liked to have done was to attend some event where Lady Alice was certain to be found, 
if only to get a glimpse of her. He could not deny that he had thought of her more than once over the month, even after he had taken himself to task for considering her in the role as wife and mistress of his estate. Was she still set on putting distance between them, or would the fact that he had been gone a month be sufficient for them to pick up where they had left off? He found Whitmore and Amos sitting with Taylor and Filbert, and he took a seat at their table to the sounds of their greetings and claps on his shoulder. After they had drunk to his health and the conversation settled down, George looked around. "'Where's Dark?' Whitmore and Amos exchanged a look. "'He has suffered a disappointment.' George furrowed his brows. What disappointment? What could have happened in the month he had been gone? The only thing that came to mind was that his affection for Miss Chauncey had come to nothing. But surely that could not be the case, when Miss Chauncey was clearly as enamoured as he was. If Duck had gone so far as to make an offer, she would never turn him down. She would have to be mad to do so. The girl could never get a better man than Duck. Amos shook his head. "'Miss Chauncey is engaged to Lord Hicks.' "'Which means I've won my bet,' Filbert announced. "'When everyone looked at him with a mixture of surprise and indignation, "'he raised his hands. "'And don't it misunderstand me. "'I'm very sorry for Duck, of course, "'but I knew there would be some young lady who would be after Hicks's title "'and who would accept the man on those terms, "'or, in Miss Chauncey's case, someone whose mother would accept the terms.' "'Engaged,' George said. I would not have thought it of her. That is, I do not know the girl, but I had formed the impression that she was not after a title. Has it been announced? For some reason I cannot fathom, it has not been announced, Whitmore said. But I understand the bans have been read. I tried to tell Dart that some other worthy young lady would come around soon enough, and so not to fall into despair. He didn't listen. George nodded. Where is he now, his lodgings? He's at Evan's place, I believe. Go see him. He'll listen to you, Amos said. I'm sure you'll be able to talk some sense into him. George pulled out his pocket watch. It wanted a few minutes to midnight. Evans is a married man. I shan't go tonight. However, I believe I will leave you. I've been travelling for days, and if I want to wake up in time for breakfast, I will have to make an early night of it. Filbert exchanged an amused glance with Taylor. And the fellow has come back from his estate and has already so changed. A slave to his duties. Will we be betting on your marriage next? Better wait until there is a lady, George shot back. And he walked out the door to the sound of laughter. The next day, just after noon, George went to Matthew Evans' house, wondering if Duck had spent the night there. He would try here first, and if he had no luck, he would head to Duck's lodgings. It would be good to see how Matthew and his wife were doing anyway. When he was admitted into the drawing room, he faltered on the threshold. The comfortable room was full by their usual standards of entertaining. Matthew and Susan Evans were there, of course, and with them were Duck and George's sister Philippa. Sitting next to Philippa was Lady Alice. Her mouth dropped just slightly, then she glanced away. She looked just as surprised to see him. "'You're home, George!' Philippa said, her face showing delight. "'Please have a seat,' Susan said, indicating the only remaining chair in their small circle placed close to the fire. It was directly across from Lady Alice. George remembered his manners and bowed before Susan. Then he went to Lady Alice, who stood. "'I hope you are well, my lady.' When he lifted his head, he could not refrain from holding her hand a fraction longer than necessary. It was good to see her. Before sitting, George remembered the purpose of his visit and glanced at Duck. "'I was at White's last night, and Amos told me I might find you here.' "'It is so good to have you back, George. I sent a letter to you that must have crossed paths. It will be waiting for you if ever you return,' Philippa said, with a humorous tone in her voice. "'I will need to. There are many things to see to on the estate,' he replied. "'I want to be more of a support to Mr. and Mrs. Kettering,' who have held the estate together despite the fact that there's been no master there for years. Duck pulled out of his brown study to examine George. You've changed. A month away appears to have done you some good. George, self-conscious from the attention, glanced at Lady Alice. I suppose in some ways it did. But, if you'll forgive my coming to the matter at hand, 
What is this news about Miss Chauncey accepting Lord Hicks's suit? How could something like this have happened? I'm assuming everyone here is aware of the situation, and hope I've not erred in that assessment. We all know, Lady Alice said quietly. Your sister brought me here to speak with Mr Duckworth, as he knows I have a friendship with Miss Chauncey, no matter how new. What happened? George asked again. He allowed himself the luxury of looking at Lady Alice while he waited for her answer. From what I gather, and I must clarify that my one conversation with Miss Chauncey was brief and under public scrutiny, her mother has forced her to accept Lord Hicks's suit. Over yours? George asked, turning to Duck incredulously. He couldn't believe Miss Chauncey could turn down Duck's suit for Lord Hicks's. He knew she was not title-hungry, and she was of age. Her mother could not push her to do something she did not wish to do. Duck shifted in his chair. He didn't answer right away, so Philippa spoke for him, her voice full of compassion. Duck hadn't exactly offered for her. Their courtship was of an unofficial nature, but he did not give her anything in the way of a promise. I believe it was too difficult for Miss Chauncey to resist her mother, when she had nothing else to fall back on. "'But you have since told her how you felt, have you not?' George asked. "'A woman could not easily break a betrothal, at least not without scandal. "'But something must be done.' "'I believe it's too late for that,' Evan said. "'Duck dropped his chin in his hand without answering, "'and George turned to stare at him, surprise again pulling at his brow. "'He had not seen Duck with so little resolve "'since that escapade with Mary Morgan.' He wanted to shake him. If you love her, you need to let her know how you feel. She accepted a proposal on false pretenses. George spoke earnestly, and with a vague suspicion that his exhortation to Duck had taken on a personal significance. She should at least know. Lady Alice turned her face to his, and he caught the look of surprise on her features. Here, he was not only conceding the bet to Lady Alice by his words— he was actually working on her behalf, despite his not proposing any sort of practical solution. There is nothing she can do now, though, Mr Clavering. When Lady Alice spoke, he had trouble focusing on her words. Her voice was like ambrosia after his not having heard it for a month. Maybe not, but I still think you should tell her what you feel. That's my advice, George said firmly. This somewhat futile proposition was met with silence, apart from the shuffle of servants moving about in a nearby room. Lady Alice looked around. Mrs Evans, I fear I cannot stay. I've been away longer than I intended as it is. Philippa, do not trouble yourself to accompany me, for I know you are to meet your husband. I can send word to have my father's carriage brought here. George stood. Please allow me to escort you, my lady. I came by Phaeton and had my footman bring it to the mews. It will be quicker than waiting for your carriage. Lady Alice hesitated long enough that he knew she was reflecting on the gossip it might cause if anyone were to see them. He found himself holding his breath. At last, she glanced around the room. Oh, very well. I thank you. I'll be by later to visit you, Duck, George said, before escorting Lady Alice to the hall, where word was sent to the mews. The carriage was brought around without delay, George thanked his footman as he helped Lady Alice into the phaeton, then climbed up himself. "'James, you can find your own way home, can you not?' Oh, "'Yes, sir,' his footman responded, and took off at a casual pace, not in the least perturbed by the change of plans. George could have let him ride on the back, but he preferred to have Lady Alice to himself. He gave a click of the reins, and the horses started forward. With Lady Alice at his side, he was conscious of every movement either of them made. Their legs were close enough to share warmth, though they were not actually touching. "'You have an estate in Cornwall, I'm told,' Lady Alice said. "'Yes. Do you know the area?' George kept his eyes trained on the road, grateful for the distraction from her presence. "'Not Cornwall, no. But our family visited Brighton twice, and it was one of my favourite places to be.' There is something so bracing and beautiful about the seaside, the tall brown grass that grows in the dunes, the cliffs, the wind and crashing waves. I have always wanted to live in a seaside town. George smiled. She had revealed much of herself in those few words, 
and he found himself in sympathy with what she said. "'My estate is not on the sea, but is not far from it. It's an easy ride to get to all those sites you spoke of.' From his periphery he saw Lady Alice send him a piercing look that was accompanied by a flush to her cheeks. It was only then that George realised he had been dangling his property before her as a way of enticing her to consider him as a suitor. It was too late now, though. The words were out. Lady Alice remained silent, and George searched for something to say, anything that might re-establish them on the footing they seemed to have lost. There had been an easy banter between them, but it was so stiff now. In the end, it was Lady Alice who picked up another thread of conversation. "'You have won your wager. Mr. Duckworth did not make a match with Miss Chauncey. He did not have time to do so, or he did not do so quickly enough for it to bear any fruit. I wouldn't wish Lord Hicks on any one, but—' Lady Alice stopped suddenly, and he glanced at her, curious as to what had made her pause. He put his eyes quickly back on the road. "'But I cannot say I blame Miss Chauncey for buckling under pressure from her mother, when she had nothing more than flirtation to go on from Mr. Duckworth's side. Perhaps if he had known there was such focused interest elsewhere, he would have acted more quickly.' "'I'm sure he would have,' he assured her. "'He was hurt in the past, and I believe it has made him shy to reveal his feelings.' He darted a glance at her again, then trained his gaze forward. I cannot express my surprise upon seeing you in the Evans's drawing-room when I arrived. She chuckled and looked down. And I, upon seeing you, your sister asked me to come and speak to Mr. Duckworth. She thought I could explain the circumstances behind Miss Chauncey's acceptance of Lord Hicks's suit. And were you able to? George frowned. It does seem rather hen-hearted of her to accept a man's suit when she's clearly in love with another man. "'That is because you are a man, Mr. Clavering.' "'Lady Alice's tone was a chastisement. "'You may do whatever you wish. "'You need only propose to a woman when you feel like doing so. "'If you don't feel like it, you need not. "'We women must simply wait. "'We have no control over our destiny "'other than to say no at one moment or yes at another, "'and even that decision is sometimes wrested from us. "'If Mr. Duckworth was slow to offer his hand, "'then it is no one's fault but his own.' "'although, of course, I do not mean to be severe.' "'George paused before answering, focusing again on the road, "'grateful for something to do with his hands. "'We take risks, too, for we do not know if the woman will say yes. "'And besides that, we cannot rush into the thing based on emotion. "'Imagine if we did that. "'We would be sentenced to a life of being married to the wrong woman, or—' if we perform the jilt, be treated even more harshly than a woman for such a thing and lose our honour in the process. There are two sides to a coin, Lady Alice. Perhaps. There was silence again, and a small smile played on her lips. As I said, you have won the bet, Mr. Clavering. You must give me your terms. George smiled, relief coursing through him at the slight shift in the atmosphere surrounding their conversation. The return to their wager called to mind the lighter days of their early acquaintance. "'I will not seek terms until I see what Duck does. For his sake, I hope he will speak to Miss Chauncey. To give you credit, I believe Duck would be very well suited to Miss Chauncey.' He pulled the phaeton onto the street, where the Duke of Carr's London house stood at the end. Lady Alice smiled. "'Thank you for that admission. It is big of you.' She dropped her gaze to her hands. You will have to give me the terms soon, however, if you wish to claim them. He brought the carriage to a standstill outside her residence and turned to her. She looked at him squarely, and his breath caught in the warm regard that he found in the brown eyes and sweet rosebud lips that were tilted up to him. He was caught by her gaze, entrapped. And why is that? he managed to say. We are in no rush, but might think of terms at our leisure— "'It is not even May yet.' "'Yes, the season is not half over,' she said, looking down at her hands. "'But my mother is sending me to Cumbria to live with my sister Anne.' Fifteen. Alice was ready to alight, but Mr. Clavering lifted his hand to stall the footman who had come forward to assist her. "'Give us a moment, please,' he told the servant. Then he turned to her. 
Cumbria? Mr. Clavering's face showed bewilderment, and she could well believe it. She was still coming to terms with the fact that her mother planned to send her off within a week. The Duchess was merely waiting to hear back from Anne, with confirmation that it would be convenient to receive Alice. There had been nothing Alice could do to dissuade her mother from her decision. She did not meet Mr. Clavering's gaze, for fear she might cry. "'My mother is dissatisfied with the fact that I am unwilling to choose a husband, and I believe she hopes to force my hand by threatening to send me away to where I will miss the rest of the season, along with anything else of interest.' She took a sharp breath, but found it hard to fill her lungs. "'Not just threaten to send me, I should say. She is sending me.' Alice's mood plummeted just thinking of it. She could no longer deny that Mr. Clavering's presence affected her. As soon as she had set eyes on him in the Evans's drawing-room, she had become almost bereft of speech. She had given up hope that she would see him again before she left, and the fact that she had was a gift. Mr. Clavering wound the reins around his hand in silence. At last he said, "'Your mother refuses to accept your decision not to marry, so much so that she will send you to the farthest corner of England.' His gaze met hers, and the concern in his eyes pulled his brows down. It is unkind of her. I do not believe she thinks of it in that way. After all, she is sending me to my sister, who is my own flesh and blood. A weak smile tugged at Alice's lips. She does not see it as punishment. Her grace is not of the warmest disposition, and my father is not much better. He kept his eyes on her. Then I can only wonder where you received yours. She flicked her gaze up to his, but that had perhaps not been the best thing to do, because his intent look caused those foreign flutterings in her breast again. She faced forward, and was gearing up to call the footman to come and assist her to alight, since Mr. Clavering seemed reluctant to do so, although honestly it was not much easier for her to end their conversation. When Mr. Clavering spoke, "'It is a shame that you must go so soon. I had hoped—' He broke off and fiddled again with the reins in his hand. I have had plenty of time to think this past month, and I wonder if you would consider a proposal I have. Alice knit her brows in confusion. She could not imagine what proposal he meant, unless... Could it be that he wished to ask for her hand? Alice risked a quick glance, and he looked uncomfortable enough that it must be so. Her heart began to beat more distinctly in her chest. She must say no, of course... Surely she must, since she was not to marry. But never before had anyone so tempted her to give a different reply. Mr. Clavering shifted in his seat to look at her. I was thinking while I was away, a great deal as a matter of fact. It's a subject I have not allowed myself to broach in the past, even in my own mind. I thought myself much too young to consider such a thing, you see. But there was something about being away and seeing to my estate that made me realise it is time. I need a wife, Lady Alice. He breathed in and stretched his legs forward, as much as the seat would allow, looking as though he wanted to break free from the confines of his small carriage and pace the street. I would never propose such a thing to you, as you have made your feelings on the topic perfectly clear, but the fact that you're going away compels me to speak. Alice held her breath, startled, "'astonished that he was actually going to propose marriage. "'There was a part of her that tried to be outraged. "'If he could ask her such a thing, "'he had heard nothing of her own desires. "'But the greater part of her betrayed those noble feelings "'because she wanted to hear him say the words. "'What was more, she wanted to say yes. "'At last he exhaled and faced her. "'I was wondering if you would help me find a wife.' The request was so unexpected, Alice had trouble understanding it. Then comprehension came in full force. If she'd had trouble breathing before, she found she had no breath at all now. It was as though someone had kicked her in the gut. I don't follow. Her words came out breathy, barely audible. Mr Clavering's look of discomfort increased. Well, I, I can now see... How right you were about Duck and Miss Chauncey, even though there has been a considerable setback, I'll own. I just thought that if you have such an instinct for matches, you might have one for mine. Ah! 
Alice looked ahead at some object she could not seem to focus on. Her face grew prickly and hot, and she hoped that whatever unidentifiable emotion that passed through her would not be evident to him. "'A wife for you, Mr. Clavering.' Her voice gained in strength. "'I shall do my best not to disappoint, but I have less than a week in London, so I can make no promises.' She signalled to the footman to come. She could not be in that carriage another minute. Mr. Clavering placed a hand on her arm to draw her attention back. "'Lady Alice, no matter what happens with my intended, I want to let you know that I enjoy your company a great deal. I missed it when I was away.' She tried to smile, but it would not come. "'And I yours?' Alice allowed the footman to hand her down, and she did not look at Mr. Clavering as she walked to her front door, but she heard the sounds of him behind her as he drove away. She stepped into the spacious entrance to their house, desperate to seek refuge in her bedroom. Her mother came out of the drawing-room. "'Alice, there you are. Where have you been?' "'I was visiting with Mrs. Blythefield,' she said. "'Again? You have become quite the bosom friends.' "'Shame nothing came of it with her brother. "'However, I have excellent news. "'I have received a letter from your sister,' the Duchess said, "'holding the cream letter with a broken seal. "'She would be delighted to have you, "'and said that all of your nieces and nephews are clamouring for you to visit.' "'Alice removed her gloves. "'Shall we go into the drawing-room, Mother?' "'She did not want the footman to hear what they were discussing, "'especially since she wished to protest once again. "'Perhaps her mother might truly hear her this time.' She followed the Duchess into the drawing-room and waited until they had both sat before she spoke. "'I feel that this decision is being done as some sort of chastisement, almost as if you've decided to send me away to spite me, simply because I desire to follow a different path than the one you wish me to march down.' Alice fought to keep her voice steady. She knew that Mr. Clavering's request had not helped her in controlling her emotions. One thing had piled upon another, and it would soon crush her. She clutched her gloves until her knuckles turned white. "'I know you think that I do not have your best interests at heart, but I assure you I do,' the Duchess said. She smoothed her skirt and for once did not launch into the stiff reprimand that Alice expected. Instead, she folded her hands and met her daughter's gaze. "'I cannot say that I am able to understand your wish not to marry. I have always wanted to marry and have children,' but I did not necessarily want to marry the one my parents had chosen for me. Her mother always selected her words with great care, and at this admission she flinched as though she had spoken words she had meant to keep hidden. It is nothing against your father, of course. I am perfectly content with my life at his side, and most particularly content with the children I have borne him. But it was not precisely my wish to become a duchess— I had never desired to be the centre of attention in the way a duchess was bound to be. Alice digested this. It did not shock her that her mother hadn't wished to marry the Duke of Carr. He was not a warm man. But her mother's confession that she did not relish having all eyes on her surprised Alice. For someone who so delighted in gossip, appearances must carry value for her. Unless, of course, Alice's mother was afraid that gossip would be turned her way— and she would not come off favourably. A duchess certainly attracted the regard, and critique, of many. "'This is why I thought it quite generous, and modern of your father and I to allow you to make a love match,' her mother continued. "'Your sisters never even asked for such a thing. They were content to unite themselves with whomever we chose for them. With you, our youngest daughter, we were more lenient, I suppose.' Although we did not precisely wish to spoil you, we could see that you had different ideas than your sisters. For that reason, we were willing to consider things in a different light, to let you make a match based on affection, as I have said. The Duchess sighed her disappointment. And although we place plenty of eligible men in your path, with hopes that you would choose one of them, there have been none to catch your fancy. So when we allowed this Mr. Clavering, who is but a second son— and of a baronet, no less. We thought it highly generous of us. But you have thumbed your nose at all of our efforts. You should consider that you are just as much to blame if we send you off. Alice was growing weary of the way the conversation had turned into a lecture. Mother, you said that you had my best interests at heart, 
but everything you've said so far shows that your reasons for sending me north are because I did not do what you wished. If that is not punishment, I do not know what is. The Duchess leaned forward slightly, as if to add emphasis to her words. I am only showing you what life will be like without the protection of a husband, before it is too late and you are firmly on the shelf. It is not a life I would wish for you. You are not a green girl, but you are hardly as old as you think yourself. Your life as a single woman, oh, never mind if you have a settlement, will not be an easy one. It is not unreasonable of me to want you to benefit from a husband's protection. Alice had no response for her mother. She didn't think her mother would listen anyway. The only thing she had was the privacy of her thoughts, and she clung to that. In her heart of hearts, she knew that marriage might possibly be a temptation, if Mr. Clavering were the one to ask it of her. He was not like other gentlemen. If only she could have some assurance that he would not continue to take mistresses, if she could believe that he was truly the man he appeared to be, then she thought it might not be so terrible to have such heart-flutterings for the rest of her life. The only problem was that she could be sure of none of these things. 16. George clicked the reins for his match greys to move forward, his thoughts consumed with the news Lady Alice had given him. He could not believe she was about to leave. The principal object that had brought him back to London, that had quickened his pace, helping him to overcome the fatigue of days upon days of travel on horseback, was the anticipation of seeing Lady Alice again. And to see her so soon upon his arrival felt like providence. He would have to drink it in while he could. He knew she would not consent to receiving a proposal from him, never mind that he had at last warmed to the idea of finding someone and settling down, and she was currently the only candidate on that list. He could not ask it of her. To do so would be to wholly disregard her wishes, and he would not show her such a lack of respect. But since he had formulated his idea of pursuing steps toward matrimony, what better person to choose a match for him than someone Lady Alice had designated? She would not send someone his way who lacked her wit, humour and intelligence. Then again, he was unlikely to find anyone who possessed those qualities in anywhere close to the degree that she possessed them. But if he could just find a copy, perhaps that would be enough. I am probably lying to myself, though. George was not sure he could easily accept a poor copy of a woman like Lady Alice. Rather than turning toward home, he rode to his brother's house, with a mind to report on his progress at the estate. He had sent a letter to Lucius while away, and had received one in return. In part, George wished to seek his brother's approval of everything he had accomplished. After all, he had finally done what his brother had asked of him, and he was proud of himself. Another part of him simply wished to settle something inside, by seeing Lucius's family, to examine whether he was taking the right steps. When Briggs opened the door to Lucius's house, voices came from the drawing-room, including the sound of a particularly piercing one that had him gritting his teeth. Maria. It was too late to back down now, and perhaps Lucius needed his support. George grinned at the thought. It was usually the other way around. He entered the drawing-room, and all eyes turned to him. "'You're back,' Selina said in a warm voice, as Hugh let go of her hand and toddled forward. George picked him up and gave him a toss, which had his nephew giggling. "'Just the person I wished to see,' Mariah said, in a voice that was far from warm, and which did not bode well. "'George!' Lucius greeted him with an affectionate light in his eye and an undercurrent of shared humour that told him his brother was as little enthusiastic to see Mariah as he was. "'George!' Mariah echoed focusing her razor-sharp gaze on him. "'I was just coming by to tell Lucius that the strangest rumours are circulating about you and Lady Alice Sinclair. Can you believe it? I have asked Lucius and Selina if they knew anything about it, but neither of them did. What have you to say to these, Andy?' George braced himself against her question. It was so like his sister Maria. Not content to simply manage her own life, she hoped to manage everyone else's as well. He was glad Philippa had married and escaped from under their sister's thumb, although he had to own, not through much help from him. He had been so busy playing at the time, he had hardly paid attention to Philippa, and had almost missed out on the fact that she was being pressured into an unhappy marriage. 
He still felt badly about that. Lady Alice is above my touch, he replied, taking a seat. He hoped that his response had been given casually enough to satisfy Maria. He liked Lady Alice too much to have his own sister starting such rumours, and he wouldn't put it past her to do such a thing, especially if she thought it could elevate her own social position, or her husband's political one. "'You have been gone a month, and the rumours are still circulating. Lady Alice has looked positively blue-devilled at your absence whenever she goes out in society, and everyone has noticed it. Do you have an understanding, George? You owe it to me as your sister to tell me the true state of affairs.' George owed her no such thing. If she was positively blue devilled, it is because she must take a trip to Cumbria to visit her sister, and I understand it to be a prolonged stay. He had cause to regret the words as soon as they left his lips, because Maria sat up straight and turned a wide-eyed gaze on him. "'You've had words with her, if you are aware of her plans. It is just as I suspected.' The Duke and Duchess of Cara dead set against the match, and they wish to send her away so that she may not be swayed by your charm. What charm? George interjected, not concealing his irritation. Lucius laughed quietly, and George shot him a look. George, you know you have a reputation in the town of playing with far too many hearts. I don't believe there is a matron left who thinks her daughter has a chance with you. Maria leaned forward eagerly. But if you have been snared at last... When you have a woman like Lady Alice in your grasp, you must not let her go or leave the courtship to chance by disappearing from the social scene. You must hold on to her. Maria did nothing but raise his ire. For once, he agreed with his sister and would have liked very much to hold on to Lady Alice. But he obviously could not say so, and whether he won her was not up to him anyway. It was unfair of Maria to insist... He needed only bring up the fact that Lady Alice did not wish to marry to silence his sister, but he had already revealed too much. George rubbed his chin, completely at a loss for how to answer. Lucius lifted his feet off the footstool where he had placed them and leaned forward to put his elbows on his knees. I have been trying to tell Maria to stay out of it, but it appears she's not willing to heed my advice. He kept his gaze innocent, as if their sister was not in the room. An unspoken understanding passed between George and Lucius. There had been many such moments growing up with their intrusive older sister. Selina stayed quiet. She and Maria did not get on well, and she did not attempt to add to the discussion whenever Maria was around. Not because she cowered in her presence, but because she thought it would not be good for Lucius to have to bear more antagonism than he already did. Selina had proven a calming influence on the entire family. George tapped his hand on the armrest of his chair, quelling the urge to argue or pace in his irritation. Maria, if the Duke and Duchess of Carr wished to send their daughter to Cumbria to get her away from me, they would have made sure she left before I returned. They had plenty of time to do so. The reason for her trip north has absolutely nothing to do with me. Of that I can assure you. George skewered his meddlesome sister with his gaze. And that is more information than you deserve. Maria gave a little gasp of displeasure as Lucius took up George's defence. I told you, Maria, George is no longer a boy that you can bring to bridal. He's a man now and does not need your intervention or your advice. George had one desire, and that was to get out of Maria's presence, so he seized the lull that fell over the company at his brother's rebuke. Lucius, I wish to go over some estate business with you and hope to get your input, if you can spare me a few minutes of your time. Not a problem, Lucius replied, getting to his feet. I'm free right now. With both Lucius and George leaving, Maria stood abruptly. Well, I suppose I must be leaving then too, if both of you are going to run off. Good day to you, Selina. Maria would not extend her visit for more time with her sister-in-law, since the idea held little pleasure for either of them. "'Good day, Maria,' Lucius said, as calmly as though they had just spent the most agreeable afternoon together. George followed his brother out of the door into his study. "'I believe you saved us,' Lucius said, as he walked over to the table next to the bookshelves and poured them both a drink. "'If you had not arrived and pulled me away, there's no saying how long she would have stayed. So tell me about the estate.' George accepted the drink. Apart from the days of travel, I must say I'm glad I went. 
Lucius raised an eyebrow. You astonish me. George laughed, as you likely knew when you sent the letters my way. Once I got the steward's strange request for money to make repairs on an estate I had not seen in years, I could not let things stand. I couldn't hand over such a sum without going myself to see if it was warranted. I knew my faith in you was not misplaced, Lucius said, humour colouring his voice. George gave a quick smile, then began to go over the details of the estate and what he had discovered. He asked for advice about how much he should be putting into the various repairs this year, and which should wait until he knew what kind of income the crops would bring in. Lucius had overseen George's estate from a distance, and could not instruct him on the particulars. However, he lent his wisdom from the experience on his own estate in Hertfordshire, although it did not face the same challenges, such as preserving and accessing the existing sites of fresh water. Lucius went over to the desk and scribbled down a name and direction. "'I've just thought of Randall Merritt, whom I went to school with. You should be able to learn more from him, as he's from Cornwall.' George took the paper with a word of thanks. It had been an agreeable hour spent with his brother, discussing various possibilities for improvements to his inheritance— it was the first time George and Lucius had interacted on an equal level, rather than George feeling that Lucius viewed him as a boy. "'Well, I shall go see Duck. He should be home by now,' George said at last, as he stood. He placed his hat on his head. "'He's had a bit of a heartache.' Lucius leaned back in his chair. "'Miss Chauncey?' George was on his way to the door, but at this he turned back. "'Yes.' I'm surprised you know of it, for Duck has not been particularly vocal about his interest in Miss Chauncey. Oh, the rumours circulate, and while you were gone I observed Duck. He is your friend after all. I've never seen him pay so much attention to one woman. Lucius studied his fingers, clasped together on his lap. It's a shame she went to Lord Hicks. The attachment must not have been strong on her side. George shook his head. No, that's where you're wrong. I believe her infatuation was even stronger than his at the beginning, and I have reason to believe it has not waned at all. But Duck was slow in making a declaration, and Miss Chauncey's mother was interested in the title. She pushed her daughter to it, by all accounts. Hmph. Lucius rubbed his chin. A universally shared trait of all men, this hesitancy to propose to a woman when they've known their heart long since. I suppose we keep thinking we need to be more certain— and how sure is sure enough. George knew that Lucius was thinking of his own marriage proposal, and how long it had taken him to decide to act. It had almost been too late to win Selina. George nodded. I cannot argue with you there. I still think he should make a push to declare his intentions. When Lucius stared at him in surprise, he added, I know, the bans have been read, but no announcement was put in the Gazette, and she loathes the man, I've seen it. I say Duck should at least tell her how he feels. What, so they can run off together? Lucius lifted an eyebrow. It would stir the devil of a talk. Duck could handle it, George shot back. But could Miss Chauncey? Lucius raised his eyes to George. George pulled on his gloves. She could. It's true, I don't know her well, but she appears to be a woman of character. Too much of one to waste her entire life in a dreadful marriage. Lady Alice thinks a great deal of her, or she would not have shown her so much interest. And you think a great deal of Lady Alice, Lucius observed. George had his hand on the doorknob, and at this he paused. Unfortunately, I do. Shame, because it is on my side alone. George went to Duck's house that night, hoping to have a deeper conversation than he could have managed at Matthew's house. He thought he might find him there, and he did. Duck had his chin on his hand, and he lifted his eyes when George walked in, but did not greet him. I'm going to see what I can do to get you a meeting with Miss Chauncey. I will ask Lady Alice what she thinks, if I can manage to see her before she leaves. George stopped short, the words casting a shadow over everything else. He took a deep breath and tried to shrug it off. I believe you must tell Miss Chauncey how you feel about her. Duck nodded, his eyes hooded. It has been a difficult decision to make when I know I am at fault for letting things go this far. But you are right. I must at least tell her, even though it is too late. I just have no idea how. 
George waited for him to say more, and Duck's look of despondency only grew. "'I was going to take her away from London, far away from her mother,' Duck said. "'She would have been happy in Derbyshire. She told me she never really liked it in London.' George couldn't bear to see his friend in such a state. I don't know when Lady Alice is leaving, but I will ask her to arrange for you to meet Miss Chauncey before she goes, if such a thing is possible. It's far from a sure thing, however, as she is to leave any day now. It would be the only way I could see her. I have no pretext for calling on Miss Chauncey, and her mother has not taken her out since the betrothal was announced. Duck reached over and shook George's hand. If you can do such a thing, then I will be in your debt. George was unsure of his chances for success, but he would try. A silence fell between them, and, eager to turn the conversation, he thought it would be a good time to catch up on the news from his month away. "'What else have I missed?' Duck came to life at the question. "'Oh, yes, I believe this will interest you, although it is not good news. Our dear Mary Morgan appears to be dipping her fingers even more deeply into Lord Anley's purse. He's giving every sign of being completely smitten,' and is not accepting advice from anyone else. It is well known his father is not happy with the affair, and that Anley has all but stopped going home or frequenting his friends. George touched his forehead. I had completely forgotten about Lady Alice's brother. I wonder how much she knows of it. I don't suppose there's any danger of a flight to the border. Duck only shrugged. One would think not, but the way the Duke is doing all he can to prevent it is giving rise to talk— I would not say that Lord Anley is helping the matter in any way. He appears to be quite stubborn. Why can't people be simple and straightforward, George said. And wise, Duck added. They had bets going on in the club on those two. I should have bet on Mary. Once she sets her sights on a man, she does not easily let go. 17. Occasionally, the Duchess would go to Lady Jersey's house for morning calls on a day of the week that did not follow a night at Ormac's. When Alice came downstairs, her mother announced that this would be their plan for the day. Alice was glad of it. She would not have the enjoyment of London for much longer, and, surrounded as she was by Clada and new friends, such as Philippa and Mr Clavering, she was coming to appreciate it. The Duchess had arranged for Alice to leave the next day, she would travel in the Duke's carriage, accompanied by her maid, two footmen and three outriders. She did not think she would have an opportunity to see Mr Clavering before she left, and was trying to convince herself that it did not matter, especially since he had asked her to find him a wife. He would eventually marry. A man needed an heir, after all. Perhaps she would be fortunate enough to see Miss Chauncey today— Alice wanted a better opportunity to find out what had happened without Miss Chauncey's every word being scrutinised. One look at Mr Duckworth's face had convinced her that Miss Chauncey was making a grave error. Although she could not fault her for having buckled under such pressure, it was a shame she had been forced to accept a proposal from a man she did not love, when there was so clearly one she did. As she waited for her mother to pull on her gloves, there was a knock at the door. Alice followed her mother into the morning room to wait, so they would not be seen by the visitors. Within minutes, Horace came in, holding flowers. He brought them over to the side table and announced, "'They are for you, my lady.' Alice's breath froze. She had not received flowers since her second season. She darted an uncertain glance at her mother, not wishing to disclose who had sent the flowers, nor did she wish to discover her benefactor in front of her mother.' The Duchess had many failings, but she did not force a confidence. She would ask who the flowers were from, but she would not read a letter addressed to Alice. With a mere lift of her brow, she left the morning room. "'As soon as you have read the card, we may be off.' Alice waited until her mother had gone, before darting over to the bouquet and ripping the envelope from the ribbon that tied it to a flower stem. The bouquet was full of wild flowers, the kind that could be seen in the country— rather than the more cultured roses or irises that were usually sent. She broke the seal and opened the paper. Dear Lady Alice, I thought a bouquet with a small note would be more appropriate and garner less notice than a letter. I hope you will forgive my presumption. I do not know when you are to leave London, but if you are able to perform one act of service before you go, aside from the one I requested of you, which is the less urgent by far, 
I would ask that you see if Miss Chauncey might be persuaded to meet Mr Duckworth. It can be at a venue of her choosing. You need only say the word and he will come. It might be too late or too complicated. But if there is any woman I know who possesses great resources, it is you. Yours, George Clavering. Alice ran her fingers over the lettering of his name. George. He had put his first name as well as his last. She could almost think of him that way instead of by his more formal appellation. She thought the meeting would be difficult to arrange, but Mr Clavering appeared to have faith in her. Perhaps it could be her last act of service in London, especially since his other request could wait. Her mother came into the room, and Alice folded the letter and tucked it into her reticule. "'I'm coming, mother.' She had only to pull her gloves back on, and she was ready. Her mother paused at the door, and the question that Alice had waited for came at last. "'Who were the flowers from?' "'Mr. Clavering.' Alice could not lie, much as she was tempted to. She was also tempted to take the flowers with her when she travelled, so she could press them, although she supposed that would be the height of foolishness. "'He appears to have interest in your direction, despite what you say,' her mother observed. "'None,' Alice replied firmly. She could tell her mother that he had asked her to find him a wife, but she did not wish to reveal too much. Her mother paused only long enough to say, "'Pity,' before opening the door and walking to where the footman waited. When they arrived at Lady Jersey's house, Alice was disappointed to see that while Mrs Chauncey was in attendance, her daughter was not. She sat on the side of the room, in what Alice privately referred to as the second circle. Mrs Chauncey had enough standing to pay a call on Lady Jersey, but she would be sitting with the ladies who did not equal the ranks of Lady Jersey and the Duchess of Carr. Alice wished she could ask Mrs Chauncey why her daughter was not in attendance, but such a thing was not done. Instead, she went over to sit at the circle of young ladies she had known from childhood, wishing she could have the pleasure of Miss Chauncey's more authentic conversation. Well, "'Lady Alice!' Diana Moore called out. "'Do you intend to go to the masquerade ball that the Fenleys are hosting? We were just discussing what we will wear, although I suppose we should not tell anyone what it shall be if we hope to keep our identities a secret.' Teresa Wolfe picked up her cup and took a sip of her tea. "'I have long thought that someone should host a private masquerade ball that could rival Vauxhall Gardens, but that one could actually attend without being thought too fast. At last, someone else has had the idea.' Barbara Gower nodded sagely. Well, "'The Fenleys have just the ballroom for it. I believe they must have the largest ballroom in all of London. It will be the perfect place to host such a crowd, and they will be on the lookout for any impropriety, I assure you.' "'So will you go?' Diana asked Alice. She could not bring herself to say the words that she would not be in London. She had no desire to field off questions about her upcoming trip. There was a sense of shame attached to it. With that, a sudden reflection accosted Alice. How had her mother not thought of that? For her to go away mid-season would surely produce talk. People would become convinced she had a purpose for leaving— and then, once she said the words, it would make it real. And she still hoped to be able to stay. "'I've not yet decided,' Alice said at last. "'I'm unsure what my parents' plans are for the next few evenings.' Oh, "'That is one of the disadvantages to remaining single,' Barbara said kindly to the women of their circle, all of whom were single. Teresa glanced over at the second circle and leaned in. I have heard that Mrs Chauncey has scored a victory for her daughter. I overheard her boasting about it when we came in. I wonder that her daughter is not here as well to boast of the news herself. Alice was not sure she would call an engagement to Lord Hicks a victory, but it would not do to further the gossip. Perhaps it might not come to anything. There has been nothing announced, she said. Nothing announced, but the way Miss Chauncey's mother is gloating, I'm sure it is only a matter of time. "'Teresa replied. "'Barbara furrowed her brows. "'I do not understand what is taking so long. "'Everyone believes this to be a sealed affair, "'and yet there is no announcement. "'The bands have been read twice, apparently, "'but that matters less to the ton than a line in the Gazette.' "'She chuckled at her own cleverness before continuing. Oh, "'Surely her mother must know it is creating talk. "'That is something I would wish to avoid. "'Were I entering into a betrothal?' I can only be grateful that my Mr. Gower did everything in the proper way, 
and my parents were quick to put the announcement in the papers. Alice turned to Teresa, struck by an idea. You call the engagement to Lord Hicks a victory, but he has been on the hunt for a wife for ages. Why have you never sought his regard before? Lady Alice, Teresa replied with a blush of indignation. You must not think I am the type to dangle after eligible men. No, no, Lady Alice said, her tone conciliatory. She hoped to get to the root of Teresa's interest in Lord Hicks. I did not mean to imply that. What do you find appealing in Lord Hicks? Both Barbara and Diana fell silent, and Alice wondered if she were the only one who could not abide the man. I do not say he is appealing, not in the manner of speaking, Teresa replied, hedging. It is only that his fortune is known to be vast, and that is not something to turn one's nose up at. I know he is perhaps not the most handsome of men. She gave a titter. Oh, certainly not like Mr. Clavering, who I once thought was interested in you, Lady Alice. But a life with Lord Hicks would be a comfortable one. His wife could command every elegancy, besides being titled. Alice's mind was spinning with an idea, and it was not hard to pretend she had not heard Mr. Clavering's name associated with hers. She would not deign to answer such a thing in any case. The conversation moved on to other topics, and Alice's mind revolved around her idea. What if she and Mr. Clavering were able to arrange it so Mr. Duckworth won Miss Chauncey before she was led to the altar with a man she found distasteful? What if Alice could sidetrack Lord Hicks to look at Teresa instead? Everyone would be happy. He would find a wife who did not mind him, Teresa would be able to settle down, which Alice knew was something she wished for, and Miss Chauncey would be free. The next thought came with depressing swiftness. She would not be here to bring such a thing about. She would be on her way to Cumbria. The Duchess stood and spoke a few words to her hostess in private, smiling and gaining the last few ounces of gossip that would nourish her for the next week. She gestured for her daughter to come, and Alice stood. Her mother was a proponent of short visits. "'I shall have to bid you farewell,' Alice said to the other women. "'My mother is ready to go.' "'I fear I will outstay my welcome if I do not leave now as well,' Barbara said. "'I arrive before any of you. "'Lady Alice, I can accompany you and your mother to the entrance while we wait for our carriages. "'I suppose you will have to wait for your mamas,' she said, to Teresa and Diana, who nodded. "'Barbara linked her arm through Alice's. "'I came on my own, you see. "'It is such a pleasure to do precisely what I wish. "'What freedom we married women have!' "'It had begun to rain outside,' and the sound of the drops entered the hall. It was not quite a deluge, but the rain was heavy enough that they would likely be soaked by the time they made it to the carriages. Alice's mother called for their carriage first. As they waited, Mrs Wesley exited and stopped to speak with her. Barbara pulled closer to Alice, dropping her voice to a whisper. "'I did not want to bring up the subject of your brother, but he is being much talked about. This on of his association with Mary Morgan.' Has his grace not been able to do anything to quash the scandal? I understand Lord Anley is quite set in his own ways, and won't heed anyone. That woman is far too coy for her own good. The temptress herself. No one can resist her, I'm told. The words were a stab in Alice's heart. Her poor brother, being talked about by the likes of Barbara Gower and the rest of London. How was it possible that he could not see what was happening? She did not think him precisely simple, but how could he have let things go this far? The butler peered out the window, then turned to them. Oh, your Grace, your carriage is here. Come, Alice, her mother said, sweeping forward. Alice followed her mother out the door and down the few steps to the street. The footman put out his arm for the Duchess, and she held on lightly as they descended the stairs. When they reached the stone flagway, Alice's mother stepped on a thin sheet of water, and her foot shot forward, she started to fall, and the footman twisted to try to catch her with his other hand, but he was not quick enough. The Duchess fell to the ground with a grunt, and she could not move or speak for a minute. Alarmed, Alice hurried over and reached down for her elbow. "'Mother, you will be soaked through. Can you move?' Her mother's voice was sharp with pain. "'You! Assist me to my feet!' The footman, who had been helping her, looked abashed. He started forward at the same time the butler hurried down the stairs. 
Barbara and Mrs. Wesley both stepped outside to see what had happened. "'Oh, your grace!' they called out. Neither woman was particularly helpful, however, as they did not wish to leave the protection of the marquise that kept out the rain. Alice's mother ignored them, and allowed the butler and footman to come to her aid, then assist her into the carriage. Alice walked around to the other side of the carriage to climb in, and called up to their groom. "'Take us home directly. My mother has been hurt.' She shut the door and sat, then looked at her mother with compassion. "'Does it pain you very much?' Her mother's face was pinched. "'What a clumsy oaf! That footman could not even carry out the simple task for which he was hired. I hope Lady Jersey will see fit to let him go. He deserved to be relieved of his position without a character.' Alice felt for the footman. Her mother was not light, and once she was headed downward, nothing would keep her on her feet. She kept her peace, though. It would not do any good, and she knew that a dose of pain and humiliation did not necessarily lead one to grace. When the carriage pulled up to their house, her mother attempted to shift in her seat, and shook her head. "'I cannot walk at all. My hip and ankle are both paining me. Send the groom in for our footman to come and assist me. See to it that no one is walking by when they do so.' Alice did as her mother bid, and as it was still raining, a blessing for her mother, who did not wish to have an audience, Alice re-entered the carriage without spotting a single soul. She glanced at her mother again, wondering if she would welcome comforting words or gestures. Alice decided she would not. "'I have news for you,' her mother said, "'and as much as it displeases me, I'm sure you will regard it as good. I will not be able to walk, that much is clear, and I do not know how long it will take to recover.' I have no choice but to postpone your trip to see your sister, for you will have to run the household during my convalescence. Yes, mother, Alice replied, in as neutral a tone as she could summon. The door to the carriage opened on her mother's side, and the butler stood with two footmen. He clucked in concern, and began giving orders to the footman. Alice could hardly believe what her mother had just told her. It would be unkind to call this turn of events a piece of good fortune but in full honesty, she could only view it as that. Chapter 18 George sat in his dining room at Long's Hotel, uninspired to do anything. He could only suppose that Lady Alice had already left, and London was a dash bleak place without her. Throughout his month in Cornwall, she had entered his mind more often than he would have thought possible. How had he gone so many years without knowing her? He had almost forgotten what had filled his thoughts before. At first glance, Lady Alice was simply another society woman of high breeding, no different than the rest of the women in the town. But she had penetrated the indifferent barrier people put up when they attended society events, and had become something more. It was a shame she did not want to marry. Why did she not want to marry? It made no sense, especially when they shared such an easy rapport. George leaned one arm on the table, fiddling with his teacup. If he thought there were the slightest chance. He sat up. Well, maybe there was a chance, and it needed only the right man. And maybe that man was him. There was only one way to find out. He would begin pursuing her as eagerly as Dark had pursued Miss Chauncey, except this time he would not be slow in making a declaration, thereby allowing some mushroom to slip in and win her at the last minute. Speaking of which, the wedding of Lord Hicks and Miss Chauncey was a mere two weeks away. The announcement had finally been inserted in the London Gazette the day before. George could not figure out why there needed to be such a rush for them to wed, except for the fact that Mrs Chauncey was likely eager to have her daughter securely riveted. The whole thing rather turned one's stomach when one thought about how fixated people were on titles. When Duck had not received any word back on how he might meet with Miss Chauncey, he had grown only more morose. If George didn't do something soon, he would fall into the dismals as well. He decided it was time to throw a few punches. A short time later, he entered number 13 Bond Street, eager to work off some of the frustration that had built up inside of him. A few rounds of boxing would serve the purpose. As he stripped off his coat, he thought of the Marquis of Anley, wondering if he would meet him here, and if the Marquis would give him news of his sister. Minutes later, the man himself appeared. Anley caught his gaze and came over. 
Clavering, he greeted, sticking out his hand. Pleasure, my lord. Are you here to spar, or have you finished? George kept his other questions to himself. He did not want Lord Anley to know how often Lady Alice preoccupied his thoughts. Oh, call me Anley. As a matter of fact, I was about to change. I was looking for someone up to my weight, and I'll practice with you if you'd like. The Marquis smiled, reminding George of Lady Alice in that stubborn tilt to his chin. She had said they were close. I'll wait here. When Anley returned, George began throwing a few punches into the air as he warmed up. He couldn't master his curiosity for long, however. I assume Lady Alice has left London. Anley looked at him with an air of surprise. Oh, you know about that, do you? George avoided Anley's gaze. He had not wanted to reveal anything about whatever intimacy he shared with Lady Alice, but apparently he had. We are acquainted, although not close. We've spoken a few times. The Marquis shook his head. I would say you were something more than acquainted if you were aware of her imminent departure. As far as I knew, she told no one she was to leave, and she's not one to share anything of a personal nature. In fact, I cannot think of anyone she would do that with, apart from her friend, Clada Langley, a uh, bell, rather. George held his breath, hoping he had not made Anley suspicious. He wanted to begin courting Lady Alice, but he wanted to do it on her terms, with complete respect for what she wanted. He hoped he had not misspoken. The Marquis wound a band around his wrists and hands and pulled on his gloves. As a matter of fact, my mother's taken a fall. It was raining when she was out paying morning calls with Alice, and she slipped and hurt her foot, as well as her hip, I believe. As such, she's unable to do anything for herself. So my sister, who had no desire to leave town at present, had a stroke of luck through my mother's misfortune. She's to remain in London and take care of my mother." Anley glanced at George, who was once again struck by how much the Marquis resembled his sister. But in this case, it was the humour in his expressive eyes. George threw a few more punches, not allowing his expression to reveal the joy that had sprung up. She is not leaving. Realising he was not properly equipped to box, he grabbed his own gloves and pulled them on. Then it will be good to see her. Perhaps we shall meet tonight at the opera. Anley looked doubtful. I'm not sure she'll be going to the opera, or anywhere else for the time being. She will have no one to accompany her. George cocked his head and studied the Marquis. He would give anything to see Lady Alice tonight. Why do you not accompany her? Anley shifted under George's gaze. I uh, have plans of my own after the opera's over. I would not be able to take her home. George knew very well what plans Anley had, but their acquaintance was still too fresh for him to bring it up. What a shame he could not offer to take Lady Alice home himself after the opera. But it was impossible. Not at night, with just the two of them. She would need a proper chaperone. Philippa had been poorly lately, and he could not beg her to accompany Lady Alice. He put his fists up. Ready? Anley beat his two gloved hands together once. Ready. They spoke as they fought, but George did not pursue the topic of Mary Morgan. It would only invite a rebuff, and he did not want to suffer a setback in the progress he'd made in Anley's confidence. If he was going to help him, he needed to advance cautiously. Besides, it was technically no business of his, apart from his desire to set Lady Alice's mind at ease. As they settled down to the serious business of sparring, their conversation ceased. Anley had picked up a few tricks since George had been away. He was a quick learner, except, apparently, when it came to matters of the heart. That night at the opera, despite the fact that Anley had disillusioned him of the hope of seeing Lady Alice, George could not help but look out for her. He searched the crowds and reached the conclusion that she was indeed not there. He did cross paths with Mrs Bell, and before he could think the better of the idea, he went over to greet her. The only evidence of her surprise was in the slight lift of a brow before she curtsied. "'Mrs. Bell, I hope this evening finds you well. Have you come with your husband?' George did not know what Mr. Bell looked like, but it would be odd if Mrs. Bell were alone, married though she was. She smiled at him. "'Yes, Mr. Bell is the gentleman just standing there. I left him talking to one of the MPs.' George couldn't think of anything to say next, and he stood there for a moment. He had not thought out what excuse he would give for having come to speak with her, 
only that he needed some connection to Lady Alice. "'I had offered to bring Lady Alice with me tonight,' Mrs. Bell said after a pause, throwing him the conversational bait, which he eagerly took. "'How is Lady Alice?' His face grew warm under the all-too-perceptive gaze of Mrs. Bell. "'I understood she was to leave London, but now her brother tells me she's not travelling after all, due to an unfortunate accident.' Mrs. Bell nodded, the glimmer of a smile in her eyes. "'Most unfortunate. I would not wish such a painful fall on anyone. However, I am glad to have the company of my friend for the rest of the season.' She paused just a little bit before adding, "'and glad that she will not be sent away to where there would be nothing that could possibly amuse her.' "'I am glad as well,' George admitted, not caring if he was revealing feelings he normally kept hidden." Now that he had set his mind on attempting to win Lady Alice's hand, he aimed to be victorious. Nevertheless, it would do no good if she was in London and he could not see her. So, if she is unable to be chaperoned, then she will not easily be able to visit others. Do you know if she accepts visitors at home? Mrs. Bell smiled broadly. You've approached the right person, for I know exactly what Lady Alice's schedule is. Her mother is unable to sit in on morning visits, but she does not wish to give the impression that she is too unwell to receive them, so Lady Alice receives the visits, chaperoned by her maid. Needless to say, since word is not out that she is at home, she has few. George absorbed this treasured information. And at what hour might be a good time to pay Lady Alice a visit? I believe you will find her at home tomorrow at two o'clock, should you wish to try. Mrs. Bell dropped a small, graceful curtsy and turned to rejoin her husband, that faint smile still in her eyes. It gave George hope. She knew more about Lady Alice than any of her other friends, and if Mrs. Bell was offering this information to him, she likely thought he had a chance. That Lady Alice had stated her intentions to remain single was daunting, but perhaps she'd had a change of heart. If he brought up his search for a wife again, she might reveal her interest. He could not know unless he attempted it. The next day, at two o'clock, George presented himself at the Duke of Carr's residence. It seemed to take forever for the butler to open the door, and a trickle of perspiration sent a chill down George's spine. As he cared little about his own social standing, being plagued by nervousness was a foreign sensation. At last, the butler admitted him and had him wait in the drawing-room while he sent a message up to Lady Alice. This was already a promising beginning— Surely the butler would not have let him in if George had no chance of seeing her. Still, he did not know what to do with himself while he waited. Should he sit? He paced, then stopped. He walked over to the window, but then thought it would be too forward to take ownership of the room in that manner, and he returned to the centre. In a short while, Lady Alice entered the room, and his breath caught in his throat at the sight of her. Her smile reached her eyes. "'As you see, I have not left. How did you know?' She came forward, holding out her hand. He reached forward and lifted it to his lips, stopping only at the last minute, and bowing over it. He was going to make a great gaffe if he was not careful. "'Your brother. I saw him at the boxing saloon. We sparred together. We've done so twice. But then I ran into Mrs. Bell last night, and she told me that I might try to visit you this afternoon. On that information I came by.' Oh, heavens, I'm rambling. As an afterthought, he added, I am sorry to hear about your mother. Please sit, sir. Lady Alice gestured to the sofa and then sat at his side. It would indeed be a sorry plight, were it not for the fact that it is believed my mother will make a full recovery, and it has spared me from a very long trip I did not wish to make. Her maid had followed Lady Alice into the room, and she took a seat off to the side, giving them just enough privacy. "'I have been thinking about Miss Chauncey and Mr. Duckworth,' Lady Alice began. "'I wish to do something about their situation, "'but it has been difficult for me to assist "'since I am not easily able to leave my house. "'But I have had time to think, and I have come up with a plan. "'I think perhaps you might be able to help put it into practice.' "'George was enjoying looking at her face while she spoke. "'It was animated, more so than usual, "'although he would not take the credit for himself.' It must be enthusiasm over helping Duck and Miss Chauncey, or relief at not being sent away. In society, Lady Alice too often wore a closed expression, like a mask. 
He sprang to attention. She was waiting for him to respond. Tell me then, what can I do to help? A soft chuckle escaped her as she sent him a teasing glance. Have you capitulated then? You are supposed to say, no, I will do nothing to help your cause. I wish to win my bet. Is that no longer the case? George shrugged and looked at his hands before lifting his eyes to meet her gaze. I find that winning the bet is not worth having a friend who is miserable. Her look softened as their gaze held. Well, that is kind of you to say. It speaks well of you. The praise hit George's chest, and the warmth settled there, until he heard her next words. I'm thinking they should elope. He shot his gaze back at Lady Alice, speechless. He could not have heard her correctly. She went on. I know, I know, the most shocking thing in the world. Their reputation will never recover, and yet... She leaned forward, suddenly intent. She will make the biggest mistake of her life if she ties herself to Hicks when she loves Mr Duckworth. Do you think he would be willing to go through something like a flight to the border? I wager that Miss Chauncey will. Another wager, George said, bemused. Once the initial shock of the scandalous proposition was over, his mind began turning around her idea. Duck wouldn't care about that. George knew it. He would just want to win Miss Chauncey for himself, and by doing so, save her from a lifetime of misery. Oh, not a wager, just a suspicion, she replied. If I am able to see Miss Chauncey and sound her out on the plan, could you propose the idea to Mr Duckworth? Let us agree that society rules are rigid and must be respected at all times, but at the beginning of our wager we said no harm to any person, and those were the terms, and you must own that her marrying a man she cannot bear is a harm of no small proportion. George thought about this. I will ask Duck, and if it's something he wants to do, I will lend him my assistance. Lady Alice clapped her hands together. Excellent! I have no doubt that this is the right course of action. We must waste no time in bringing it about. Sounds reached them from outside of the drawing room, and as reality intruded, George felt it was time to leave. Lady Alice's company would not be the same with an audience. I must be going, he said, but I hope to bring word soon on how Duck means to proceed. Lady Alice stood, and he followed suit. They remained facing each other for an instant, frozen, and she showed herself as reluctant as he was to draw their interview to a close. Yes, please do let me know, she said, her gaze still on his. The tug inside tempted him to move closer and remain there, reluctant to leave her presence. Perhaps that was what prompted his next question. He wasn't sure what came over him, whether it was to tempt her or to test her or just to prolong their time together. But he rushed in without thinking. Have you found a woman you deem suitable to be my wife? As soon as the words were out, he regretted them. Lady Alice's expression closed and her gaze flitted away. I have thought of some possible candidates, she said, after a slight pause. But as our visit is at an end, you will have to come back to learn about them. If George could have physically beat himself for such a stupid remark, he would have done it. He meant to begin trying to win her heart, not make her think he was completely uninterested. He summoned a smile as he bowed. I will look forward to coming back. 19. When Mr. Clavering left, Alice told her maid she need not stay, and Daisy bobbed a curtsy before leaving the room. Alice resumed her seat, grateful for the quiet, and overcome with a strange sensation of numbness. When the servant had brought word that Mr. Clavering was waiting for her downstairs, the bolt of joy that had gone straight through her had caught her wholly by surprise. She tried to tell herself that it was because she wished to speak to him, about this project with Mr Duckworth and Miss Chauncey, but it was not the case. She was glad to see him for his own sake. There was something about Mr Clavering that gave colour to her life, and the fact that he had come to call made her wonder if perhaps she also brought colour to his. The visit had begun with pleasure at seeing him, and enthusiasm at laying a plan before him that was, to all intents and purposes, scandalous, but that she trusted he would take in stride. Then it had suddenly fallen flat. 
he had asked again about finding him a wife. Now, in the aftermath of the visit, and the tumult of feelings that had sprung up, she had to accept reality. Of course he could not have feelings for her, or he would not be asking her to find him a wife. Still, she had come to the conclusion that he was a worthy man, and she quite thought that if ever he loved her enough to marry her, perhaps he would not take a mistress. It was a naive wish, she supposed, but she could not help the hope that sprang up in her breast at the thought. Not that he was interested. It had been a stroke of luck that she had been able to speak to him about Miss Chauncey. In truth, ever since she'd had the idea, she had been wondering how to get this project of hers in motion, when she was practically stuck at home. She could hardly send a letter to Mr Duckworth to tell him to elope with Miss Chauncey. But now, all she had to do was ask Miss Chauncey to visit her, and Mr Clavering would take care of Mr Duckworth. She thought through all the aspects of his visit, recalling his expressions, and listing each response, so she might weigh it against what she knew of men. She had not even thought to offer him tea. Perhaps if she had, he would have stayed longer. Alice sat in the drawing-room for over an hour, and the tone of her mind was not easily restored. The next day Alice risked sending a note to Miss Chauncey, inviting her to visit. She was not sure why she hadn't thought of that before, but since she could not leave her house, she assumed Miss Chauncey would be unable to as well. However, within two hours, there was a knock on the door, and Alice received her in the drawing-room. Miss Chauncey had an ashen look to her face when she arrived, and she was unable to summon a smile as she greeted Alice. After they were seated, Alice observed, "'Your wedding is in less than a fortnight. I had hoped we might be able to speak before now. How are you finding this... this new phase of your life?' Miss Chauncey lifted her face and looked at her directly. "'I would rather die.' This was more serious than Alice had realised. It almost sounded as though she meant it. Alice furrowed her brows. "'Tell me something, if you will. Is it simply that you do not care for Lord Hicks, and you don't think you will find happiness as his wife? Or is there some other reason?' Miss Chauncey got a wild look to her eye. "'You know there is another reason. I have given my heart to Oswald. I don't like to talk about it. But, oh!' It's too late anyway. Not only do I abhor Lord Hicks and have no hope of finding happiness at his side. She shuddered. But he makes my flesh crawl. I cannot believe I was so close to happiness, only to have it snatched away. She stopped and looked straight ahead, clutching her hands together as she went silent and garnered her composure. I thought Oswald had feelings for me. They all but said he wished to marry me. But he never made a formal declaration, and now it is too late. He has disappeared from my life altogether, and I've not seen him since I accepted Lord Hicks's hand in marriage. Why did you accept? Alice asked. My mother was in the room when he asked me. She sent me such a pressured look. I had not enough will to refuse. My father has completely abandoned the affair into her hands, and she can and will make my life miserable. She already does but I thought that at least married I would not need to be around her. It was only when I'd given my acceptance and had time to think that I realised I would still have to be around Lord Hicks. When Alice heard Miss Chauncey's despair, she could only be disappointed in Mr Duckworth, in his hesitation to go after what he wanted. He had been too slow to speak to her in the first place, but could he not have approached her after the engagement had become public? What took so long? "'when it came to having the announcement put in the Gazette?' she asked. "'Miss Chauncey rolled her eyes. "'Oh, Lord Hicks kept forgetting to send it in. "'It drove my mother mad. "'But it allowed me to hope. "'That is, until the announcement went in, "'and even that was taken from me.' "'Alice stayed silent. "'Duck had missed a second opportunity "'in not approaching Miss Chauncey "'before the announcement had been published. "'Men!' They had so little resolution. If we were to contrive something... Alice stopped. This was very delicate. She was mingling in something that was absolutely none of her affair, with no hope that she would be able to deliver what she was proposing. But then, time was of the essence, and she feared for Miss Chauncey's sanity if the course of her future continued like this. There was only one way through this. She had to plunge ahead. 
If Mr. Duckworth were willing to marry you, could you bear the scandal of jilting one gentleman to elope with another? Miss Chauncey's gaze shot up, and a look of hope filled her expression to such a degree that Alice had to recant immediately. You will never forgive me if I am unable to bring about what I have just suggested, and I must tell you that I have absolutely no assurance that such a thing can happen, but I just need to know the state of your heart. If Mr. Duckworth were willing, would you be too? It means absolute scandal, and not being accepted in the tar for years at the very least. What do I care about the tar? Miss Chauncey's words were laced with vehemence. All I care about is my day-to-day -day life, and who I am going to be living it with. Yes, of course I will do it. If Oswald has the resolution to take the step, then so do I. Alice's heart beat quickly. She was meddling in something quite shocking, but she could not stop now. I expect to hear back from Mr. Clavering about the state of Mr. Duckworth's heart, and I promise to send for you as soon as I have word. The only question is how we shall bring this about. As of now, my mother's condition has made it difficult for me to leave the house, so I hope you will be able to return to discuss plans. Miss Chauncey bit her lip and stared at Alice, her eyes unseeing, until she arrived at a decision. My mother does not leave my side. The only reason she allowed me to come here is because it is your house, and she cares about the Duchess's opinion. She approves of our being great friends. She made a face that Alice was easily able to understand. It was not that Miss Chauncey disliked her, but she did not approve of her mother's encroaching ways. Miss Chauncey continued. The maid who came with me will report back to her that I came here and met with you, and my mother will be satisfied. It becomes more complicated if I go anywhere else than here. As much as Alice might want to, she could not arrange for Mr. Duckworth and Miss Chauncey to meet here. She could not have the scandal attached in any way to her father's residence. Miss Chauncey remained deep in thought for a moment, then met Alice's gaze. But if Oswald is willing, it might be achieved. The seamstress will do a final fitting the day before the wedding. My mother has already told me she will not accompany me for that, as she has too many things to see to for the wedding breakfast. I can have the maid wait for me in the front of the shop, while I am in the dressing rooms in the back. They have to make final touches to both the wedding dress and the manteau. The manteau will take more work and there is a door in the back of the shop that leads to the alley. Alice looked at her in confusion. How do you know such a thing? They once opened it for some fresh air, and I could see the alley from where I sat. The last time I had my fitting, they left me alone for quite some time, or twenty minutes at least. If Mr. Duckworth brings the carriage to the alley, I will simply leave when the seamstress takes my manteau to embellish. I will go at my first chance, if he can manage to wait for me there. Alice nodded slowly. That could work. I will tell him. Miss Chauncey stood. If this succeeds, I will be eternally in your debt. Her voice throbbed with suppressed emotion. And if it does not succeed, I promise not to hold it against you. That is more assurance than I deserve. What I propose carries great risk. But I am glad to hear it, Alice said. She clasped Miss Chauncey's hand hoping they were taking the right course of action. Miss Chauncey left, and Alice was alone once again to think and question the wisdom of her plan. She hoped Mr Clavering planned to come again, since she could hardly send him a note. He did return the next day, but she was not at home to receive him. When he came the day after that, Alice was in the drawing-room waiting for him. She had had time to prepare her mind to receive him in the proper fashion, with no foolish sentimentality. However, one look at his face caused her heart to start beating faster. She particularly loved his face. There was a warmth and kindness to his eyes that caused her to want to get lost in them. It didn't help that he looked at her in such a particular way, as if he was searching to discover something new about her. At least, it did not help when she wished to remain indifferent to him. Mr Clavering entered the drawing-room, and Alice met him there, too anxious to offer him a seat. He cleared his throat. Duck said yes without hesitation. He is ready to go. He only asks when and where. I wished to come to you yesterday, but your butler said you were out. Yes, it was the stupidest thing, Alice replied. It was the first time I'd left my house in days. My mother asked me to go to Hookham's to choose something for her to read, and it was just at the time you called. I did get your card. 
Alice then relayed the instructions that Miss Chauncey had given her regarding the elopement, and Mr. Clavering mused over them. "'I think I know that seamstress's shop. I will have a look for how to access the back alley so I can help Duck find it.' Alice was filled with sudden suspicion. "'You know the arrangements of a seamstress's shop. Was it for your mistress?' Mr. Clavering didn't answer right away, but looked at her strangely. His unspoken inquiry grew uncomfortable, and she glanced away. "'I know it is inappropriate for a lady to inquire of these things from a gentleman.' "'I went with my sister,' he said quietly. Her heart lightened at his words, but she was consumed with embarrassment for having been so transparent. "'I think they will be able to manage this with just a little help,' she said, trying to shake off the unnerving sensation of being under Mr. Clavering's focused gaze. "'I think I will not feel so guilty about what I'm proposing, if only I can see them happy together.' Mr. Clavering didn't respond right away, and she peeked up at him. He stepped closer and reached out for her hand. "'Alice, I—' The door opened, and her brother's valet stepped into the room. He stopped short when he saw Mr. Clavering. "'What is it, Maxwell?' Alice was uneasy. It was not worried that he would betray her for being alone in the drawing-room with a man, for Bart had told her the valet was tight-lipped, but he had an urgent look to his face— that she was not accustomed to. My lady, might I have a word with you? Alice looked at Mr. Clavering. Stay here for a moment. She went over to the valet, who spoke in an urgent whisper. I would not trouble you, but I fear that Lord Anley has taken a drastic step, and although he's no longer a boy, I do not feel I should be doing my duty if I did not raise an alarm. Your father is not here, and your mother is unwell. What is it? Alice's heart was filled with foreboding. Lord Anley took his shaving kit and a portmanteau and has left the house without a word. I've not seen him in two days, and he missed his appointment today with his tailor, although he will sometimes be out for the night. Maxwell stopped short and looked uncomfortable. I have reason to believe. A valet knows a great deal more than one thinks, simply by observing the more intimate matters, that he's gone off with that woman. He will wish to relieve me in my position for my lack of confidentiality, but I would rather do my duty and save the Marquis from sure ruin than retain it. "'Which way do you think he's gone?' she asked. "'There is only one possible way,' Maxwell replied, his voice ominous. He pointed up. "'North.' Alice gasped and turned as Mr. Clavering started toward her. "'Lady Alice, what is it?' He came to her side. Forgive me, this is perhaps a personal matter, but if I can be of assistance. Alice turned to the valet. Maxwell, it was good of you to bring this news to me, and I will see to it that my brother has no cause to doubt your loyalty to him. I will tell you what must be done as soon as I have decided. That is all for now. When the valet left, she turned to Mr. Clavering and repeated what he had said. I believe my brother will end up married to that woman. Maxwell seems to think they're headed to Scotland. Mr. Clavering stared at her in stunned silence. Then he shook his head at her reaction, giving her a reassuring smile. She stood, confused, and he reached for her hand. My dear Lady Alice, and yes, please allow me to say dear, even though you think it odiously condescending. I don't think the situation is as dire as that. In fact, I think your brother's valet is making a great cake of himself— if he thinks Lord Anley is going to fly to the border with a woman of low repute. Has the valet been with your family since your brother was a boy? When she nodded, he went on. That would explain it. It is simply not done. She is his mistress, and Lord Anley is perhaps causing tongues to wag by his infatuation. But he is not in danger. I assure you, he is not. Alice started to feel some measure of relief, even as she realised that, as a man of the world, Mr. Clavering must surely know. She supposed he would never feel any inclination to marry his mistress. Would you look for him, and see if you can find him, just to be sure? Perhaps you could say I wish to see him, and I'll think of some trumpery reason. She looked down, and noticed he still held her hand. She wanted to slip it out of his grasp, but he held on to it. I will look for him, if only to reassure you and I will bring you word of what Duck says about our plan. 
for whatever you need, I am at your service. Mr. Clavering smiled at her in such a kind, reassuring way. She had a sudden urge to throw herself into his arms. It was a strange thing, but Alice felt that if he were holding her, nothing in this world could cause her any more trouble. After a moment, he let go of her hand and gave a small bow. I will come find you as soon as I know more. 20. George left Lady Alice's presence, seized with determination. It was more than that. It was excitement, because he was sure that Lady Alice had feelings for him as well. It had been a spontaneous gesture to take her hand in his, and hold it there. But she had not pulled away, and had met his gaze shyly. A current had passed between them that he was not imagining, and now he could think of nothing else. When he had made this inconsequential wager with Lady Alice, his only thought, apart from appreciating his conversation with a charming young woman, who was not on the catch for a husband, had been for his bachelorhood. His immediate goal had been to protect a lifestyle which offered freedom and fun, far from the constraints he wished to avoid. Never would he have believed it, had someone told him he would soon be hastening his friend into the matrimonial state, thereby losing his own bet, and that by doing so he would be aiding in an elopement and thus committing the greatest breach in society. Not only this, but that he would choose to exchange his bachelorhood for a life of marriage in the desperate hope that the woman he loved returned his regard. These thoughts crossed George's mind as he drove his phaeton east from the Duke of Carr's residence. A chuckle escaped him, causing his footman to look at him strangely. George was clearly going mad. The first stop was to Pall Mall, to visit Madame Truffle's establishment, to see if he could spot the back door Lady Alice had spoken of. He needed to present a solid plan to Duck. He easily found her shop near the corner of Pall Mall Street and Coxpur, and it required only a little navigation to turn and see the alley and the door at the end that must be the back of Madame Truffle's shop. It even had a wider space in the middle, where a coach could be turned. This could work, he was sure of it. The alley was completely deserted. No one would see Duck there. His footman was accustomed to George's doing things on a lark, and did not ask why he had driven there, only to turn around in the tight space and navigate his way back out again. When they reached Duck's residence, George left his horses with the footman, and once inside, ran up the steps and knocked on his friend's door. There was no answer. George was about to leave, when the door cracked open, and Duck appeared, still wearing his dressing gown. George lifted his hand in salutation before entering. You need to shave, man, and get dressed. No sense in sitting around in the dismals like this. And open your blinds. Where is your valet? Lady Alice has spoken with Miss Chauncey. Duck came alive at the news. Has she? Will Gwen have me? Have you been able to find a way? George took a seat and gestured for Duck to do so as well. Have you had anything to eat? You look awful, and you need to be in better looks than that if you're going to carry this off. Have some dignity. George smiled, having pity on his friend. Yes, Lady Alice was able to speak to Miss Chauncey, and she has an idea that I think will work. Duck leaned forward, and the eager look on his face settled any doubts in George's mind about assisting in the elopement. The man was in love, and meant to win his bride. She has a dress fitting on Tuesday, the day before her wedding. It's at an establishment I know of because I've taken Philippa there when Maria was too busy. A Madame Truffle on Pall Mall and Coxpur. George looked at Duck expectantly, but his friend shook his head. I don't know it. There's an alley that leads to the back door of the Modiste. When I took Philippa, I did not see it, obviously, as I remained in the front of the shop. But I've just had a look, and it will serve the purpose. Miss Chauncey believes she will be able to slip out of the door while they're fixing her manteau. Duck looked like he was going to interrupt, but then gestured for George to continue. What we need is for you to have the carriage outside in the alley. In that way, when she comes out, she can quickly make her escape. We have to time it perfectly, so she's not intercepted and no one sees where she's gone. I'll be there to help, but I'll need to stay out of sight. I cannot be connected to her flight, and there would be the devil to pay. Duck stood and began pacing. No, no, you cannot be seen there. The risk must fall on me. Can you get your hands on a coach? George asked him. 
and arrange for the change of horses on the stages there. Do you need any blunt? George was fairly certain his friend was beforehand in the world, and Duck confirmed it for him. I'm plump in the pocket. He gave George a wry smile. Honestly, if Mrs Chauncey were not so hungry for a title, I would be considered quite a good catch. I know it, George said, giving him a sympathetic smile. There was little one could do if the mamma was bent on a peer for her son-in-law. Duck went over to his wardrobe and threw open the narrow doors, perusing its contents. He stopped and looked at George, his brows furrowed. Why are you helping me? You didn't even want me to get married. George was only just beginning to realise how selfish he had been. You're my friend. Of course I will help you. In fact, I will do anything within my power to assist you. If I did not give you that impression before, then I'm sorry. He paused, but with Duck still looking perplexed, he had the need to express all these new feelings bubbling up inside of him. I suppose, for the first time in my life, I can understand what you're going through, he admitted at last. I find, although it was against my will, that I'm quite taken with Lady Alice. Duck's look cleared, and he turned back to selecting a waistcoat. Of course you are. I believe you're the last one to have noticed it. The statement irritated George. He'd thought he was being amazingly circumspect, only to find out that his feelings were commonly known. No one would realise what it would cost him to willingly put aside his bachelorhood. Such sacrifice should be rewarded. Duck saw his frustration and grinned, even if his grin looked a little sickly. He was, after all, not yet out of the woods with his own affair. I know exactly how you feel. I'd not expected to enter into this course of action, attempting marriage by elopement, and for the second time if you count Mary Morgan, which we shall decidedly not. I will be thankful indeed if the rest of my life is perfectly boring by comparison. This is more excitement than I find palatable. George thought back to Lady Alice. She had been wearing a dress the colour of rust, with a narrow border of ivory trim around the bodice that showed off her flawless complexion. It drew one's eye to her lips of a near colour, naturally dark, and ready to be kissed. For my part, he mused, I hope the excitement is only beginning. George's work was not done. The most essential step had been to communicate to Duck what the plan was. But now he needed to find Lord Anley for Lady Alice's peace of mind. His first stop was at Jackson's, but he did not find Lord Anley at the gymnasium. George did not want to be forward and seek the man out at his place of residence, which was known to be currently at Mary Morgan's, but he was ready to do anything to alleviate Lady Alice's mind. Fortunately, such a step was not necessary, for as soon as he entered White's, he found Lord Anley sitting at a small table by himself, wearing an expression that would keep away anyone with a particle of sense. This was something George did not always possess, and he went up to the Marquis at his table and took the chair opposite. Anley stared at him with hard, narrow eyes. I'd like to be alone, if you please. George paused before responding. He did not wish to reveal that he had spoken to Lady Alice and that he was here on her behalf, nor could he give up his purpose when he was this close. Forgive my intrusion. George hesitated, but did not leave the table. He came to the conclusion that he could not do this without revealing at least a bit of his conversation with Lady Alice. He would avoid mentioning the valet's concerns, though, which might jeopardise the man's position. I came only with the aim of lending you my services, or my ear, if you should wish for either. I believe your sister is concerned about you. Lord Anley shot his head up, and the look he gave George was one of deep irritation. I wish you will not bring my sister into this. What right have you? None at all, George said cheerfully. He could not take offence at Lord Anley. He knew he was crossing a line. I only came to tell you that your sister expressed her worries concerning you, and I reassured her. I said you were perfectly capable of seeing to your own affairs. I told her your fields of interest were no different than other gentlemen your age. To George's relief, the Marquis seemed to relax at his words. At last, someone speaks with sense. Apart from my friends, and sometimes even they, everyone considers me to be a child who requires instruction in the art of dalliance. And that you don't need, George sympathised. I don't. 
I'm heir to the dukedom. I know precisely what I'm doing. Miss Morgan is not a marital prospect and never has been. It doesn't mean I can't enjoy her company. And now I have everyone, including my father, trying to manage my business for me. Andy's look shuttered, followed by a flush of self-consciousness. I don't know what caused me to say all of that to you. I beg you will keep this discussion between the two of us. I don't generally run off at the mouth in such a way. You have my word, George said. He assessed the Marquis. I don't believe that those who care about you are concerned by your failure to know what is required of you. George took a breath, knowing he had to tread carefully in what he was about to say. He might have private convictions about fidelity, but they ran countercurrent to the mores of the day. He did not want to lose his ability to speak to Anley's heart by being overly pious. It would only irritate him. I believe the thing your intimates are protesting has more to do with the woman herself than it does with your inability to handle your affairs. Anley looked at George with hooded eyes. I know what Miss Morgan is. She is enticing, but that does not mean I am ensnared. I am merely enjoying what is being offered, as men have done before me. George did not speak. Once again he was at odds with others in his convictions. He just couldn't understand the desire to unite oneself to a woman who would not touch one's heart, and who could certainly not be faithful. His silence seemed to encourage Lord Anley to share even more, because he studied George before saying, "'Since we are carrying on a private conversation, I will tell you that she's requested that I accompany her on her tour of Paris and Rome, where she is scheduled to perform.' George thought about Anley removing his personal effects from home and wondered whether he had decided to go. And what did you reply? I told her no. I was invited to see a fight in Sussex and I left London with my friend for a few days. In the end she delayed her tour and I suppose it was with the objective to try to persuade me. But it has not tempted me and it won't. You can tell Alice that I know what I'm about if you wish, if she's worried or asks you. My parents will have to figure it out on their own. They have not become aware that I am now a man grown and have no need to run my comings and goings by them. George smiled. Lord Anley had some growing to do and perhaps some progress in humility to make, but he was not naive. George had confidence that he would turn out fine. I will keep that in mind, should I see Lady Alice. He had only one more thing to say. If he did not do so now, he feared he would lose his chance. I wish to tell you that I am not unacquainted with Mary Morgan. An expression like jealousy crossed Anley's features, for all he had sworn he was not ensnared. You are an intimate of hers, are you? She's not mentioned you. No, not that. Taking mistresses is not something quite in my line. In fact, I have never done so. There, George had said it and that was as close as he would come to explaining his convictions. He went on. But my good friend Oswald Duckworth was caught in her snares several years back, and I should say he was not as up to snuff as you are. He nearly ran off with her, and would have done so had she not received a more interesting offer. My friend is wealthy but not titled, George explained. I only mention it if the knowledge can serve you in some way. Anley's expression turned sober. Well, she suggested the same to me before she asked me to accompany her on the tour. I'm under no illusion as to her ultimate goals, he said, then fell silent. Judging from the man's expression, George thought that perhaps Anley had still been harbouring some illusion and was trying to talk himself down. He hoped that recounting Duck's experience had severed those final ties. Well, I shall leave you. I hope to see you at Jackson's soon. Anley met his gaze briefly and nodded before returning to stare at the glass that rested in front of him on the table. He picked it up and swirled its contents, then set the glass back down without drinking. George could only hope that with all Anley had to think about, their conversation might bear fruit in the days to come. 21. The Duchess requested that Alice make another trip to Hookham's to return one book and borrow two others, and Alice seized the opportunity to go out, bringing Daisy with her. Her mother would spend the afternoon napping, and Alice decided to prolong her outing and pay a call on Miss Chauncey. This turned out to be less effective than sending a note inviting her to call, 
because Mrs Chauncey planted herself in the drawing-room before Alice had had time to remove her bonnet. "'Please sit, Lady Alice,' Mrs Chauncey said. "'As soon as I heard you had done us the honour of paying a visit, I sent for tea. I hope you will feel at ease to disregard the social conventions and stay as long as you would like. I am sure you and Gwendolen must have a million things to talk about, what with her upcoming nuptials.' "'Of course,' Alice replied, but she was not able to say more. "'As for the wedding celebrations,' Mrs Chauncey continued, "'I am overseeing all the details myself. "'The wedding breakfast is sure to rival any other party London can offer this season.' "'How wonderful,' Alice murmured. "'Miss Chauncey exchanged an apologetic look with Alice, "'and her mother sat as she continued her monologue. "'As Gwendolyn is my last daughter to marry, "'you must surely understand how gratified I am "'for her to have made such a brilliant alliance.' I have been urging her to stay inside, so that her complexion might not darken. Nothing must ruin the effect of her happy day. "'How are you, Miss Chauncey?' Alice asked, hoping to hear more from the person she had actually come to visit. "'Oh, I dare say you two are such friends that you might call her Gwendolyn. Of course, I understand you cannot return the courtesy and have her call you by your given name, but such things would not weigh with her, I assure you.' "'You may call me Gwen,' Miss Chauncey said. In a tone of such dignified resolve, Alice could almost not believe she came from the same stock as her mother. She made a private resolution that Gwen could call her Alice when it was just the two of them, but not in front of Mrs Chauncey, whom she hoped to avoid as much as possible. The servant brought the tea platter in, and Mrs Chauncey went to fetch the leaves, then measured and stirred them into the boiling water. "'How do you take your tea, my lady?' she asked. "Um, "'One sugar, ma'am.' Alice accepted the cup and stirred in the sugar while her mind raced. She'd had no notion of how difficult it would be to carry on a private conversation with Gwen. How would she see if all was going according to plan? Alice took a sip of the tea and set her cup down, feigning ignorance of the wedding details. "'And when is the happy event to be again?' This question was directed at Mrs Chauncey, as she would be the only one to find it happy. In just four days' time, Lord Hicks was as eager as we were to have the ceremony as soon as it could be arranged. He's just pining for Gwendolyn here. Once he and Mr Chauncey negotiated the settlements, why, nothing could stop him from declaring that they must be married the first available day after the bans had been properly read. Gwen drank the tea her mother had given her, but the light had gone out of her. Alice did not know how she would be able to tell her that Mr Duckworth had agreed to the idea of eloping, with all the eagerness of a passionate suitor that Gwen could wish for. She hadn't dared to send her a letter, for fear it might be read. It was imperative she be given a chance to speak with her. "'What gown shall you wear for the ceremony?' This was a safer topic, and Mrs Chauncey was delighted to expound on its charm. She did so in minute detail for ten minutes, before setting her teacup down in a hurry so that it clattered on the plate." "'As a matter of fact, Gwendolyn, you must show her your dress. "'Oh, do go and bring it down. "'Lady Alice, we will give you a privileged look at what she will wear. "'In fact,' she paused, her eyes calculating. "'Why have we not sent you an invitation? "'Of course you must be present for such a momentous occasion "'now that you and my daughter have become so close.' "'I'm afraid my mother has need of me these days,' Alice began. "'Ah, oh, yes, I did not think,' Mrs Chauncey interjected. "'Then all the more reason to show your friend your gown, Gwendolyn.' "'Gwen's demeanour was a strong contrast to her mother's excitement. "'She took another sip and deliberately set her teacup down, "'allowing silence to fill the room. "'Mamma, I fear that the gown will gather dirt if I bring it down. "'Permit me instead to bring Lady Alice to my room "'so she might see it where it is hanging.' "'Alice could see Mrs Chauncey's hesitation.' The woman did not want to miss out on any part of their conversation, but she probably wished to further the friendship, which would be to her advantage. And such intimacy would be easier accomplished with just the two young women. At last she nodded. "'Oh, you are perfectly right, my dear. You two young ladies go and enjoy yourselves.' Mrs Chauncey picked up a macaron from the plate and took a bite as Alice stood and followed Gwen out of the door. She exhaled quietly, "'relieved that she had been given this chance. "'They walked past the footman, "'and as they turned to go up the stairs, "'Gwen gave a discreet gesture for Alice to keep her silence. "'The admonition was not needed. "'It was hard to know which servants one could trust. 
As soon as they reached Gwen's room, Gwen sent out the maid, who had been carefully wrapping her clothes in silver paper. She waited for a moment before speaking, and Alice listened as well, to make sure no one hovered in the corridor. Well, that reminds me, Alice said, her eyes on the packed clothing. I had forgotten about your trunk, but you will need it. I wonder if there is a servant loyal enough, so Oswald has said yes then. Gwen looked at her with big eyes, the fear and anticipation writ large on her face. I have not dared to hope. He said yes, Alice reassured her. I am sorry I did not come earlier. I did not risk sending word in case my letter was intercepted, and I had hoped you might pay me a visit to occasion less talk, but you did not come. My mother has been growing increasingly protective. She senses my unhappiness, and although that would not cause her to release me from a very painful betrothal, she keeps her eye on me, probably to ensure I will not flee. Alice glanced at the trunk again, and Gwen shook her head. Please do not think of it. I don't dare ask any of my servants to perform the task. They will betray me, and nothing can stop my flight. I must marry Oswald. Alice thought for a minute. She could see the dilemma, but a woman needed her things, nightclothes, dresses, tooth powder. I will provide you with some clothes and basic necessities. My sister is of your size, and she has left some gowns for me that need to be altered, but I dare say no one will notice if I give one or two away. Mind that you don't wear them in London after the marriage, though. My mother and sisters will recognise them, and others might as well. I will never return to London, Gwen said her voice firm. Oz has told me about his estate. We will go there. A wise idea, Alice said. But do not forget his best friends are in London. While you won't come right away until some of the talk has died down, you will eventually wish to come, so he might see his friends. And although I cannot allow my name to be associated with your elopement, despite the fact that it was my idea, and I can see that I'm a beastly friend, stopping short of showing my full support— I will continue to be your friend when you return. I will not cut you from my acquaintance, no matter the talk, and of that I give you my word. I am a duke's daughter, and have some influence after all. You are not a beastly friend. Gwen reached for Alice's hand. Words cannot express my gratitude. You have saved me from a lifetime of misery. If something happens to hinder our plans, I will go out of my mind with grief, I believe, but I will remember you with gratitude. And if we succeed... She pulled her hand away, shaking her head. I can find no words adequate enough, but I will be forever in your debt. The maid knocked on the door. Miss, your mother said that she has had more hot water brought up so you might have tea that is warm. We will be done in a minute. Gwen breathed out and said more quietly. Well, my minutes of freedom are over. At least show me your dress, Alice said. Gwen frowned. Why do you want to see it? It's a dress meant for a ceremony with Lord Hicks. Alice replied in a low tone. But if all goes well, it will be worn for your ceremony with Mr. Duckworth. She arched a brow and was rewarded with a smile, the first one she had seen in some time. If nothing else, Mrs. Chauncey had good taste in gowns. The yellow cloth and green silk threads would complement the brown tints of Gwen's hair and eyes. It was made with fine silk, and Alice could picture how beautiful she would be wearing such a dress. Mr. Duckworth's efforts would be amply rewarded. They walked toward the door, and Gwen slipped her arm through Alice's. You have given me such hope, Lady Alice. She stopped and smiled at Gwen. When we are not in the presence of your mother, and I beg you will understand this distinction, you may call me Alice. Gwen smiled in answer and squeezed Alice's arm to her side. Alice had hoped Mr Clavering would come the same day or the next so he might tell her about her brother. He came neither, but did send another bouquet of flowers with a note that said little more than that he thought he had been successful. It was not until two days later that Daisy knocked on the door and popped her head in to warn Alice of a visitor. "'It is Mr Clavering come to see you, miss.' The maid had something like a grin on her face. Alice would have corrected her for impertinence had she been able to repress her own smile. Her heart positively leapt. She would see him at last and learn what had happened with her brother, then coordinate the plans for Mr Duckworth and Gwen. 
Why had Mr. Clavering not come sooner? He must have known she wanted him. When Alice came into the drawing room, Mr. Clavering quickly closed the distance to where she stood, her maid trailing behind her. He stopped at the last minute and bowed, his eyes not leaving her face. Daisy moved to the corner of the room, and Alice had cause to appreciate the timing of her mother's fall. She never would have been allowed to visit with Mr. Clavering and talk as freely had her mother been here, and she never would have been left alone. "'Will you sit?' she asked him, and he nodded, following her over to a set of chairs at some distance from her maid. Alice drank in the sight of his windswept hair and the boyish dimples that came out when he grinned. Her mouth was dry with nerves. "'I always forget to offer tea. Would you like some?' He shook his head. "'You received my note?' "'I did. You needn't have sent a coded message, although I did appreciate the flowers. Thankfully my family does not have the habit of opening my letters. I could not be sure, and I did not want to give your brother away.' He glanced at her maid, a question in her eyes. Alice shook her head. "'She cannot hear us.' She paused and then said, "'So do tell me what happened.' Mr. Clavering took a deep breath and smiled at her, provoking a smile of her own. She liked him and was discovering other, deeper feelings that were all so new. "'I know you will want to hear on both subjects. Regarding your brother, I cannot give you the particulars of our conversation, but he wished for me to assure you that he knows what he is doing.' Alice widened her eyes. "'You told him that you'd spoken to me?' Mr. Clavering looked pained. I did not tell him about his valet's concern, but I could not avoid bringing up your name because he did not mince words when he told me to shove off. I needed some leverage to show him that I had a right to be concerned, if only for your sake. Alice bit her lip and thought about what he'd said. She could readily believe her brother would have sent Mr. Clavering off had Mr. Clavering not given the assurance that he was not meddling in Bart's affairs uninvited. She pressed her lips together and met his gaze. Very well. He said I need not worry. What do you say? Do you believe him? Mr. Clavering did not jump to reassure her right away, which she appreciated. He took the time to think about it. I believe so. I don't believe he is quite in the danger his benefactors think him. He is sowing his wild oats and will come to his senses with age. He doesn't seem like a loose fish to me. I can only guess at your meaning, Alice replied, unable to hinder her smile, though she wished to be indignant. Will he return home, do you think? Mr. Clavering's look held compassion. Lady Alice, you must not think your brother will ever truly return home. He is a man, or at least on his way to becoming one. He must naturally sever some of the ties with your family as he forges his own path. The sooner your family accepts him as such, the sooner he will return, at least with his affection. Alice nodded. She instinctively knew this to be true, although she already missed the brother of her youth. She took a deep breath. And Mr. Duckworth? Mr. Duckworth will be there tomorrow at ten o'clock, as you instructed. He has arranged everything. Oh, that is excellent. There was this good news, at least. When I did not receive a visit from Miss Chauncey, I decided to pay her one of my own. Her mother remained fixed at her side, but at last I was able to see the gown she will wear for her wedding to Lord Hicks. She's going through with the wedding. He knit his brows in concern. Duck has already planned the whole thing. He hired a coach and four for their first stop outside of London. Alice gave him a patient look. No, Mr. Clavering, but Miss Chauncey could hardly tell her mother she is to marry Mr. Duckworth. The gown was the perfect excuse to leave the room and discuss the plan. I will have to send Daisy with a bundle of items, since Gwen will have nothing of her own. We can't precisely ask her maid to prepare a trunk but I do not know where I should send the effects. Mr. Clavering thought for a minute. Your maid had better take the bundle to Philippa, and I'll make sure she's there tomorrow morning to receive it. She will get it to me, and the whole thing will create no cause for tongues to wag should anyone put the pieces together. We must not be associated in making the scandal, or we will never be able to patch it up when it's done. Relieved at his understanding, Alice nodded. I could not agree with you more, I said as much to Gwen. Now we just have to trust her to manage the trip to the dressmakers so she might slip away at the right moment. 
I'm sure if she is determined enough, nothing will stop her, and I know nothing will stop Duck. Mr. Clavering rested his gaze on her, and an undercurrent of tension filled the air. She longed to say something, or longed for something else, but did not know quite what. I should go, Mr. Clavering said at last. Alice got to her feet, her spirits low. The visit had not satisfied her. It was too quick, and nothing had been said that she could hold on to. Nothing about the shift that was happening in their relationship. They walked to the door, but he did not leave. At last, he held out his two hands, and she placed hers in them. Mr. Clavering glanced over at her maid, and Alice followed his gaze. Daisy had turned away and was studying the curtains. He leaned in, and the gesture sent a thrill through her. She had never desired for a man to stand so near, especially facing her. It should be an invasion of her intimacy. But it was not. She welcomed it. His words were low, and they caused that sensation she was coming to know, the fluttering in her belly that sent her heart racing. There is something about Duck's position I envy. Alice looked up at him, faltering, though their hands were still clasped. She swallowed hard. She had neglected her duty to find a woman who would suit him. Her mind had simply shut out the possibility. It did not permit it. It was time to confess. Mr. Clavering, I cannot think of a single woman who would suit you as your wife. Can you not? His voice was low and throaty, and she could barely breathe. He flicked his gaze again across the room to where her maid was. He released her hands and lifted his to lay his fingers on her cheek. I can think of only one, Alice. Mr. Clavering took one step forward, and the absence of distance between them seemed to suck all the air from her lungs. He leaned down, and she lifted her face naturally to meet his. He touched his lips to hers, and stepped back almost instantly. Alice forced air into her lungs. Then he bowed and left the room. Twenty-two. Early the next morning, George went to Philippa's house to fetch the belongings Lady Alice had promised to have delivered for Miss Chauncey's flight. He wished he could have got them directly from her to see how she fared. He had called her Alice, and she hadn't protested. It had slipped out with their growing intimacy. He had kissed her, and she had not pulled away. He had tasted her lips. Had she also felt the world pause when their lips touched? that every sensation had shouted with vibrancy. He could think of almost nothing else. She had given him no promises, but surely she could not hold him at arm's length even now. "'This is it,' Philippa said, descending the stairs with a simple bundle in her arms. It was wrapped in cloth and tied with ribbon. Lady Alice came and brought it herself, along with her maid, and promised that it had all the essentials Miss Chauncey would need. You must keep me informed of the situation.' George accepted the bundle, wishing he had come earlier. He might have seen Alice. Does Jack know? Philippa nodded. I don't keep things from my husband. You know he can be trusted. I do. He was not overly shocked, I hope. George lifted his brows, not truly worried. <laughs> Little shocks my husband, Philippa replied. I suppose not, being married to you. George left the drawing-room and headed down the hall, where a footman standing in attendance opened the door. He had not missed his sister's grin. He took a hackney to Coxpur, near the alley where Duck was to wait. He paid the driver, then had a glimpse of the alley. In it, the closed coach faced the correct way for a quick exit, with Duck's groom in the front, holding the reins. George was thankful for the good weather that would not make it a misery to travel. The couple had a week's journey ahead of them. He saluted the groom, then pulled open the door to the coach, causing Duck to jump. He was twisted in the seat, facing the back door to the modiste, which could be seen through the window of the coach. For once, George had no desire to tease. His friend was already suffering enough from nerves. Oh, you're here, Duck said, then turned back to his surveillance, falling into a tense silence. He remained perfectly still and clenched his jaw as he continued to stare out of the window. George patted his shoulder. Nothing will hinder her, Duck. She will be here as planned. 
Lady Alice said that Miss Chauncey's determination left her in no doubt of your intended's being where she said she would be. You're not going to be married to some weak miss who does not know her own mind. Despite his grey pallor, Dutt laughed. Oh, I know that. I've known it from the very first night we were paired together at cards. I cannot believe she will have me. George appreciated this rare spurt of humility in his friend. Dutt was not generally one to doubt himself, and probably would not even now, were it not for that unfortunate incident with Mary Morgan that had stolen his confidence in finding someone true. Perhaps that had done some good, after all, if only to help him distinguish what truly mattered. George turned to look through the window, but there was no point in them both staring. One was enough. Facing forward again, he pulled the bundle from his lap and put it on the seat between them, not bothering to break the silence. He wondered what Alice was doing right now. She was likely sitting at home, just waiting for the news that all had gone well. There was little else she could do without a chaperone, and he was amazed she had managed to get away to visit his sister. George frowned as he mulled over how restricted her movements were. How hard it must be as a woman to bear having so little freedom. If Alice were married, she could go wherever she pleased. If she were married to him, he would never hinder her from anything she set her mind to. Perhaps, just perhaps, Alice was softening and considering him in the role of a husband. As for George, he was doing the reverse. He needed no softening at all. His resolve was only growing firmer. He had to try his luck with her. He could not risk making the same mistake as Duck and letting this woman slip through his fingers without declaring how he felt. If his initial reticence had been because it was unsportsmanlike to go counter to Alice's wishes, he no longer thought that way. It was also not sportsmanlike, in fact it was even worse, to know how he felt, and have a hint of how she felt, and still not make a push. Duck froze before drawing a sharp breath. Heavens, he whispered. There she is. In a split second Duck was out of the carriage, and George exited from the other side. He glanced around the alley to make sure no one had seen them, and there was no one in sight. There were not even windows on the building facades in the alley, except for one, and it was shuttered. Miss Chauncey ran toward Duck, her face white with a look of terror mixed with fierce determination splashed across her features. She was wearing a yellow dress, embellished throughout with intricate green leaves. Oswald, she breathed out. Duck put his arm around her and hurried her to the carriage. He tucked her into the coach and slammed the door shut, then circled to the other side. George opened the door that Duck had just shut and peered in. Miss Chauncey, give me word to send to Lady Alice. Did everything go off as planned? I believe so. I had my mother's maid wait in the front of the shop. The seamstress wanted me to leave so she could finish the manteau and have it sent to me, but I refused. She warned me that it would take her at least a quarter of an hour to make the last-minute adjustments, and very likely more. Oh, but I will feel much better if we can be off without being spotted. You heard the lady, Duck said impatiently, sitting next to her his eyes pleading for George to understand and forgive his brusque tone. George reached across the seat to shake Duck's hand and gave him a wink. Best be off, then. He tapped the side of the carriage, which sped away. His shoulders tense, George looked around one last time and still saw no one. It would not do for him to be seen in the vicinity. He could have nothing to do with this elopement. His reputation would likely never recover as any proper gentleman should be stopping an elopement, not aiding one. However, he could not leave without seeing how this played out, so he had something to report to Alice. He walked to the end of the alley and stepped out of sight, pressing his lips together. Never mind the question of what it meant to be a gentleman. This was Duck's life, and he would not have stopped their flight for the world. It would ease Alice's mind to know how long it was before Miss Chauncey's absence was noted, and George decided he would stay to find out. Coxburgh Street crossed with the broader Pall Mall, and there were people moving to and from in both directions as they went about their business. Nobody glanced at the closed carriage driving off. George stood to the side of the intersection, waiting to see what might happen. Clavering! Lord Anley appeared from George's left, and walked forward, an air of surprise on his face. He came to where George was standing, "'What are you doing here in this part of town?' "'He looked at him suspiciously. "'This is not about me, I hope.' 
This is the area where a certain name we are both familiar with has her residence. George shook his head. I give you my word. My presence here has nothing to do with you. Or that. I trust you to handle your own affairs as you see fit. Good. The Marquis folded his arms over his chest. Then he relaxed his stance, and a reluctant smile came over his face. As a matter of fact, I've just come from ending things with her. Did you? Alice would be so relieved when news reached her that her brother had ended the affair. George was careful not to show any reaction to the news, and merely lifted a brow. And how did she take things? Lord Anley shrugged, looking much like a boy. A reluctant smile appeared on his face. There was an abundance of weeping. Do you know, I'm beginning to think she's not all that sincere. There was just enough humour in Anley's voice for George to let out a soft laugh. It is possible she's not. He was careful to leave the subject there. A man did not need to have his errors paraded in front of him. Anley gave a rueful grin. In any case, it has given me a closer glimpse of her true nature and her ample tear ducts. A noise erupted as the alley door banged open and a woman came running out, a wild look to her eyes. The Marquis turned in that direction and George was careful not to appear overly curious. He hoped no one would come and question him in front of Anley. The Marquis knew he was friends with Duckworth and likely had heard of his sister's adoption of Miss Chauncey. He might piece it together. To his relief, the modiste ran back indoors without asking questions. He suspected she did not dare to interrupt them. George was searching for another topic of conversation when the door opened again, and the same woman came out with a maid trailing her footsteps. They both looked around, but upon seeing the clear alley, did not attempt to do more to discover Miss Chauncey's whereabouts. George had not looked at his watch, and did not wish to draw attention to himself, but he suspected that about ten minutes had passed since Dark and Miss Chauncey had left. Given that it was unlikely anyone knew where she had gone, he was hopeful this would be the advantage they needed to be free. He turned back to Lord Anley, and decided to be open about his intentions. I had a mind to call on your sister. Anley's eyebrows rose, and he studied George. Is that so? I was just about to go home myself. Why don't we travel together? Excellent. George followed the Marquis to the nearby mews, where Anley's carriage was kept. He carried on a light conversation, hiding his nervousness about Duck's elopement, and now about seeing Alice. The last thing he wished for was to have Anley witness the extent of his attachment to Alice. That would be as good as publicly declaring himself, and he was far from being sure how she felt. At last, he came upon a topic he thought would interest them both. "'Gentleman Jackson is gathering some of the men he's trained "'to assist in the Prince Regent's coronation. "'They will be used to keep the crowds in line. "'Had you heard?' "'Hanley breathed out. "'How I would love to do that. Oh, "'I never could, though. "'My father would be scandalised. "'Along with the rest of London, I imagine,' "'George added. "'No, I imagine it will be men of a humbler nature "'who will fulfil that role. "'Do you never think—' "'Hanley stopped and looked at George.' Oh, but I suppose it does not matter. You can do as you wish. I believe I know what you wish to say, though. George turned a sympathetic smile to the Marquis. He understood the urge to do something noble. If only there was a war or something where we could go off and prove our valour. Is that not so? Yes, something like that. Anley trained his gaze ahead. George fell silent until a new thought took hold. Then again, there are plenty of ways to show a man's valour that don't involve fighting. I'm sure you'll figure that out. They had arrived, and George followed Anley into the house. The Marquis brought him directly into the drawing room, where Alice and her mother were seated. He had not expected to see the Duchess, who showed no obvious signs of her invalided state. He hoped his having arrived with the Marquis would soften her displeasure at his having come unannounced. He stood at Anley's side debating whether it had been the best decision to come. "'A mother, you're downstairs,' Anley said. "'Wonderful. May I present Mr. Clavering?' The Duchess wore a severe expression. "'We have met.' George bowed. "'Good afternoon, Your Grace.' 
After a split second's hesitation, he also bowed to Lady Alice. My lady? The Duchess hesitated before gesturing to the seat near them. Would you care to be seated? I thank you, Your Grace, George said. If it would not be inconvenient, I am wondering if Lady Alice would care to go for a walk. The Duchess looked at Alice, who shrugged and gave a small nod. George caught the gesture and hoped desperately that this was an act for her mother and not a sign of the true state of her feelings for him. I will ask Daisy to accompany us. Alice went quickly to the door, then met George's gaze. I won't be but a minute. Very well, even though it is not the usual hour for walking, the Duchess said, giving him a dark look. He wondered what he had done to make her so suspicious. However, the important thing was that she was letting Alice go. I will not keep her out long. We may walk in the square as it is a beautiful afternoon, he said, eager to appease her mother. I'll leave you then, Clavering. You may as well sit while you wait, Anne Lee told him. He walked toward the door and turned back. Mother, I'll be here for dinner tonight if you wish. The Duchess nodded, and George did not miss the look of maternal affection in her eyes. Anley left, and George sat with a glance at his hostess, trying to look as though his whole world was not hinged on what chances he might have with Lady Alice. "'I heard you visited while I was invalided,' the Duchess said. "'It hastened my recovery, for I did not wish to leave my daughter unchaperoned. As much as I would like to trust Daisy, I fear she has too romantic a nature. What are your intentions toward Alice?' George was ill-prepared for such a direct question, but he did not hesitate. I would marry her if she would have me. Against her parents' own wishes? the Duchess asked, and he had to remind himself that her grace had once given her approval, although he was not supposed to know that. He rather thought she might be bluffing. The Duchess did not look as though she were bluffing. You are beneath her. You, a second son, and of a baronet, no less, it is audacious of you to attempt the suit. He would not cower under her gaze. Perhaps, although if you'll permit me to inform you, Your Grace, my inheritance is not to be despised. Your daughter would not want for anything. That, however, is neither here nor there if she will not have me. You ask me of my intentions. They are merely to make her aware of my feelings. If she returns them, I will ask to speak to His Grace. If she does not... What you or I think of the matter has no relevance. He had spoken forcefully, but he could not regret it. He would not flatter the Duchess or attempt to win Alice's hand through conniving. Very well, we shall see. The Duchess turned her eyes toward the door as Alice stepped into the room. She had a bonnet tied under her chin that framed her face and hid her expression. Her maid stepped in behind her. Alice looked at George. I am ready. Twenty three. Alice allowed Mr. Clavering to choose the direction of their walk. She was thrilled beyond what she would admit to anyone but herself that she was able to escape her house in the company of the only man who filled her thoughts day and night. They did not speak right away as they walked, her hand tucked in his arm and the warmth of his presence filling her with a sense of peace and joy she had not yet known. Daisy trailed at a distance, giving them ample space to carry on a private conversation. Alice had always appreciated her maid, but was lately realising her value. Daisy accepted her strange requests, such as packing up some old clothing and tooth powder, without asking any questions, and Alice was sure she was not talking about it below stairs. Now she showed another courtesy, by allowing them a degree of privacy. Alice's gaze went to Mr. Clavering, then to the blue sky with sunlit clouds. It is a beautiful day. She felt the strength of his arms through his tight-fitting coat, which, oddly, made her feel more weak. His eyes lifted to the sky as well, and when he turned them down to her, she noticed for the first time the gold specks in his brown eyes. It is indeed and the pleasure of the day is enhanced by good company. Alice ducked her head to hide how pleased she was at hearing his comment. She strove for a topic on more firm ground. I believe you may safely talk about the matter that concerns us both dearly, 
I do trust my maid not to reveal anything she might overhear. Well, then. Mr. Clavering pulled her a hair closer to his side for his disclosure. They went off without a hitch from what I could see. Miss Chauncey came running out, wearing what I am sure was her wedding dress. Dark quickly got her into the carriage, and they were off without a soul the wiser. I stayed in the area so I might see when they were missed, and I believe it was a good ten minutes before anyone came out. As the maid would not have been in a position to begin a search, I imagine it was much more time before anyone could attempt to locate them. Do you think people will guess where they have gone? Alice asked anxiously. I don't see how they could. Duck was not particularly obvious in his attentions after Miss Chauncey was betrothed. Mr. Clavering had lowered his voice and was taking great care not to say their names in the hearing of Daisy or a chance passer-by. Duck has it all planned out. Unless her family knows what to look for, I believe they're quite safe. Phew! Alice blew out, then glanced at Mr. Clavering with a smile. She had not realised how much she had been hoping the couple would make it. It was almost as though their break for freedom paralleled her own. "'And you came home with my brother,' she added. "'I was never more surprised than to see the two of you together. "'I believe the sight of him softened my mother enough "'to let me go out walking with you. "'It was almost as though you were the one who brought him home at last.' "'Mr. Clavering laughed. "'Believe me, your mother still had questions for me.' "'Alice tilted her head up to look at him "'and was caught by his profile, "'another thing she had not had a chance to study "'at such a close proximity.' His strong jaw revealed the firm character one would wish for in a suitor, if one were thinking about such a thing. She almost forgot what she wanted to ask. Oh, yes, what questions did she have? He made his lips prim, but his eyes were twinkling. Well, she wanted to know what intentions I had toward her daughter. Oh, dear. Alice trained her eyes forward. She had meant to ask more about Gwen and Duck, and she had meant to ask more about her brother and what he and Mr. Clavering were doing together, but the conversation was now veering on a wild path, seemingly with no driver. What did you tell her? Mr. Clavering didn't speak, and she heard only the chance phrases of couples walking by them and the sound of their own footsteps on the flagway. She puzzled her brows as she mulled over how he possibly could have responded to her mother. The silence grew, and she turned to find his gaze fixed steadily on her. I said I would marry you, if you would have me. Alice's feet almost came to a halt of their own accord, but she forced herself to keep walking. Possible answers flitted through her mind, but she could not settle on one. He gave her time, though, and did not speak while she processed her thoughts. At last, she settled on another question. What did she answer? Mr. Clavering needed no time to reply. It doesn't matter what she answered. It only matters what you do. That silenced Alice again. But as he did not speak, she had to think of something else to say. For once, she wished for a man who would tell her what she should say or do or think, just to fill the silence, so the obligation would not fall on her. No, she did not wish for that. I will need time to think of my answer. Mr. Clavering exhaled at her side, as if he had been holding his breath. That is not a no, then. She looked up to see his grin. It is not a no, she confirmed. He leaned down and said in a near whisper, If we were not in such a public setting, I might be tempted to persuade you with a kiss, one that I would be in no hurry to end. Alice's breath fled at the thought of what that would be like, and it took a minute before she could think of the proper reply. Whether or not we were in such a public setting, it would not be at all the thing, Mr. Clavering. Nevertheless, he said, grinning. She kept her face forward, willing herself not to smile, but she could feel the ache in her cheeks. She bit her lip. He leaned down again. And I wish you would call me George. I have taken the liberty of calling you Alice in my mind when I think of you, which is often. I seem to remember you took the liberty out loud as well the last time we met, she said, attempting a tone of indignation. It was not at all convincing. Oh, you noticed that, did you? I was hoping you would not, he replied, 
shaking his head in mock regret. Alice's lips trembled upward. It made her happy to be in his presence. She would have to think very carefully about her decision. To accept would be to run counter to everything she had determined. She would become the kind of weak-minded woman she detested. But then she would get to live with George, and look at him, and laugh with him, and kiss him, every day for the rest of their lives. Oh, dear. And now they would have to think of some other topic of conversation for the rest of their walk. It was all very awkward. Or at least it should be. What if she had said no? My estate at St Ives is near enough to the ocean that one can reach it in a half-hour's ride. George paused and looked down at her to see if she was interested. She was. There is a village where the tenants live, and although they farm the land as their principal activity, they also trade with the fishermen. The house has fourteen bedrooms, if you don't include the servants' quarters, and some of the rooms have a view of the fountain that is in front. My favourite is the view in the back that overlooks the garden and the meadow beyond. It leads to a small wooded area that has enough pheasants to provide sport during hunting season. You won't care about that, of course, but the area is idyllic for walking, outside of hunting season. The morning room is very favourably situated, although a woman's touch in decorating would not go amiss. George continued on in this way as they walked, telling her about the tenants and the repairs he was making, and about the housekeeper and butler, who had been married for thirty years. She listened, wondering what it would be like to be mistress of such an establishment, and to live so near the ocean. Her family did not often travel, aside from the two trips to Brighton at the Prince Regent's invitation, and the journeys between the family estate in Kent and their London house. She had not even visited her sister in Cumbria, and would have been grateful for a chance to see it, had the proposed visit not fallen right in the middle of the season, and, she had to own, in the middle of her budding friendship with George Clavering. He was surprised to learn that she had not been sea-bathing when they went to Brighton, because her mother had a terrible fear of the waves. "'One day you will set your bare feet in the ocean, Alice.' They had turned in their walk some ways back and were nearing her house. Alice could scarcely believe their time together was over. She hoped he would not press her for an answer too soon. She thought her heart would say yes, but she needed to be certain. When they arrived, he stopped and faced her. I will be at Almax tomorrow night if you will go. I understand it to be complicated for you, as your mother cannot accompany you. If I ask Philippa to escort you, would your mother permit it? Alice bit her lip. I'd better ask Clada. It will be less suspicious for my mother. But I believe I will be there. My mother likes Clada. She smiled up at him, happy at the thought of seeing him the next day. She had no desire to leave his company, but it was time she did so. She had some serious thinking to do. He walked her up to the steps, and as the butler opened the door, he tipped his hat and bowed. "'It has been an enjoyable afternoon for me, Lady Alice,' he said. "'And for me, Mr. Clavering.' Horace stood in attendance, so she slipped through the door, followed by Daisy, and did not permit herself to turn and watch him go. All she had was what was stored up in her heart, his words and declaration. It had been some time since she had been nourished by so sustaining an encouragement. "'You are going to marry that man, I believe?' Clada whispered at Almax, when Alice glanced around the room yet again to try to catch a glimpse of George. Mm, "'I'm not so sure. It is a big decision.' Alice turned to see if he was in the far corner. Was he in their alcove? But no, there were others there. She could hardly focus on the milling guest tonight. She had but one thought, and it was to be near him. At last he walked in, and his eyes easily found her in the crowd. He smiled and began to move her way before being interrupted by his friend, Mr Amos, who had tapped him on the shoulder. Alice was no nearer to being able to admit to herself that she wanted to marry him. In her heart, the wedding had already been performed, and she was living in St Ives. In her mind, the battle raged as she clung to her independence. Her heart allowed her mind to agree to dance with him at least. George ended his conversation with Mr. Amos and made his way over. Mrs. Bell, he said, bowing before Clader. Good evening, Lady Alice. 
I hope you will reserve a dance for me this evening. Seized by a sudden urge to tease, she allowed her face to fall. Oh, I am sorry. I have given all my dances away. There were so many requests, and I could not say no as I had declared I was to dance tonight. Georgie's face lost all signs of good humour. His disappointment was evident. I should have come earlier. Whitmore needed me. Clader looked at Alice, half laughing and half exasperated. Oh, do put him out of his misery. She sent George a sympathetic look, then walked away, leaving Alice and him alone. I haven't given any dances away, she confessed, the corner of her lips turning upward. We have only just arrived, not long before you, as a matter of fact, and I believe the men here are still reluctant to trust that they will not be met with rebuff. It takes a man of great courage to approach you, then, he said, his humour returning. Oh, great courage! I am glad to know there is hope for me yet, and that I can consider myself a man of great courage. The music for a quadrille began, and he turned to her. I should prefer to keep my dances for the waltz. Is there someone I can take you to? I would not like for you to be subject to scrutiny because I have spent too much time in your presence. At least, not until you are sure of your own heart. That is thoughtful, Mr. Clavering. George, he whispered. She smiled, but ignored him, or attempted to at any rate. You might accompany me to the refreshment table. There are women there, I know. He inclined his head and held out his arm. Come, then. Let me take you there while I wait for our waltz. At the refreshment table, the circle containing Teresa, Barbara, Diana and Annabel opened to include her. Teresa pounced upon her with delight. Oh, you've come at just the time to hear the most shocking Andy. Gwendolyn Chauncey has run off with someone. Disappeared completely from London. On her wedding day with Lord Hicks, Barbara added, her eyes bright with the gossip. On her wedding day? Alice queried with surprise, before stopping awkwardly. She had almost given them away. Oh, the day before, Teresa said. Poor, poor Lord Hicks. I have heard he's most distraught. He felt a passion for Miss Chauncey, although why he would, who can say? She was not beyond passably pity, and she was so unfriendly. I always thought there was something wrong with her. Hmm. Alice wrinkled her brows. I've always liked her. Lady Alice, you like to appear generous in your estimation of others, but you know you have your own prejudices, Barbara said fretfully. You cannot tell me this news does not shock you. It didn't, but Alice could not say that. Oh, it does, of course, but I feel we must find out the particulars. I hope Miss Chauncey has not suffered any ill. She has disappeared without a trace, Annabel added, and turned her wide eyes to Barbara and Teresa for their approval. Lady Alice, I see you are not dancing. The voice came from behind her. For once, Alice was glad for the distraction, no matter who it was, although in this case the man was Lord Harridan, whose wife was rumoured to be carrying out an indiscretion on the side. Alice wondered why he, as a married man, would single her out. It could not be out of courtesy to invite her to dance, since there were gentlemen aplenty, and many ladies who lacked partners. But she was anxious to remove herself from the talk of Miss Chauncey, lest she make an inadvertent disclosure. "'I have only one dance reserved thus far,' she replied. "'It is my lucky day, then. Allow me to lead you out.' He lifted his arm. She inclined her head to the ladies and followed him over to the dance floor. She and Lord Harridan took their places on the sidelines and watched the dance set that was currently in progress. He turned to her with a smile she did not trust. "'Allow me to guess, my lady. Your reserve dance is with George Clavering.' She eyed him, then turned her face forward. "'You are not beginning our dance auspiciously, my lord, if you are already speaking of other partners of mine, and being overly inquisitive.' He considered this for a minute, before responding. "'Perhaps I am doing so with a noble aim. I am only telling you this, my lady, for it is most obvious that he is courting your attention.' Alice did not need long to formulate a response. "'Those who caught my attention are of no concern of yours.' She was beginning to think it would be better to part ways with Lord Harridan before they began dancing. It could be done without a fuss now, but not if they had begun to dance. 
After a pause, she turned to him. I... Do you know why Clavering is pursuing you? Lord Harridan insisted. His insolence had gone on long enough. She curtsied. Good evening, my lord. It is because he bet that you would marry this season. The bet is recorded in the book at White's. Alice paused in her steps, the loud drum of her heartbeat muting his words. Lord Harridan came beside her and leaned down to murmur in her ear. When no other candidate had any success, he began to pursue you so he would not lose his bet. Alice did not allow her expression to flinch as the words sank in. It could only be true. The realisation struck her like a blow. George loved to make wages. He could not be pursuing her with honest purpose. Why, the man did nothing but gamble and take mistresses. He did not know what it was to feel any sort of deeper sentiment. That talk of love that Clayda had mentioned was all rubbish, at least where George was concerned. Her face grew warm, and the threat of tears formed at the back of her eyes. Keeping a firm rein on her emotions, she turned to him. "'Good evening, Lord Harridan.' Alice turned and walked the sides of the ballroom, looking for Clayda, but could not see her. Her eyes were nearly blinded with tears, but she blinked them away and took herself strongly to task. She had to get out of this stifling crowd, and preferably without meeting George, Mr. Clavering. If she had to face him, she would not be able to keep her tears in check. She found Clayda in conversation and touched her on the arm. When Clayda turned, her face registered concern at Alice's obvious distress. Alice had difficulty getting the words out, and others were watching her curiously. She forced a smile. If you are not terribly inconvenienced, I must ask if we might get some air. I'm feeling faint. Oh, do go attend to Lady Alice, the woman said, and Clayda nodded briskly and scooped her arm under Alice's. Oh, let us go. If we need to, Mr. Bell will be ready to take us home early. Alice kept her gaze down until they pushed their way through the crowd. She made it to the entrance, where fresh air poured in. Now, if only she could make it to the privacy of the Bell's carriage, she might survive this evening with her dignity intact. Twenty-four. George moved restlessly about the room, unsure what to do with himself without duck, while he bided his time until the only dance that mattered. He had left Amos partnering with a woman who had caught his eye, and he wished him well. Amos had been more and more attentive to the prospects these balls provided, now that he had decided it was time to settle down. It was as if, by unspoken agreement, they had all decided it was time, and George was not in any way behind. If only Amos could find the same happiness that was now within his own grasp, he would be thrilled for him. He could finally understand what it was to love, could finally understand what had pushed Duck to take such a radical step. He and Duck had decided it would be better to hide his elopement from even their close friends. Duck said he would apologise when he got back, but the fewer who knew about it beforehand, the better it was. He and Miss Chauncey had been on the road for a day and a half by now. George wondered how their first night had gone at the inn, and whether they had been able to play off her being his sister. They did not look particularly alike, but he knew that Duck would keep her honour intact until they had made it across the border and stopped at the first blacksmith in Scotland, where they would tie the knot over the anvil. The movement of a lady in blue caught his eye, despite the crowds of people who stood between them. Alice. Wherever George stood in the room, he was on the lookout for the pale blue dress that Alice wore. He always sensed where she was, even if he was not glancing in her direction. He followed her movements and saw Mrs. Bell leading Alice to the exit. Perhaps she simply needed some fresh air. He moved over to where he had an unhindered view of the servant who cared for the cloaks. Mrs. Bell was handing over her vouchers. She took her shawl and put it on, then handed the other to Alice. George frowned. It was too warm to need their outer garments if they were just getting air. A gentleman joined them who touched Mrs. Bell on the elbow. It was Mr. Bell who also handed over his voucher. Concern snaked through George. They gave all the appearance of a party that was leaving Ormax for the night, but they could not be, as he had not had his dance with Alice yet. He took a quick step forward. A George! He turned at Philippa's voice. Did all go well for our friends yesterday? 
I expected you to come and visit me so you could give me the details. Just a moment, he said, turning back to the exit. Alice was no longer in his sight, and he moved forward. The crowds did not easily allow him to pursue a path through them, but he forced his way as politely as possible. By the time he reached the front entrance, they were gone. He moved toward the door, and the footman opened it to allow him to walk through. He blinked against the night sky, and the halo of a lantern hooked on a post that blinded him for a moment. Then he saw the party of three standing on the flagway, as a carriage pulled up to them. The night air held a chill, but he barely felt it. "'Alice!' he called out. A small group of people hurried to the entrance of Almax, arriving just before the eleventh hour, when they would be shut out for the night. They turned to him when he called out, then swivelled their heads to look at her. "'Blast it! Lady Alice!' he corrected. He was making a scene by running after a lady in plain view. It would be all over London by tomorrow. She stilled, but did not turn his way. Her friend leaned down to whisper something in her ear, and, reluctantly, Alice faced him. He had never seen her expression so unfriendly, not even on that first night they had met. "'What has happened?' Alice waited until he approached, and when George stood in front of her, Mrs. Bell touched Alice on the arm. "'We shall just be waiting in the carriage.' With her husband's help she climbed in, and he followed, closing the door. George desperately wanted privacy. He needed it, but he could not pull her away from the coach without risking talk, and the driver was only a short distance away. He indicated that she should follow before moving toward the back wheel. Please, spare me a moment of your time. Alice said nothing, but she followed him. Her hands hung limply at her sides, and her shoulders were firmly set. She looked up at him, waiting so the onus of the conversation was to fall on him. "'Please tell me why you're leaving without honouring our dance,' he said. He swallowed hard. He wanted to ask why she looked so displeased with him, but his courage failed him. "'You are worried about missing a dance with me,' she observed, her voice icy. "'Why? Is it because you bet that you could get me to dance tonight and you're afraid to lose your bet?' The ground seemed to be less solid under his feet. What? I don't... He stopped and grasped for his indignation. I would never bet on a dance. Dancing is for pleasure. He was flailing miserably. You dance only for pleasure, she said. But you marry for a wager. Why was she mad about their wager? They hadn't wagered on marriage, only on Miss Chauncey's ability to secure Duck's affection. Oh... It all became clear now. George swallowed again. He wanted to plead with her, but he didn't think it would go over well. He would only look desperate, and she would never believe him. But it took only one look at her face for reason to fly away and for him to do just that. Alice, you need to believe me. Lady Alice, she cut in, her expression inflexible. Lady Alice, I am not pursuing you for a wager. I'm pursuing you because my feelings for you have grown to the point of lo- George stopped short. He couldn't say he loved her when she looked at him with such disdain. He had not even admitted it to himself. My feelings for you have grown a great deal. Alice nodded as if confirming something to herself. I can just see how much your feelings have grown. You have such a way of expressing them, such a way of showing them. Her voice dripped with irony. How delightful for you to have the world at your feet. As a gentleman, you may pursue an eligible female of the temps while keeping your true affection for your mistress on the side. And you may earn some guineas while you do so. It was only thirty shillings, he protested. The wrong thing to say. He knew it as soon as the words left his lips. Her mouth dropped open, and her look of anger grew even more pronounced. I am much relieved. She moved to go around him, but he caught her by the arm. She looked down at his hand, then directed her gaze to his face. George had never seen a more terrifying look on his most formidable opponent at the boxing saloon. He released her arm and stepped back. But you and I wagered too, he protested feebly, as she put her hand on the knob to open the door to the carriage. 
We wagered on Miss Chauncey and Duck's match. Why is this different? Ours was a friendly wager between two people. Yours is public, and it's in the books. You attach my name to a belt for any vulgar person to see. Alice pulled herself upright and lifted her face, fearful despite her size. It is also different because their match succeeded. She yanked the door open and climbed into the carriage, waving away Mr. Bell's hand from inside. She pulled the door shut, and the carriage pulled off. George's heart hammered in his chest. Another party exited Ormax, glancing at him curiously. He didn't care. In fact, he thought he would be ill. He began walking. He couldn't remember whether he had brought a cloak, whether he had ridden, whether he had made promises to meet up with anyone that night. With the horror that consumed him, not one rational thought was capable of entering his conscience. The next morning George did not bother to call for a shave or to get dressed. He didn't bother eating. He just laid in bed until the inactivity made him too impatient to remain. Then he got up and sat at the table in his sitting room. He had not been there long when a knock came on the door. He ignored it, but the knock became insistent. Open up, George! Lucius? The shock of Lucius coming to visit propelled him off his feet and over to the door. He opened it and beheld his older brother, looking as perfectly put together as he always did. Wordlessly, he opened the door wider and allowed Lucius to enter. Forgive my insistence. If I'm going to drag myself out of bed at this early hour, I like to achieve my mission, you see. Now that the surprise had died down, George's mood fell again. His brother was here, but he couldn't fix the mess George had got himself into. Have a seat, he muttered. You look terrible, Lucius said. George couldn't return the flippant answer his brother clearly expected. He threw himself in his chair. How did you know? Lucius looked over at the sideboard and went to help himself to some ale. Harrodin could not resist gloating in Amos's presence. Amos then came to ask Philippa where you had gone, and she said you left and had not come back. I think Amos forgets Philippa is not one of the men sometimes. He told her what happened with Harrodin. I suppose she was shocked. Lucius sat and drank. Oh, not our Philippa. She had the presence of mind to send me a note. So, I assume you went after Lady Alice, and she did not accept your apology. George stared at the plate of ham that was sitting on the table. I did. She did not. Ah. Lucius's look held compassion. George was so accustomed to seeing his brother's sardonic side that his expression took him by surprise. What do you plan to do now? George sent his brother a look of misery. What can I do? Nothing. Everything is lost. He leaned forward and put his face in his hands, fighting a foreign sensation of tears. It would do no good to cry. It wouldn't change anything. My advice to you is to get up and get dressed. You'll need to be in better condition than that if you want to have any hope of winning her. George looked at Lucius incredulously. I have no hope. Then you're an idiot, Lucius said bluntly. If Lady Alice is in love with you, as Philippa believes her to be, her hurt or humiliation or anger or whatever feeling happens to be stronger than any other at the current moment will not last. You will have to beg her forgiveness. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this, but it won't be for the last time. Lucius took a sip of ale and set the tankard down. But if you don't even make a push to see her or reason with her, then you don't deserve to win her. If, after you've done everything you can, she refuses to forgive you, well... George waited for the rest, and when it didn't come, he looked at Lucius. Well, then, she doesn't deserve to be won. Except for the fact that his brother had gone out of his way to come and see him, and that made him feel less alone. However, Lucius's speech did stir something inside of him. It made him long to get dressed and at least attempt to talk to her. He paused suddenly, struck by a thought. You're speaking from experience, having made a pretty big blunder yourself. You allowed Selina to be publicly humiliated and did not come to her rescue. But she still married you. Lucius frowned. It is not a moment I'm proud of. He plunged into thought, and George waited, wondering. 
If his brother could mess up that spectacularly and still win Selina's trust, perhaps he stood a chance with Lady Alice. No, Alice was nothing like Selina. She would not suffer fools gladly, and he was bigger than a fool. Lucius looked at him. If Lady Alice accepts you, despite what you've done, then it will simply be a constant reminder to do better, to cherish her more, to put her first. At least, that's how it is with me. George nodded, taking this as encouragement. He drew a deep breath. I have no idea how it can be done. She is a duke's daughter, surrounded by people who gain nothing by having me win her hand. I don't even know how I'm going to be able to see her. You make it sound like you will have to enter the lion's den just to talk to her, Lucius said. And that's exactly it. It is entering the lion's den to see her. I will get chewed alive. Lucius stood. You know, I'm not exactly a man of spiritual convictions, but even I know that if you have the least bit of faith, God is capable of shutting a lion's mouth. He put his hand on George's shoulder, shook it, then went over to the door and left. His brother's visit had done George good. It had chased away some of the despondency, and he got up and rang for his valet to come and shave him. His first stop would be to Jackson's boxing saloon. If Anley was there, he would see if the Marquis had spoken to his sister. If he was not, then George would relieve some of his despondency through a bit of sport. Anley was not there when George arrived, and by the time he had stripped and put on his gloves, he'd decided that fate was against him. No, he refused to think that way. Fate was not against him. George was not a particularly faithful man either, but Lucius's words rang in his mind, and he thought that if there was no other way to achieve his aim, he might have just enough faith to force his way into the lion's den and seek an audience with Alice, no matter the outcome. Ralph Filbert was across the room, and he lifted a hand and waved. Clavering, he called out. Oh, come and spar with me. We're of the same weight. Perfect. They were evenly matched, and Filbert was ready to begin. As soon as George was in front of him, he lifted his gloves. Oh, whoa, fellow, you look like you're about to murder someone. What has got you looking so black? Nothing. Let's fight. Filbert lifted an eyebrow, but raised his glove and easily blocked George's first punch. It had been sloppy. Filbert threw his own punch and said, Harridan has been going off to anyone who will listen that you're trying to win Lady Alice's hand so you might win your bet. George didn't respond to that, but his punch was harder and more efficient this time. Harridan's a fool, Filbert went on. I warned him that more of that talk and he would be asking for a duel. Said it's as good as accusing you of throwing the bet. George threw another punch, then swivelled as Filbert gave him back as good. My only concern is for Lady Alice's reputation. I didn't wish to enter into the bet with him. I wish I had just said no. Filbert got a punch past George's guard and hit his chin hard. It stung, and George punched back without making contact. What's more, now she's going on about me having mistresses. Wherever did she get the notion I had a string of mistresses lined up? I've never even had one. Filbert darted to the other side as George threw a punch with his left hand. Filbert focused on trying to get through his defences, until they were both breathing hard from the exertion. He dropped his hands and said, I feel some responsibility for your predicament. I should have kept my mouth shut when Harridan came over, instead of telling him what we were discussing. I know what kind of man he is. George shook his head, weary and sore. I don't blame you. They both resumed their fighting stances and continued, although they would soon be worn out. George still had no answers. It was bad enough that he'd bet on Alice, but if only he had bet against her getting married, then at least he would have shown her he believed what she said, instead of looking like every other arrogant man in the town. He could have lost his own bet in trying to win her. Now, as it stood, there was nothing he could do to make his suit seem sincere. He didn't see how he was going to get through this. When he and Filbert had had enough, they bowed to each other. His frustration now completely spent, George had the belated sense to hope that no one had overheard his conversation. He had not exactly been discreet. He glanced around and spotted Lord Anley a short distance away. His mouth went dry at the sight. Let him have just come in, 
Let him not have overheard what I said. He summoned a smile in his direction. We've missed each other. I just finished. Shame, Anley said. They faced one another for a moment in silence, and George realised how stupid it was of him to expect Anley to be of any help. Alice would not have confided in her brother, and Anley would not help George if he knew the whole of it. He probably did know the whole of it, the way Harridan had been running off at the mouth. "'Good day, then,' he said, as he turned to leave, wanting to kick himself for a lack of ideas and a want of courage. "'Is it true you bet on my sister marrying this season?' Anley's voice was too low to carry. George turned slowly and studied Anley's face. He didn't look as furious as he had every right to be. "'I did. I regret it.' he said shortly. I don't appreciate having my sister's name in the betting books. Lord Anley's expression remained measured, but his tone was firm. This was every bit of the rebuke that George deserved. I apologise. I would do so to Lady Alice if she would see me. Anley nodded and looked down. Despite the ill-advised bet, I do think my sister should get married, and although it's clearly none of your affair, apparently you do too. George, feeling both chastised and slightly ill, shot a quick glance at Lord Anley. It may be none of my affair, but I do, although I suppose I'm not impartial. I only think she should get married if it's to me. Anley raised an eyebrow. Well, then. After a short silence, he bowed, then turned toward a group of his peers in the corner of the room. George left to get dressed, rehashing the conversation in his mind. When he had finished dressing, he stepped out of Jackson's into the bustling street and continued on his way, embarrassment and chagrin stealing his breath. Of all the stupid, hair-brained, idiotic notions to get into his brain, he'd had to go and tell the heir to the Duke of Carr, Alice's brother, that he aspired to her hand. And that, after everything he had already done to besmirch her name. In a sudden gesture of frustration, he slapped his hand to his forehead, causing his hat to spin off his head and fall to the ground. A matron looked at him in alarm, and he reached down to pick up his hat. Now he was frightening innocent passers-by. Not only had he lost his chance at Alice, he was going to end up in Bedlam. He was so terribly glad he'd listened to Lucius and had got dressed for the day. 25. Alice left her room as little as possible in the two days following Ormax. Despite the fact that she did not precisely live a full life of gaiety, she had never before felt quite so hopeless. To have known what it was to love someone, and to imagine their life together, only to have it all snatched away because he was not what he'd seemed. It was too cruel. With Alice's current mood, she could only view it as the greatest stroke of luck that her mother was not well enough to drag her to parties or morning calls. It was impossible to think of facing anyone. Clader came to call, and their friendship was close enough that Alice told the servant to have her brought to her bedroom. She was sitting in bed when her friend entered the room. Clader took one look at her and shook her head with a sigh of compassion. You have been unable to turn your thoughts in a happier direction since Wednesday. It is the most disgraceful thing, Alice cried, sweeping her blanket up in her fist. I despise myself for being so weak, but I'm cast down. I cannot find a way to view this whole situation with more fortitude. You're not weak. Far from it. Clader sat on the side of the bed and took Alice's hand. Have you had any word from Mr. Clavering? Has he attempted to explain or send you any kind of note? Alice shook her head. He has not. But you should not be surprised. I am not. "'considering I am no more important to him "'than any mistress who has suddenly become too demanding, I suppose. "'I would have been overcome with shock "'had he made an effort to apologise. "'Clader sent a doubtful look her way. "'Are you quite sure? "'I find it hard to believe that he made a wager on you as it is, "'although how could it be anything but true "'since he confirmed it himself? "'However, the way he looks at you.' "'Alice groaned. "'Don't talk to me about the way he looks at me.' It was an act. All that your reminder does is to make me want to sink into the ground for being such an utter fool. I was right not to trust. Alice threw the blankets aside, got to the ground, and started to pace. 
I should have stuck to my original convictions. When I was adamant about not marrying, I was at peace. I was happy. There was nothing to lower my spirits. Clada did not look entirely convinced, and Alice had to work to convince herself. And then I took the risk and gave my heart, and look where it has got me. Her friend's eyes were filled with compassion. She remained silent, allowing Alice to continue. I was wrong to have fallen for him. At one time I was a woman of sense. She thumped her breast, giving emphasis. And now I'm nothing more than a flighty, foolish creature. Clayda sighed and left the bed to sit on one of the chairs by the empty fireplace. I understand your disappointment. I suppose I had as little hope as you did of finding love. I was just more complacent about accepting a marriage of convenience. And I know that discovering what love was after I married prevented me from experiencing a pain like yours. Still, I urge you not to turn away from seeking a love match. Enough, Alice said, giving her friend a dark look. When she saw that she had hurt Clader, she came to sit at her side and took her hand. I beg you will forgive my harsh tone. You are a good friend and do not deserve it. After all, you would never do something like wager on a person you held in esteem. Clada cocked an eyebrow. You are a good friend too, yet that is precisely what you did with Miss Chauncey. You are on an intimate basis with her, but you wagered on her. Alice pulled her hand away and allowed her jaw to drop. I wagered for her benefit, and I bet on her quality, that she was worthy enough to catch the attention of one of London's notorious flirts. That was a compliment, not an insult. Clader looked sceptical. Perhaps. But did not Mr Clavering pay you a similar compliment? When Alice made a face, Clader continued. From what I understand of the situation... He wagered on you when he did not know you well, and he wagered that of course you would make a match. He too was betting on your quality, and by doing so he was revealing your worth in his eyes. What Clader said made sense, but she did not want to give George the benefit of the doubt. She wanted to remain angry with him. Alice folded her arms. He bet on me for thirty shillings. Can you believe it? Thirty pieces of silver— if that does not make him a Judas the betrayer, I don't know what does. I am your friend, your best friend, and I will hate him if I must. Clada tucked her legs more comfortably under the chair. But I've never seen anyone make you laugh as much as he does, anyone who causes you to drop your society mask as he does, and I have been witness to the look on his face when he catches sight of you from across the ballroom. This is not a man who is pursuing someone for a wager. Clader's measured words almost caused Alice to soften, but she would not be made a fool of again. When Clader smiled at her and raised her eyebrows, taking Alice's silent for agreement, she lifted her chin. But his wager is in the books. It's public. Clader sighed and shook her head, her look of compassion now tinged with exasperation. Later, after Clader had taken her leave, having begged her to consider going to the masquerade ball, where she might not be under scrutiny, a suggestion which Alice had promptly ignored, Alice chose to stay in her room. All that waited for her was unenlightened conversation with her mother downstairs. Her spirits had risen during Clader's visit, but she had no patience for small talk, nor was she willing to be any more conciliatory toward George, Mr Clavering. Oh, now that she had thought of him as George... He remained George in her mind. She had been poisoned. Never again would she let down the society mantle and reveal herself like that to somebody outside of her family. A knock on her bedroom door pulled her out of her thoughts. She bid the person enter, and her brother walked in. Alice dropped the book she had been unsuccessfully trying to read to her lap and stared at him in surprise. But you have actually visited my room. What are you doing here? You never come to visit me any more. Bartholomew grinned and closed the door behind him, then went over and threw himself down on the chair opposite Alice. Well, I expected to see you at the dinner table last night, but it looks like all you're doing is hiding in your room and pouting. Alice sat upright. I'm not pouting, she said in an indignant tone. 
what would I have to pout about? Oh, perhaps it's the fact that Clavering laid a bet on you at White's, that he wagered you would make a match this season, and that raises your dander. He sent her a cocky grin that showed his complete lack of concern over the event. She set her chin. Well, I think it extremely vulgar of him to put my name up in such a public way. I thought better of him. A ray of sun flooded the room and lit Bartholomew's face, highlighting the bristles on his chin. He shielded his eyes. I saw him, you know, at Jackson's. Alice went still, then traced her finger along the bumps that embellished the spine of her book. She was dying to ask how he looked and whether he had mentioned her, but she would not demean herself by doing so. Oh, was all she offered. What's more, I overheard him while he was boxing, Bartholomew said, watching her face. He was talking about you. Alice tossed her book on the table next to her in disgust. Talking about me publicly again. Goodness, the man has not learned his lesson. I hope you showed him a thing or two, whatever it is you men do at that boxing establishment. Bartholomew shook his head with a wry smile. Honestly, even if I wished to teach him a thing or two, I probably could not. At least not yet. He has a punishing left hook. She looked at him in surprise. Mr. Clavering is skilled at boxing. He's one of the best among the gentlemen, Bartholomew admitted. But don't distract me from what I wanted to say. Just before he left, we spoke, and he admitted he still wants to marry you. The man is miserable, Liss. He looks like he hasn't slept a wink. Put him out of his misery and marry him. He may continue to lose sleep. Alice tossed her head. I think he has set his sights too high. I've never known you for a snob. Bartholomew chided gently. It made her feel ashamed. Summoning her ire, she pinched her lips at him. It's not snobbery. I understand that taking mistresses is the way of men, but it's not my way to accept such a thing. I understand that you need to... She threw up her hands as she sought the right words. "'Sow your wild oats, or whatever it is you call it. "'But I deplore the different standard for men and women. "'I think it's wrong that there should be one. "'One thing I can say for sure "'is that there would not be a different standard "'if ever I were to take a husband. "'I would not tolerate a man who keeps scores of mistresses, "'as Mr. Clavering has.' "'Bartholomew looked at her in amazement. "'How is it that you even know of these things? "'They should not be talked of amongst gently bred women.' Alice shot him a look. But you are my little brother. Please don't patronise me. Let us just say that these things are generally known. What is not generally known, her brother retorted, is that Clavering has never had a mistress, and that's something I know. Alice turned to him, startled. What? How do you know? He gave her a cocky look. Because he told me, dear sister... And that is not generally something a man brags about. She looked down and stretched her legs out, studying her slippered feet. She wanted to believe it, but she did not dare. Maybe he lied to you so he could attempt to win me over. Bartholomew met her gaze and shook his head. He told me before all this came out, while you two were still on good terms. Clavering is a good man, Liss. He is a good man. Her heart wanted to believe it. A few minutes ticked by in silence, and then she glanced at Bartholomew, who had his eyes on her. He raised his brows to make his point, and as she stared back at him, she realised she did believe it. A smile began to form, much though she tried to remain severe, and she turned her face away to hide it. The fact that George regretted his foolish wager, one he'd made when he barely knew her, was almost enough to make her throw off all her pride and give him a second chance. But if this were true, if all this were true, then by choosing George she would not be forced to accept infidelity in her marriage. If she said yes to his proposal, she would not have to share him with anyone else. Only how did a woman with more than her fair share of pride go about relenting and offering him a second chance? Well, if you ask me, you should put the poor man out of his misery and tell him you'll have him, Bartholomew said, as though she had asked the question out loud. She knit her brows. A woman doesn't do that sort of thing. Can you not tell him to come here or something? 
What, and have Clavering beg for your hand in marriage with Mother as an audience? I don't think so. Right. Alice fell silent. She was all out of ideas, but her heart was hammering. It was one thing to decide to give a man another chance, to imagine that they could have a happy ending, but it was quite another thing to take steps to make it happen. Wasn't happiness supposed to simply fall in one's lap? I'll escort you to the masquerade ball at the Fenleys Tuesday, Bartholomew said at last. Simon Fenley is a friend of mine, and I'll ask him if I can make use of his library so you two can talk. But, she exclaimed, outraged, that is highly improper. She then remembered the elopement she had just hatched and wondered if she would have any propriety left by the time she reached the age of thirty. Dash it, Liss, I will be there too, you numbskull he replied, shaking his head in disgust. What kind of havy cavy person do you take me for? Oh, she breathed out, relieved. Her cheeks flamed from the heightened emotion, and she vented some of it on him. Oh, don't call me a numbskull, you, you blunderbuss. Bartholomew looked at her in surprise, and with a flash of humour. Very well, Adelpate. Alice reached behind her, grabbed the embroidered cushion and threw it at him. Duke of Limbs? He dodged the cushion and shot back. Corny face. She started laughing. Enough, dandy prat. Bartholomew got to his feet, grinning. You have a domino lying around, don't you? When she nodded, he said, I'll take care of telling Mother that I'm accompanying you to the ball. I'll think of some excuse why I should do something so out of character so she doesn't think I'm ready to turn over a new leaf or something. Just make sure you're ready to leave for the ball tomorrow at nine. But, she called out as he walked toward the door, has father spoken to you? Nobody tells me anything but this friend of yours, Miss Morgan. He cut her off by putting up his hand. No need for you to get involved in that. And I can handle father. Oh, very well, she replied, furrowing her brows. She hoped he knew what he was doing. When he turned again to leave, she inhaled quickly with a thought. But what if he does not come? He shrugged, his hand on the door. What am I, your fairy godmother? Just be ready on time, and we will worry about the rest when we get there. Twenty-six George finally left his house after having spent enough time wallowing in his misery, even though he hadn't a chance to win Alice's heart back, not after he'd messed up so royally. He would not be worth his salt if he did not at least make a push to win back her trust. For his first appearance in society, however, and Jackson's didn't count, he wasn't quite ready to face the lion's den. Instead, he might go to White's. Maybe there he would find some friends to bolster his courage. He missed Duck already. White's was practically empty. There were few men in the club, and all of them were from the older set. He must be missing some event. George asked one of the servants, and learned that there was a race out in Ascot. Oh, the race. He had completely forgotten it was today. At another time, he would have been one of the first ones on the field. He left the club, deciding to visit Philippa. She showed no surprise in seeing him, only sympathy. She lumbered to her feet when he came in, and he noticed for the first time that it must be vastly uncomfortable to be as round as she was growing. Why, she could barely get out of her chair. He leapt forward at the last minute, but he was too late to help her. She held her hands out for him to take. You have not gone to see Lady Alice, have you? He shook his head. She doesn't want to see me. In all honesty, I would attempt it, but I'm just trying to work out the best way to go about it. Philippa gave him a pitying smile. Come, sit down. I will order tea. You need some. You look like you could use some food as well. George obeyed, and she went over to the bell pull and gave instructions to the servant who arrived. On her way back to her chair, she walked by him and ruffled his hair. I won't ask what maggot got into your head to make a public wager on a woman, she said, her tone light. George dropped his head in his hands. Harridan cornered me into it. A look of displeasure crossed Philippa's features. That man! Amos told me he was behind it. Do not let him corner you into anything. 
Wherever he goes, he sows trouble. When George didn't respond, she sighed. I had hoped Alice might come to visit me and pour her heart out, so I might reassure her that you were miserable enough to satisfy her taste for revenge. I could not exactly go to her. And she would not go to you, George said, despondent. He wondered how he was ever going to cross the chasm and actually speak to her. It seemed impossible. A servant entered, carrying hot water and cakes. Philippa set out the tea leaves and prepared the tea, then cut George a generous slice of cake and handed it to him. Mother sent a letter saying she was planning to come to London when I have my lying in. He almost choked on his tea. You don't say. She hasn't made any empty promises of late. Do you think she'll actually come? Philippa poured cream into her tea. I don't know. Is it very wrong of me to wish she wouldn't? I will have difficulty caring for mother and my baby at the same time. I would have to call for Mariah's help. George gave an exaggerated shudder, and they exchanged a smile. It lightened the mood. Philippa regaled him with the latest news as they ate, and George was only required to listen. After he had finished the slice of cake and drunk two cups of tea, he began to feel better. He could not remember when he had last eaten. "'Do you think they've arrived?' Philippa asked. When he looked at her strangely, she clarified. Oh, Duck and Miss Chauncey, do you think they're Mr and Mrs Duckworth yet? We've not heard any news of a search party going out from London, and certainly not any news of a successful recovery. It's been about a week, he said. If I know Duck, he has pulled it off, or is about to. But I won't be completely easy until I hear news that the knot has been tied. As Philippa ate her cake, he took a deep breath, feeling more hopeful. So, tell me what I should do. She put her fork down and studied him. Go to the masquerade ball tonight. The Fenleys are hosting. Surely you received an invitation? I did, but I haven't responded. I can't show up without sending my acceptance. Or send it late, then. They will forgive you for it. Hostesses are always looking for handsome young gentlemen to enliven their parties. Philippa laughed. I should know. I am one such woman now. George considered the idea. It was not doing him any good to stay moping in his room, but he would be attending the party on his own. His friends would probably return late from the race, and it was not likely he would see any of them there. He looked at his sister. And to what end? I think Lady Alice will go. She leaned forward as much as her rounded stomach would allow. I'm not in her confidence, obviously, but the masquerade is the perfect place to escape the doldrums without being overly remarked upon. The wager you made on Lady Alice has not circulated the tant, has it? I certainly have heard nothing about it in my entourage. George frowned. He hadn't thought of that. I don't believe so. But perhaps people wouldn't say it around me, knowing that I'm implicated. Hmm. Philippa's face tightened. I suppose once the mischief was done, Harridan had no further need to make it known. After all, it does not reflect well on him to make public a bet that was transacted in a private gentleman's club, and a wager about the daughter of a duke at that. That man is asking for a duel, George said, feeling his anger rise just thinking of it. How he would like to mar that overly symmetrical face and make it more interesting. Oh, please do not, Philippa begged. Knowing him, he would fire before the Count and mortally wound you. Only if he was aiming for the tree, George scoffed. Then he blew out and put his hands on his knees. I'm wasting my time here. No, I'm sorry, Phil, I did not mean that. I just need to be doing something. I cannot sit still. But I will take your advice and send my acceptance for tonight. Now I need to find a loom mast somewhere. Where does one procure such a thing? Oh, Jack has an extra one. I will go fetch it for you. George waited until his sister returned. In her hand was an orange mask that was more attention-grabbing than he would have liked. It had something like a lion's mane coming off it on all sides. He looked at it in doubt. Blythefield wears this. He does not, Philippa answered, with the hint of a smile. That's why I'm giving it to you. George supposed it did not matter what mask he wore. No one would connect it with him anyway and it was almost beyond hope that he would see Alice there. He was certain her mother was not well enough to attend, 
which meant she would not attend either. But it would distract him to go, and right now that was all he had left. Crowds of people continued to stream into the Fenley's house that evening as George approached. He was feeling ridiculous in his mask, but was slightly mollified when he saw a few others that were even more ostentatious. However, since these all belonged to portly older men, he could not take much solace in the fact. He had to remind himself why he was here. It was in the hope, no matter how small, that Alice would come, and he could see her, to plead with her, to forgive him or to marry him, whatever she was willing to agree to. A few people glanced his way as he walked up the steps, and his cheeks grew warm under the mask. He must look as ludicrous as he felt. And who would he find to talk to while he was here? He wasn't sure he would recognise anyone in the sea of costumes, and none of his friends were likely to attend. It was a stupid idea. After greeting the host and hostess, who made teasing inquiries into who the tall young lion could be, he entered the ballroom and began to examine the people around him. There was a couple in conversation to his right, with the woman in a domino and mask, styled as a wolf, and the man dressed in one of red satin. The man smiled, showing off an unmistakable mouth of unwashed teeth. It could only be Lord Hicks. There was something to be said for guessing at least one person at this assembly— as for who the lady could be, he had no idea. She appeared to take pleasure in Hicks's company, which was a puzzle. No, that was uncharitable. Here he was judging Lord Hicks, when he was the type of man to wager on a woman who was well above his touch, and one he desperately wished he could marry. A small orchestra began to play in the corner of the room, and some of the couples paired up, filling the floor with bright colours. George walked the periphery of the room, his eye drawn to every petite woman who crossed his path. There wasn't one who could be mistaken for Alice. Of course, she would not be here. He was wasting his time. Frustrated, he took a turn from the ballroom and found himself in a darkened corridor that ran parallel to it. There were lights and sounds coming from the other end. It was a quieter way to reach the other side of the ballroom, where the exit was, although it took him through the private quarters of the house. Perhaps it was not quite the thing, but he could not bear the idea of weaving his way back through the crowds of the ballroom, so he continued. "'If you please, my lord.' There was fear in the voice he'd heard. Muffled sounds of a struggle midway down the darkened corridor reached him, and George tightened his fists as he moved forward. "'Stop, please!' George began to run, and it took only a few strides until he was on the couple— the man was masked and held a woman, wearing a servant's attire, in a tight embrace. He was kissing her, but this was not a willing dalliance on her part. George pulled the man from her and leaned back, throwing his weight into the punch that sent the man reeling. The man swore as he clutched his nose. George kept his fighting stance, but the man did not appear eager to rush back at him. "'Who are you?' the man said. "'What right have you to interfere in what does not concern you?' The voice was familiar, despite it being muffled from a blocked nose. George frowned and stepped forward. He reached across and jerked the mask off the man's face. Of course, Harridan. His cheek was already beginning to swell, and he moved his jaw as though testing it. Give me my mask, Harridan snapped, and yanked it out of George's hand. And to whom do I owe the honour of this piece of meddling? George paused. He was tempted to tell Harridan who had punched him, to antagonise him and pay him back for all the mischief he had done and would likely continue to do since that was the sort of man he was. But that would only guarantee that things would all be settled between them by a feud. He thought of Philippa's words and almost smiled at the thought of pistols at dawn with someone who would likely kill him through foul play or ineptitude. As you have no honour to repay, the question does not bear asking. Now go, Harridan. Lord Harridan put his mask back on and gingerly tied it in place. He scowled at George, then turned to walk toward the far end of the corridor. Only when he had gone did George turn to the woman. She was breathing hard and showing signs of crying, but he could see she was struggling to be composed. Are you well, ma'am? May I escort you somewhere to safety? He asked her. That would be kind of you, sir. 
She sniffed and turned to retrace the steps back to the ballroom, and George went to her side. He wasn't sure if he was supposed to offer his arm to a servant, but he did not think so. He had never been in this position before, and he didn't want to embarrass her. He contented himself with slowing his pace, so that they walked at her rhythm. "'Oh, thank you, sir,' she said, as they neared the opening to the ballroom. The vulnerability in her voice touched him, and he reached out to take her hand and tuck it under his arm, smiling at her. "'It was my privilege to defend you.' The entrance of three people into the corridor blocked some of the light coming from the ballroom. Their features were indistinguishable. "'Anley, let me show you the library, should you need it.' Startled at the name, George turned to peer at them more closely. Now, in better light, he had no trouble identifying Alice at her brother's side. He didn't know who the third person could be. He let go of the maid's hand and moved toward her. Alice. In his excitement, George forgot about using her title and remaining discreet, and the fact that she probably did not want to speak to him. In the next instant, George had cause to regret his hastiness, because he had no difficulty detecting the fury on her face, despite her mask. Could she still be that angry with him? He had no chance. "'I knew it,' she said, in a low, throbbing voice. "'I knew you were a liar. No mistresses, huh? Is that because you're too cheap to pay for them, so you accost innocent maids in the corridors of other people's houses instead?' She shot a contemptuous glance at the maid. "'Or not so innocent,' "'Alice!' George cried out again, this time appalled. Was that what she thought of him? "'Alice!' her brother remonstrated at the same time. "'Let us find out what has happened.' The maid ducked her head as though mortified. "'It was not like that, if you please, miss.' When she spoke, the third gentleman stepped forward. "'You are one of our maids, I believe.' He gave George a fulminating look. "'You have some explaining to do.' She's in tears, and we're not accustomed to having guests accost our servants. George recognised the third man as Simon Fenley, though they were not well acquainted. He brought his gaze from him back to Alice. No matter what he said, he was not going to be believed. Never before had his honour been called into question. There had never been any need. George took a breath to attempt to explain anyway, but in the end it was not necessary. The maid found her voice and spoke firmly. "'Mr. Finley, it was Lord Arredon who did me arm. It came upon me while I was carrying sandwiches through the corridor from one end of the ballroom to the other. He refused to be dissuaded, and I cannot say what would have happened were it not for this gentleman here.' She shot a tearful but grateful look to George. George's eyes were on Alice. He saw her lips part and her eyes dart from his face to the maid's. He could tell she believed her. Alice shut her mouth, and as her mask only covered the upper portion of her face, he saw a blush steal over her cheeks. "'Perhaps we might discuss this in private,' he asked Alice, pleading quietly. He had the sensation that it was now or never if he was to make her see who he truly was. "'Excellent idea,' Lord Anley said briskly. "'Fenley, lead the way, if you will. The library.' Fenley turned to the maid and murmured a few words, then turned back to take the lead. He brought them to the place where George had come upon Harridan, and he opened the door there. He went inside and lit a few candles in the room, causing the gold letters on the spines of the books to gleam. "'Thank you for the use of your library,' Lord Anley said. "'I shall remain to see that everything is on the up and up, and done properly, you know.' He shook Fenley's hand, who then exited the room. George watched him go, bewildered. It was as if this whole thing had been planned. "'I shall be over here,' the Marquis said. "'And although I will be turned the other way, do not think that I won't be listening.' He lifted his hand, as though giving them a papal blessing, then strode to the chair on the farthest side of the room, where he sat facing the chimney, lost from sight behind the chair back. Although George wanted to take Alice's hands in his own, he did not yet dare— he gestured for her to follow him to the opposite end of the room. When they reached the end, he turned to face her. Alice, he said, his voice not much above a whisper. I have been in agony. I'm a fool for having wagered on you. The lapse in decorum was unforgivable. 
but I beg you will forgive it anyway. She listened to him and looked down. He sensed that she was softening. Or was she softening? Perhaps she was only preparing to tell him he must not bother her again. She lifted her eyes to his. George, will you please take that absurd mask off? I cannot talk to you while you're wearing a mane. He ripped the mask off his face and held it in two hands. She carefully untied her own discreet black mask, allowing him a glimpse at last of her cherished face. He waited for her to speak. I have been in agony too, she said. I had not expected for you to find a place in my heart, but I fear you made yourself at home without my suspecting it. That is why it hurt to learn about the wager. It is why I feared you would only be unfaithful. You do have a reputation, you know. Every muscle was tense with the fear of losing what he craved, with the desire to hold her. He held himself back. The reputation that is spread about my name is not a true reflection of who I am. The true person is the one I am when I'm with you. She lifted a hand and reached to set it over his heart. He took a step forward so he could press into it. Holding himself in check, he placed his own hand to cover hers. He would not make a single move without being sure that she had no further reserves. "'And you will not take a mistress?' she asked, looking up at him. "'You will not take your wife's fortune and gamble it away, leaving her destitute and at your mercy?' He shook his head. It was difficult to get the words out of his throat. My wife's inheritance shall be reserved for our children if she wishes it, or she shall use it for her own pleasure. I will see to it that my own inheritance is profitable, so my wife's fortune is not needed. You forgot to answer about the mistresses, she whispered. His eyes went wide. I forgot, because the idea is so repugnant to me, it does not even formulate as part of my plans. No mistresses. Who could dream of such a thing when one has the most... He lifted his other hand to Alice's face and brushed his thumb under her chin. Delectable wife at home. Alice searched his gaze. George held himself still, as though he were trying to tame a wild animal. He had to make her trust him. At last she spoke. There is the matter of the wager, our wager. She did not move away from him, so he did not attempt to release her. What of it? Well, the terms, she said, her lips quirking upward. I did win, you know. George allowed a smile to touch his lips. The change in topic was just like her. Sudden, impetuous, humorous. She would keep him on his toes. Are you claiming your forfeit, Alice? I am. She tried to look serious, but he could see her biting her lips to keep them prim. It caused a dimple to pop out in each cheek. I choose for you to marry me. George dropped his hands and stepped away, stunned. It was the last thing he had expected her to say. Then he saw the look of panic shoot through her eyes. His surprise had looked like rejection. Alice! It came out as a hoarse whisper, and in one swift step he was back. He threw both arms around her, pulling her waist and shoulders until she was flush against him. He leaned down, prepared to kiss her senseless, when he stopped himself. This was going to be her first real kiss, and she needed to know she was treasured. He took his time. With the restraint that left him trembling, George touched his lips to hers. He pulled back, caught her gaze, then kissed her again. He loosened his tight embrace and slid his hands up her arms until they rested on her face. Then he kissed her more deeply, lacing his fingers through the silken strands of her hair. The future stretched before him, a future that would be filled with loving this woman until the day he died. These broken thoughts managed to edge into his awareness as he touched his lips to hers again, stroking the softness of her cheeks. He could do this forever. Have we finished, then? The wry voice came from the chair near the fire and brought George back to his senses. He opened his eyes wide and met Alice's gaze. She stifled her giggle. He leaned down to whisper, but she met his lips again, and he did not bother to correct the misunderstanding. That's enough time, 
Anley said, getting to his feet on the other side of the room. He was sounding more like an older brother than the young cub that he was. He began to walk over to where they stood. George leaned down to whisper to Alice again, and this time he succeeded. I accept your terms. Alice gave him a look of confusion, which quickly cleared. It was replaced by a smile that only grew in brilliance when he clarified. I will marry you, my exceedingly dear Alice, since you will have me. Epilogue Alice Clavering stood with Clayda Bell, Philippa Blythefield and Susan Evans in the corner of Almax, studying this season's crop of young women entering the marriage mart. Clayda and Philippa were both young mothers, but they had decided they would leave their newborn sons with the nurses, so they might attend Almax's opening night. Alice counted herself lucky that she had the pleasure of their company tonight, as they were her favourite friends to spend time with. She had also come to realise that life in London was not so terrible, even without bosom friends at all the social events. Oh, there is the young Miss Delby, Clayda said. She will fly off the shelf with that flaxen hair. It's the loveliest colour, is it not? Susan said wistfully. And her eyes are so large, she's sure to turn many a head. Philippa studied the girl in question. Perhaps, but I am to understand her parents wish for her to make an advantageous match. The poor girl will not have much choice as to whom she marries. Alice came to stand next to her sister-in-law and turned her eyes to Miss Delby. Perhaps something might be done, she said, her tone innocent, but she knew Philippa was not deceived. Why, there is Mr Ernest Winch. He might do the trick for Miss Delby. He does not want for fortune, and it does not appear as though he proses on. Clayda choked back a laugh. I don't believe Mr Winch is in the least need of a wife at present, Philippa observed. I'm not entirely convinced he's able to sprout a pair of whiskers. Oh, no, surely he must be old enough for that, Susan said. When everyone looked at her with mirthful eyes, she put her hands to her mouth. Oh, you're joking, of course. Alice had not been able to understand why Philippa was so close to Susan, who had not been endowed with wisdom. Their friendship predated Philippa's marriage to Susan's brother. At least Alice and Clayda's friendship made sense, since they shared the same interests. But Alice was learning to appreciate Susan's simplicity. She was inherently kind, and that trait grew in value as one aged. Not that Alice was aged. She had not been married above a year. Ladies, she said, I spy my husband. I'm going to be horribly unfashionable and go talk to him. Philippa smiled. Oh, do come back before too long. You don't want to set London ablaze with talk of how the Lady Alice Clavering is mooning over her husband for all the taunt to see. Alice could not help but smile back. She had needed no time to learn to appreciate Philippa. She adored her sister-in-law and knew she had gained much in her marriage with George. Her husband was standing with his back to an alcove not far from the one where they'd met. His arms were folded as he stared straight ahead, seemingly lost in thought. Careful, Mr Clavering, the people here will think you are unhappy, and if they think you are unhappy, they will blame your wife. It would be the height of injustice to lay the blame at my wife's door. She is an angel. George glanced around him quickly, then took his wife's hand and kissed it before setting it on his arm. He leaned in. I just saw Harridan. That man irritates me. Him? I'd nearly forgotten his existence. Did you ever badger him for your shillings? Alice knew the answer, but she could not resist teasing George. It was no longer a sore subject between them. You know very well I did not. The sooner that piece of folly is forgotten, the better. You are unkind to tease, my dear. A chuckle escaped Alice. She was feeling charitable with the world just now. Lord Harridan himself might approach her, and she might even condescend to nod. She stayed by George's side, not caring that she was setting idle tongues wagging about how she lived in her husband's pocket. She leaned into George. Oh, we were just talking about a Miss Delby who... No. Alice continued to keep her face expressionless for the sake of society, but she had the greatest urge to laugh. What is this? No, you do not even know what I was going to say. 
George was carrying on the same farce at her side, pretending that he was living the height of boredom and speaking words that could only be heard by her. I do not need to know what you all say, for I know my wife, and the last time she took on the notion of arranging a match for poor Miss We-Both-Know-Whom, it ended in scandal. No, husband, not scandal. Scandal, he repeated, lengthening his lip. Alice was hard put not to giggle. They had received another letter last week from Oswald and Gwendolyn Duckworth, who were settled on Duck's estate. From the sound of it, they were living a life of unparalleled bliss. Alice and George had spoken seriously on the subject, agreeing that the decision had been the right one to make. Besides, there had been an announcement in the Gazette that Lord Hicks had become betrothed to Miss Teresa Wolfe, and the marriage would take place this season. Alice had found it easy to congratulate Teresa wholeheartedly. George kept her arm tucked in his, despite the fact that a new set was forming, and he was neither offering to dance with one of the ladies, nor off talking to the gentleman. He was horribly unfashionable himself. Miss whomever aside, I do not know why we are still attending all Max. Both of us are married. Is making a match not the only reason to come here? Oh, I don't know. Alice suddenly went breathless. She had not thought through how she would tell George. She had intended on it being a private moment, but suddenly it felt perfectly right to do it here. After all, this was the place that had brought them together. We will need to keep abreast of society's latest en for the... She lifted her eyes to his and dropped her voice even more. Next eighteen years or so, at which point it will become extremely relevant. Her husband did not remove his gaze from hers, so she saw when his look of bafflement turned to one of comprehension. He pulled her father back away from the press of people and guided her with a firm hand into an alcove, their alcove, which was miraculously empty, save for them. He turned to face her. Alice Clavering, you tell me this here, he murmured. His look was intent, sparked with joy. Where I cannot sweep you into my arms and let out some kind of shout or triumph or something. She pressed her lips together and nodded, smiling. He leaned down and pressed a kiss on those lips, sinking them both. I shall have to find some way to retaliate for this piece of thoughtlessness, he said. I shall look forward to seeing how you attempt it, she replied sweetly. He pulled back suddenly, his brows knit. But why would Almax be relevant all those years from now? You know, a boy has no need of Almax. A boy? Alice retorted, tugging his arm playfully. Pish! Why, I'd be willing to wager... This has been The Sport of Matchmaking by Jenny Goutet, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Copyright 2022 by Jenny Goutet.